What's up guys? It's yo boy on the sensei. Welcome to Reborn as a Prodigy Hyuga during Minato's era. Part 4. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Mid-April hit me like an impatient fat kid on a slide. In two weeks, my squishy friends were going to arrive back in the camp and cause me anxiety with their squishiness so, on top of feeling like I wasn't doing enough, my main sources of anxiety were going to come back and get into danger and cause me to worry. So, it was lots of fun all around. The Hokage had admonished me for using my fellow shinobi as test subjects and wasn't satisfied when I explained to him that my comrades weren't test subjects but were instead strengthened by Kenjutsu that I developed. Now the Hokage was causing me grief, but it was understandable grief. I probably shouldn't have touched any of Kinoha's ninja during the war. But that was in hindsight, it was too late to undo what I had done. Sai with Kiri retreating from Lightning Country, Kumo was now free to bother us. Our stock of test subjects was refilling, but a good bit of my time was spent capturing said subjects, instead of experimenting on them like I wanted to. Which sucked, but was also a welcome trade-off. I had been getting antsy, and something new was welcome I laid in my bed trying and failing to summon the will to live. Kiri was out for the count, and Fugaki was being sent to our camp. Minato and Jureya were in grass, and needed help last I heard. Minato hasn't killed half a regiment of Iowa Nin yet, but still had his yellow flash moniker. Tsunade was forcibly stationed in Wind Country, and was healing up a storm, while Kanoha's cannon fodder died by the hundreds from poison. It looked like I was going to be stationed somewhere else, and it was a real piss off. They should have sent Fugaku on 12 have some pity on me. I just want to experiment in my comfy lab R. I groaned while mentally cursing Kiri and the Rakage. If Kiri had been stronger or if the Rakage had been weaker bastards I felt the ground tremble slightly and raised an eyebrow. I heard the knob on the door jiggle and turned to look at the door. I stared dully at Orochimaru as he burst into my quarters. He was looking pretty happy. The Rakage is headed this way. Orochimaru smiled wide and as he spoke. Why was that good news? Hopefully Iwa isn't following him. My voice was filled with nervousness and a bit of excitement. I got out of bed and stared at Orochimaru who still didn't lose his smile. I've given the order to abandon the camp. All that we have to do now is successfully seal the rakage. So Orochimaru got rid of all my meat shields. And what's this nonsense about a seal? I thought he gave up on the seal. I stayed silent and stared at Orochimaru with unconcealed annoyance. I needed the cannon fodder. What about Iwa? Orochimaru snickered. Kekiki, what about them? He wasn't worried about Iwa, all right, what's the plan? I rubbed my face with one hand. Orochimaru rubbed his palms together and leaned forward. The rakage came here for you. So you'll be the decoy while I catch him unaware. Orochimaru looked gleeful. Sadly, I didn't share any of his enthusiasm. What did I do? Orochimaru shrugged. He's probably mad about you killing his army. That was forever ago, and Orochimaru killed most of them. It's war, what does he expect to happen? I said instead. Sigh. I placed my arm over my eyes and sighed loudly. And how do we even know he's coming here? Orochimaru shrugged with a smile. I'm fighting him now, of course. The ground trembled as he spoke. How would he catch the Rakage unaware when he was fighting him? Sai my dermal armor formed and my mask covered my face the moment my Bayakigan activated. I was nervous. It was something I hadn't felt in a long time. I slowed my perception as much as I could and followed the clone out the door. Orochimaru's cheerful clone and I arrived where the fight was taking place while ignoring our fleeing allies. The Rakage was tall and dark skinned like his son, but the features that stuck out the most were his mane of hair and the weird red rope around his waist. Orochimaru was holding his own, but the fight hadn't truly started yet. The Rakage hadn't even donned his lightning cloak yet. God damn it. I swallowed heavily and prepared myself for possible death. If I make a good enough showing maybe someone will resurrect me. I can only hope so I shunshine beside Orochimaru and the fight paused for a moment. I saw the Rakage's mouth open and stopped enhancing my perception, so I could hear what he was saying. Hayaga Shiro, you've caused me some headaches. His voice was calm. I hadn't, I'd killed some of his ninja, which was what everyone else did. I think you're making excuses. Maybe to make himself feel better about killing a child. The Rakage smiled, showing me his teeth. Perhaps, but a child should not question their elders. I eyed the scar on his left side, and the scene of Naruto using his own attack against him played in my head. The last resort I turned my head towards Orochimaru hoping he would pipe up. Sadly, he did not, and we descended into a tense silence. Well, I hope you're better at fighting than you are at talking. And with that, the rakage became covered in lightning chakra. I again slowed my perception to its maximum and readied myself for an attack. Orochimaru launched a wind blade, which did little more than tickle the rakage. I shunshined behind the rakage and punched him in the spine with the chakra enhanced punch. B-O-O-M asterisk the ground under me shattered, and the rakage bent in a way that certainly didn't feel good, and flew past Orochimaru. He skipped across the ground a few times before flipping and landing his feet where he continued to slide. The rakage stopped sliding, and Orochimaru sent me a surprised look. 
It would do you well if you did that again. Orochimaru turned towards the rakage and sent a wall of wind blades at him. I nodded and took a deep breath. Alrighty I shunshine towards the rakage who now looked serious. Which probably wasn't good for me. I arrived behind the rakage and was promptly kicked away. As the rakage decided that the wind blades didn't matter. And kicking me was much more important. I was able to block and my dermal armor held up. So I had high hopes for my survival. The rakage shunshine to me and stabbed at me with his fingers. And my hopes were dashed when his four fingers nearly sheared through the arm I used to block. I jumped away and the rakage stood watching me. He had pierced through my armor, but had been stopped by the layer on the other side of my arm. Ouch. If my face was uncovered, I would have cried crocodile tears. The rakage shook his head and dashed towards me. I dashed towards him as well. I launched a bone spear at the rakage, but it just bounced off his cloak. Welp a tendril of chakra made its way to my forehead and unlocked my seal. I shunshined behind him but was met with a knife hand, so I smashed his fingers with a chakra enhanced punch. EOOM asterisk it worked as well as I expected it to, and my fist was split down the middle. I jumped away and the rakage and I were once again staring at each other. An Orochimaru clone was spectating a fight, and the real Orochimaru was underground, likely preparing for some shenanigans. Sigh I coated my now healed hand in lightning chakra and started spinning it. I hadn't used it in a long time I shunshined in front of the rakage and drove the lightning drill into his stomach while he drove his fingers into my chest. My drill did little more than touch his skin and his fingers were knuckle deep in my ribs. I again jumped away while the rakage confidently watched me. Well done, you touched me. I resisted the urge to groan and instead just nodded. When I touched him, I tried to block his tenketsu but had no success from what I could see. Thanks for letting me heal. I send him a second nod. The rakage nodded back and sped towards me with three fingers extended. I sped towards him as well. I shunshine behind him midway and shunshine behind him once more when I saw him turning to face me. I struck him in the spine with a chakra enhanced punch. That was more powerful than the first, and he flew away tumbling as he went. EOOM asterisk the rakage regained his footing. He looked mildly annoyed, but unconcerned about the state of things. My attack had done no damage. I felt a breeze through the holes in my shirt, which annoyed me. The rakage was playing with me. I was given time to heal and plan, while he stood and waited. Fuck. I sped towards him creating a shadow clone as I went. The rakage didn't move to meet me. He dramatically lowered a finger and shunshined in front of me. I shunshined to the side and my clone shunshined behind him. My clone and I simultaneously threw a punch. The rakage jumped into the air avoiding our punches and causing me to blink. I mentally thanked the Naruto verse deities and crouched. EOOM asterisk my feet cratered the ground. And I sprung towards the airborne cage. Fist cocked back, ready to send him to space. He kicked towards me, and I punched him with the strongest chakra enhanced punch I've ever used. EOOM asterisk the combination of my punch and his kick sent him skyward and me groundward. EOOM asterisk I landed kicking up dust and creating a crater, while the rakage continued off into the sky. Well done. Orochimaru's clone appeared beside me and dispelled the dust with a wave. My clone, who was supposed to suicide on the rakage, gave me a thumbs up. How did your fight with him go last time? I gave the clone a thumbs up as well. Orochimaru's clone frowned. Iowa and Kiri attacked Humogaka and the rakage left. I nodded in understanding. A battle with the rakage only ended when the rakage decided it ended. Should we make a run for it? Or are we still going to seal him? I turned my attention to the still flying rakage. The rakage had started to arc, so he would be coming down shortly. My preparations have been made, you just have to lead him to me. I nodded and looked to my clone. Bomb the rakage. The clone nodded and summoned three more of itself. Orochimaru's clone gave the group of us a nod and dispersed. I looked towards the rakage. He was still making his way down Sai one of the clone's side, and the others gave it a dirty look. I rolled my eyes and shunshine to Orochimaru's seal. Meanwhile, the clone sped towards the falling rakage. BOOM asterisk BOOM asterisk I was hit with a rush of memories, and a quarter of my total chakra returned, only two clones got the job done. Feed the circle your chakra when the rakage is within it. I nodded distractedly. The rakage was barreling towards me with one finger extended at double the speed he previously used. I wasn't far Fast enough to do anything should he attack me. The rakage approached and I felt sweat trickle down my face. My mask was getting gross. The rakage slowed his approach and stopped just outside of the circle. Not running brat. I shrugged. Even with my cloak, I didn't have much hope. No point, I'm not fast enough. Which was sadly true. I spent a lot of time improving my body, and this monster in human form was still faster. And it was the body he was born with well. It's time I pay you back for butchering my men. He started walking towards me. I crouched and put my hands up. Be gentle with me. It's my first time. The rakage paused with a look of disgust on his face. And I slammed my hands down activating the seal. The rakage was surrounded by a sickly purple barrier, and Orochimaru rose from the earth looking smug. Kekiki you've fallen for my trap. Orochimaru's smile split his face. The rakage still looked unperturbed and slammed a single finger into the barrier. One finger assault. The finger and barrier clashed, and my chakra started draining at a slower rate. I raised an eyebrow at Orochimaru whose smugness had increased. Kekiki Orochimaru smirked but didn't speak. One finger assault. The rakage struck the barrier again, and the drain on my chakra diminished more. I blew out a relieved breath. It's a good thing I didn't jump away when he 
struck the barrier in front of me. Sometimes a little faith goes a long way. The rakage struck the barrier again, this time with his fist. Lightning straight. The drain on my reserves trickled down to nothing, and I finally clued in on what the barrier did. It drained chakra and used it to power the barrier. I can't hold it for much longer. I felt like an idiot for not realizing it sooner. The rakage smirked and Orochimaru made an excellent show of jumping to reinforce the barrier. The rakage rapidly punched the barrier, Orochimaru, and I both fed more chakra into the barrier while the rakage unknowingly helped. Hold on a little longer Shiro. Orochimaru was smirking as the rakage back was to him. The rakage continued pounding at the barrier, sealing his fate. I'm trying sensei. I put as much desperation in my voice as I could. The barrier slowly turned a deep purple. The rakage suddenly stopped punching. Orochimaru stood with a smile on his face, and I joined him. Kekaki Orochimaru cackled and started walking around the barrier. I took a few steps back and started scanning the area for any nuisances. Seeing none I stepped towards the barrier and knelt to continue feeding it chakra. I wanted this thing kept inside. So, what now? Orochimaru who was still smoking smugly shrugged. We call everyone back and have them take turns feeding the barrier. I nodded. That was a good plan. My village will come to me. The rakage decided that threats were the way to go. Orochimaru looked unaffected. Let them. He lost his smile and started towards the camp. I continued feeding the barrier. I'd rather keep the rakage snow globe. I didn't need him escaping anytime soon. The rakage was sat cross-legged and completely still. He decided not to waste energy, and was now meditating. I let him be and left. I didn't want to antagonize him further. I instead decided to bother Orochimaru. So, why didn't the rakage bring soldiers with him? Orochimaru shrugged and ignored me. Alrighty well. See ya. It's shower time. A post-battle shower was the best. Interlude. You're not happy about capturing the rakage. Shiro spoke, breaking the silence that had fallen between him and Orochimaru. No, I am not. Orochimaru spoke in a slow monotone. I have no interest in participating in this war. My capture of the rakage may force me to become more involved than I would have liked. Hum Shiro hummed. It shouldn't be a problem, or at least not as much of a problem as you think it will be. Shiro gestured in the rakage's direction. The Hokage will probably use that thing to barter for peace. Shiro ran a hand through his hair. It's far more likely that we'll be moved away from the fighting. Shiro smiled, and the air in the room felt heavy. Can't let our notoriety grow too much after all. Kekaki Orochimaru threw his head back and cackled. Indeed, they can't allow those that don't play by the rules to become too powerful. Shiro nodded. Be it politically, personally, or in terms of influence. Shiro's smile faded. It's a shame Kanova has been allowed to fester to such an extent. Orochimaru nodded and turned towards me. This talk could be considered treasonous. The air turned heavier. Are you sure this one can be trusted? Shiro turned and stared into my eyes, causing my breath to hitch. I like her. I swallowed nervously. He liked me, but he didn't trust me. Have it your way. Orochimaru stalked past my frozen form. The breeze he kicked up causing goosebumps to form on my arms. Orochimaru left, and it became easier to breathe. I don't have Shiro's trust. That needed to change. I couldn't do anything he might deem untrustworthy. Well, let's go. Shiro started towards the door. I need to write a report. I nodded and trailed after him. I needed to be careful. I was an ant compared to Shiro and Orochimaru. If I annoyed them I might get stepped on. I needed to be useful and trustworthy. At least until they could no longer step on me. It hadn't even been a day since the battle and I had changed my mind about A's DNA. It wasn't the Rakage's DNA, but it was close enough. After seeing him shrug off both of our blows like they were a light breeze I couldn't help myself. I wanted that. At first, I didn't want to look anything like them, but after seeing the Rakage in action, I had changed my mind. I'd still try my best to keep my build as it was, but if I couldn't it would be acceptable. I wanted to be as unstoppable as the Rakage, and I regretted dismissing it when I did. I could have been more powerful A's blood was a lucky find that I had taken for granted, but I wouldn't anymore I'd make good use of it. Dismissing the usefulness of the blood was foolish, but it wasn't too late to put it to use. The camp was nearly back to normal, everyone was on guard, and we were receiving reinforcements. So, things looked alright so far. The rakage snow globe was under heavy guard, even though it could be seen from the camp people took the opportunity to curse the rakage for the death of their friends and family. The rakage didn't react to the curses and insults, he instead focused on meditating and saved his strength. There were rumors that the hokage was negotiating with Kumo, but Orochimaru told me not to worry about it. The rakage was extremely proud and would rather die than be sold back to Kumo. Also Orochimaru claimed, Omi, go ask around and see if anyone wants to do the strengthening procedure. Ake giving them blood. The blood only worked if the person it came from had cage level resistance. Reserves. I'd use it all the time if that wasn't the case. Let them know that this procedure has no risks, and tell them to nearly exhaust their chakra before they come. Last time some people almost died because their chakra was attacking the foreign blood. It turns out that chakra will sometimes defend the body when you're unconscious. I want 20 people, between the ages of 12 and 20. There were a few old genin that produced few results, and then tattled on me for not delivering on the strengthening. They should have a lightning affinity for the best results but I'll accept anyone if we can't get enough people with a lightning affinity. I pushed a stray strand of hair behind my ear. Oh yeah, SNAEP asterisk, is Asami still around? I snapped my fingers. Aomi shook her head. 
All right, put in a recommendation for a field promotion and put it on my desk. Aemi frowned. I wasn't quite breaking the rules, but I was ignoring the spirit of them. I wasn't allowed to recommend and then promote someone, but I could promote someone who had been recommended sneaky. I raised an eyebrow when she spoke, but nodded. The spirit of the rules mattered little when you were too powerful to get in trouble. I'm not breaking any rules. Aemi shrugged and set off towards the exit. No one would be willing to cause a fuss over such a small matter. Another two days rolled by. There hadn't been an attack but some scouts had been captured. They had killed themselves when they were caught so we got nothing from them. But there was going to be an attack. Or so I thought. The rakage had been without food and water for three days. So, they'd need to get to him before he died of dehydration. Kumo only had Iwa to worry about, so they could feel the good amount of their strength. Though the number of men in the camp had doubled with the addition of reinforcements, so I wasn't overly worried. How many want to be strengthened? I ignored the clone who pushed past me and focused on Aomi who was scribbling away. All 20 beds were filled. Each has a lightning affinity. I nodded. Anyone over 20? I rolled my eyes as I heard glass shatter in the background. No, everyone was under 18. Nice. I watched a clone bumble around with my favorite brush set and had the urge to strangle him. Alright, keep everyone in the bed sedated. I'll be around. But it's your job to keep them alive for now. I nodded and she nodded back. Alrighty so, what's happening with our guest? I pointed in the direction of the rakage snow globe. Orochimaru shrugged. We're in negotiations currently. Distaste was visible on his face. I nodded. Should we water him? He might not survive for much longer. I eyed the papers on Orochimaru's desk. Orders from the Hokage. He's been procuring his own water with ninjutsu. I nodded barely paying attention. The Hokage was currently negotiating for the return of Kinoha Nin held prisoner and an end to hostilities. Hopefully Kumo doesn't want their prisoners back. Most of them were long dead. And those that weren't had undergone extensive genetic manipulation. So, they probably couldn't be given back. Orochimaru remained silent, so it took that as my cue to leave. I gave him a bow and made my way out. A new day and a new annoyance. But thanks to the power of delegation, my clones were now doing paperwork while I spent a little bit looking over the DNA from people who got blood transfusions. The last batch who was kept unconscious, didn't use the chakra from A's cells, and received lesser benefits. The overall increase in strength was less than what it had been with Asami, and they didn't learn to use Lightning Chakra as Asami did. It was still a good increase bringing those in Genin level to low Chunin, but it didn't suddenly make them more talented or more skilled. They were still the same crappy Genin, but with the speed and power of a low Chunin, there were some neat mutations in their DNA, but it was only interesting and not helpful. For example, the DNA for their hair color mutating was interesting, but was a waste of time to pursue. There were mutations in their chakra density genes as well, but the mutations often did nothing or next to nothing. So, it wasn't worth the time to pursue it. Most of the DNA from those who had undergone the strengthening wasn't too interesting. Isami had the most interesting mutations, the gene responsible for bone density, and the gene responsible for estrogen production being the ones that stuck out. But even those weren't interesting enough to look into. Overall, I didn't find anything interesting, but at least I confirmed that chakra caused mutations. Fugaku arrived annoyingly late. He should have arrived at the beginning of May, but instead arrived three weeks into May, and was too late to participate in our battle with the rakage. I wanted to give him shit, but a 12-year-old scolding the Achiha clan head probably wouldn't go over well. What are you working on? Fugaku's expression was stoic, and his voice was dull. Why he felt the need to hover over me was a mystery. I'm going over some DNA I got from the Rakage's son and trying to find what makes them so strong. There was a lot that made them strong. It wasn't simply one thing. So I had to shift through the DNA and find the genes responsible for their strength and durability while avoiding the genes that would change my appearance. Like muscle composition for the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscles. Fugaku still looked vaguely interested so I continued. Currently I'm focused on his skin cells, the keratinocytes, melanocytes, Merkel cells, and Langerhans cells. Hum Fugaku hummed. I wasn't sure if it was a hum of understanding or if he was just making noise so I'll stop looking at him. Basically, I want to see if I can use the DNA to make more people like the rakage, mainly myself. I'd probably pretend it didn't work and scrap everything to do with the DNA when I was done. I didn't want people like the rakage running around. It doesn't look like it's going to work though. Not until my reserves increase some more. It took a lot to sustain a body like that both in terms of nutrition and chakra. So, what brings you here? Ichiha repellent activate. Making conversation seemed to make the Ichiha flee. Makoto was asking about you. I wanted to see how you were doing, so I could give her an update. Fugaku turned and started towards the door. My Achiha repellent was a success. Thanks for stopping by, I'll see you around. Fugaku nodded, Shen, and grunted at me before strutting out the door. I went over our conversation in my head. I'd hoped he'd want me to enhance some Achiha with the Rakage's DNA. But when I didn't get a response, I'd claimed it a failure. It was a mediocre attempt at manipulation, but it was still an attempt. Maybe I'd get better in the future negotiations continued, and it was decided that the rakage would be handed over in exchange for an end to hostilities, and the release
release of prisoners from Kumo. There were additional reparations and such, but that didn't matter to me. I was more focused on keeping my lab. There was a good chance I'd get reassigned in sooner or grass. We were in the process of moving the shinobi and noodles to Frost, and with the apparent end to hostilities, we'd have to lessen our presence in Frost or risk continuing the war with Kumo. It sucked. Kumo still had most of its strength and was still a threat, so we might maintain a presence in Frost. But I felt that was only a small possibility. The Hokage was more likely to order us to withdraw. We could have pushed into Water Country, and we could have pushed into Lightning Country. But instead, we were probably going to back off and let them recover. And Kiri hadn't even surrendered they were still in the war, even with their diminished strength. Fuck. We were not taking advantage of their weaknesses. So, fucking annoying. The more I thought about it the madder I got. What a shit show. I stood beside Orochimaru and Minato while watching over the release of the Rakage. Our presence was meaningless if the Rakage decided that he wanted everyone dead. But it comforted the cannon fodder. So here we stood. The Rakage looked a little leaner and angrier than I remembered. But that was to be expected. Being starved and humiliated for two weeks does that to people. He's still fucking huge. I spoke with an amused smile. Weeks of starvation hadn't done much to him. He was still a big bearded mass of muscles. Think he's going to start a fight? I turned to Minato. He shook his head. He's too prideful to go back on his word. I hummed. Hum? I didn't know that conversation was even had. I probably should have been paying attention. But I was overriding prisoners and seeing what happened when normal people got Hayuga genes. The barrier fell and the rakage stepped out. I watched Kumo's delegation of cannon fodder receive the rakage and depart immediately. The rakage sent Orochimaru a menacing look and sunshined away in a flash of lightning. Thankfully it's not me who he's mad at. Hopefully, he forgot about me. Orochimaru snorted and covered his face with the sleeve of his kimono. Sen o r t asterisk, lucky me, Orochimaru said dryly. Minato didn't look amused. But I ignored him as he was usually no fun anyways. How's my cute little kohai? Has she punched anyone into a bloody mess yet? Minato nodded looking even less amused than he previously did. She slapped a missing nin and covered Abito in blood and brain juice. He said he couldn't remove the smell for a week. Super Rin. I nodded, feeling quite proud of myself. Good, glad to hear she's doing well. Rin was my favorite. Tell her to always aim for the body. It's less messy. I wondered how Kakashi was doing but put it out of my mind as it wasn't worth thinking about. When are we supposed to withdraw from Frost? The Hokage had sadly agreed to remove our presence from Frost entirely. Orochimaru was pissed and I was feeling bitter about it. Two weeks from now is when we start moving the troops away. Orochimaru lip curled. My lips were pursed and I joined him in making faces. Hopefully the Hokage won't regret that. The ninja of Kumo and Iwa were both known for being backstabbers. So, making any sort of agreement with the savages was usually meaningless. I shook my head and decided to get back to work. I had people to fill with blood, DNA to collect, and DNA to splice. With the power of clones and human experimentation, I'd hopefully be able to overwrite myself using A's DNA within the week. More than a few prisoners died due to accelerated aging. I didn't have time to wait for traits to express themselves and needed results. Everything seemed to be going well on that end, and with liberal use of clones. I sped up my experiments on mutation as well. The chakra density gene was pretty good already. I thought I could take it further, but that could be done later. With the loss of my lab in Frost, I'd have to finish anything I had on the go, and start sealing anything I wanted to keep. The whole camp was to be blown up to deny Frost and Kumo any easy infrastructure. Clones were a godsend when I was rushed, but a burden when I was trying to keep boredom at bay. The dreaded news came in the form of a scroll. It was decided that I and my team would be moved to Suna, Fugaku would go to Grass, and Orochimaru would be stationed on our northeastern border. Orochimaru wasn't happy but also wasn't angry, probably because he had free reign on any bandits or missing nin. I wasn't so lucky. I was going to get burnt by the sun and poisoned a lot. Lots of sand was going to get in my shoes and eyes. And I'd have no love for the foreseeable future. It sounded fun with the power of clones and human experimentation. I sped through the indexing of A's DNA. The mutations of the chakra density gene, the splicing of my DNA, regenerating the telomeres, and the making of an override seal. Somewhere along the way, a clone had nearly killed Kenji with a gravity seal. Luckily it was only nearly. Kenji was now bedridden due to extensive internal bleeding and semi-crushed organs. A valuable lesson was learned. If someone's annoying you, slap a gravity seal on them and crush their organs with the power of gravity. I gave the override seal a once over, while pondering the necessity of future overrides. I was thinking this was to be the last override to my DNA for the next few years. There were no need to push my luck before I got into the good stuff like the Otsutsuki's DNA or DNA from the Quarter Space God reincarnations. What I'd done to myself was already enough and I felt that any more was asking for something to go wrong. It was probably best to let my body grow and to improve on my existing techniques. It sounded boring, and it was probably going to be boring, but boring was safe, and I wanted to be safe for a little while. Sigh, I gave the seal another quick once over, and unlocked the seal on my forehead. A hand sign later, the room had gained another occupant, and half my chakra was gone. I closed the seal and sent as much chakra as I could into the overwrite seal before blacking out. Everything I owned was sealed away and packed away in my kunai pouch. It was decided that we'd stop at Kanoha, 
where Aomi would go see whatever family or friends she had, and I'd unpack my stuff and see my friends and family. We'd stay for two days and make our way to Suna, where I'd meet up with Tsunade and receive further orders. I gave my lab one last look before turning and starting towards Kanoa. Orochimaru gave me a goodbye present and ruffled my hair while laughing creepily. After checking myself for seals I took a quick look through the books. All of them were about Fuenjutsu and DNA modification. The books on DNA modification were nearly useless as most of the information was about DNA modification involving animals. I wasn't interested in mashing human and animal DNA together, but perhaps it would be useful in the future. Most of the books about Fuenjutsu were barrier oriented and not immediately useful, but appreciated nonetheless. Sigh. I felt a bit guilty about not having presents to give. I made a hand sign, and a shadow clone appeared. Here, I handed him a scroll and ignored Aomi's questioning look. The Achiha body wasn't useful currently, and keeping it around increased the chances that I'd get caught. Orochimaru could make better use of it, and could take the fall should it be discovered. Let's stop by hot springs. I haven't had any greasy food in a long while, Aomi nodded. I had some Achiha cells hidden away I could make more if the need arises. We arrived at Kanoha with minimal trouble. Kanoha was the same as I remembered it. The looks of fear and awe were annoying but not new. Make sure to pack for sooner. I'll come to get you when we're leaving. I gave Aomi a nod and started towards the house. I needed to get my stuff unpacked, the lab properly equipped, and my notes hidden. I'd also need to hunt for Guy, Kishina, and Makoto. While I was here friendships needed effort to maintain, and I hadn't been putting much effort into them lately. It was better late than never. How was your time off? I eyed a hickey that had been poorly covered by makeup. Mom shrugged with a tight-lipped smile. I had fun. I could see that I eyed the open window, and boot print left on the dusty windowsill. It seems I interrupted something Ham I'll come back later in going to go see Kishina. I just stopped by to let you know I was around. The small size of the boot print was worrying, but I didn't want to have that conversation. I didn't see any small footprints I nodded to myself and made my way out of the house. I'd make sure she knew when I was going to be around, and hopefully, she'd return the favor in the future. And maybe I could avoid some awkwardness in the future. Shiro, you're not cute and little anymore. I smirked. Puberty was an awful hellish experience, but now I was too old to be smothered without it being weird. I've shared my cuteness and become handsome. Kishina was more likable when she didn't pick you up and shake you. Or, Shiro. Kishina pinched my cheeks. I would have frowned if my face wasn't being manhandled. Let me go please Kishina pouted and obliged. I ignored the slowly receding pain and yawned. I a w an asterisk. Sorry, it's been a long trip. I held back a second yawn. Anything new in Kanoha? I let my eyes wander, and they were drawn to a wall covered in pictures containing the current team Minato, and a few pictures featuring myself and Kakashi. No, nothing new. It's been so boring. She flailed her limbs. Hum, I nodded absently. Seeing my picture on their wall warm my heart. I felt myself tear up slightly and blinked my eyes before looking away. How about little Itachi? How's he been? I released a heavy breath from my nose. I was getting oddly emotional. The little cutie's gonna turn five soon. I can't believe he's already five. Kishina bounced on her toes. I smiled. I'll have to go see him. Kishina nodded excitedly. We can both go. Makoto has probably been lonely. She'll appreciate the company. Kishina continued talking about our upcoming trip, and I let myself go into autopilot. I needed a shower, and some sleep guy was nowhere to be found, which sucked as I was looking forward to catching up. Team Minato wasn't here either, so I couldn't torture anyone with exercise. Mom was off doing her own thing, and I had already bothered Kishina and Makoto yesterday. So, I guess I was going to go through those deposit boxes I stole at Shimogaka. It's one way to kill some time I guess. A-N-O-C-K asterisk K-N-O-C-K asterisk K-N-O-C-K asterisk I opened the door and blinked at Asami, who had somehow gotten past the gate without being electrocuted. Hi! I blinked at her. She blinked back. What brings you here? I blinked again. She shuffled nervously, just came by to say hello. I eyed her wondering if mom had keyed her into the barriers. I was pretty sure she didn't like me all that much, so she probably wanted something. Come inside, I'll show you what murder and assassination can buy you. I stepped aside and waved her in. She stepped inside and kicked her sandals off while I made my way to the kitchen to make some tea. The tea had been served, and I got back to what I had been doing while Asami set on her tea. I'd been looking at apartment buildings, and narrowed it down to the final three I wanted to buy. I could probably get two of them if I got a large loan, or I could get one and fix it up without any loans. One renovated apartment building or two shitty apartment buildings with some debt attached. I also had to consider that if I continued acquiring assets, it'd be hard to leave Kanoha, should it be necessary. So Isami licked her lips nervously and stopped speaking. I raised an eyebrow. So, um, I kept my eyebrow raised. Can I continue learning under you? If not, can I work for you? Hum Isami slumped at my hum. It didn't matter if she was around even if she wasn't useful now and wouldn't be useful for a while. She was a time sink, but a time sink was what I needed. Yes, a smile covered her face. 
I was going to have a lot of free time soon. It's best I occupy that time to try to keep myself sane. I'll figure out something for you to do even if she wasn't useful now. She could be in the future. Boredom was my enemy. And maybe I could defeat it by adopting strays. Have you been promoted yet? The Hokid should have gotten around to it by now. Isami shook her head. No, not yet. Hum, I'll have to go cause a fuss before I leave then. Promoting Ninja was decided by others. But the ceremony was held by the Hokage, mainly to foster feelings of gratitude between Ninja and the Cage. Being awarded a promotion was an important part of Ninjahood. I'd like Asami to experience it. Alright, go spend time with your mom, I'll come to collect you tomorrow morning. Super Asami might be a go. I was going to let her go as it seemed she didn't like me. Catch and release SNORT asterisk Asami raised an eyebrow, but I waved her off. If she wanted to hang around that was fine too. I'd figure out what to do with her sire. I nodded and sent her a wave but didn't respond as she let herself out. I might have to remake the team. Dragging Mom and Dai along was probably going to get them killed. I'll drop Aomi into Team Irregular, and maybe create a new team with Asami. I nodded to myself. I'd see if things worked out first. Asami wasn't all that strong anyways, I'd have to improve her base strength before I made the team. I was humming a quiet tune while Aomi wrote on her notepad. We were having a question and answer session about medical ninjutsu and chakra. It was time consuming, but I didn't have anything to do and needed a distraction of some sort. How do genetics determine your future? I vaguely remembered saying that to her, but it wasn't about medical ninjutsu, and I wasn't sure it was worth getting into. I stopped humming, and the dining room had descended into silence. It's a bit difficult to explain, mainly because I was bad at explaining things. I wasn't sure how to explain it concisely. Your genes aren't your destiny or future, but they do manifest and determine how far you can go. Nature genetics determines your maximum talent for any particular area. But in the end, it depends on how you nurture them. And nurture, even if one had the genetics that enable them to have cage-level reserves. They might never reach that level if they don't spend time nurturing their talents and expanding their reserves. Genetics played a big role in development. But if those genetic traits weren't nurtured, did I answer your question or did I just rumble at you? I thought of it as assigning stat points. You have a maximum of what you could achieve, but it depended on how and if you used it. If you had a 9 in strength but never used any melee weapons, then you were wasting your high strength. I sadly didn't know how to understandably translate that in a way Aomi would understand. What made sense to me was foreign to most people. You rambled, but I kind of got it. Aomi slid her notebook over to me. Hum, I hummed and nodded. You are born with potential, a maximum of what you can achieve. But what you achieve depends on how your talents are nurtured. I summed it up before continuing. However, there are some traits where that doesn't hold true. Aomi nodded and started writing in her notebook. Chakra density. She slid her book over and I nodded before continuing. You have a base chakra density determined by your genetics. And then you have the addition of spiritual energy and physical energy. The stronger your body the more physical energy you can produce at a given time. For physical energy you had what you started with genetically plus what you achieved with training. Spiritual energy can also increase your chakra density. But it's not something I really want to get into. Spiritual energy was tricky, it came from consciousness, and was increased by study, meditation, and experience. It all boiled down to experience though. The more you experience the more spiritual energy you could produce. Anyway, chakra density isn't limited by genetics and can be increased throughout your life. Despite what Orochimaru said chakra density wasn't truly limited by genetics, someone without naturally dense chakra could train and meditate until their chakra was as dense as mine. But as they were already behind, they likely wouldn't be able to catch up, as my chakra would have increased with training and mediation as well. If one was trying to catch up to someone born with dense chakra I'd advise against it. Their time would be better spent elsewhere. Was that helpful? Translating what I know into digestible information wasn't my strong suit. Kakashi was the only person I've met who has the same problem translating information that I do. Yes. Aomi nodded and circled the word. What about yin and yang chakra? What about it? I raised an eyebrow as she continued writing. How do you make yang chakra? I shrugged. The awakening of the Shikotsu Myaku caused my chakra to lean more towards Yang. It wasn't something I did with conscious thought, it was natural to me. Yin and Yang chakra are just different mixes of spiritual and physical energy. It's still made of both spiritual and physical. It just depends on the mixture of each. I shrugged again as that was as much as I could explain it. I'm not that knowledgeable about either of them, so you might want to find some books about it if you're interested. The Akimichi, Nara, and Jamanaka were the village's foremost authorities on Yin and Yang release. So, it was possible to find something if she perused through the archives. Having lots of information from lots of different clans was probably why Kanoru was so innovative in terms of Jutsu. Iowa was the only other village that was innovative, which was probably because of their clans as well. One last question. I've got to visit some people before we leave. The clones would do that. I'd hide in my bed and think about things to do while in wing country. Should I continue studying medicines? They don't seem useful. I blinked as that was said aloud. 
and it caught me off guard. I didn't spend a lot of time on different medicines. Medical ninjutsu can do most of the stuff medicine can. The basics were all I learned. Anything esoteric was left on the wayside. I'd say not to worry about it. It's only useful for people with small reserves. Which was most med nin, they were on average a useless bunch. If you're good at the mystical palm you probably will never need knowledge on medicine. Other people can waste their time on pills and ointments. I wasn't going to waste my time concocting medical salves, I'd rather buy them. It might be useful in the future, but I've never used anything I've learned about medicine. Stupid nutrition pills were the only example that came to mind. I've dismissed medicine, and nothing I've seen has changed my mind. It's up to you. She probably shouldn't waste her time. But having someone knowledgeable might come in handy one day. Alright, go see your family. We leave tomorrow. I waved Aomi off and started towards my room. I was eager to spend the rest of the day in my bed. Isami and I stood at the gate waiting for the mature members of our little group. As annoying as it was to wait for people, I'd be more annoyed if I had to hunt them down. So, I got to wait. I had Isami who had changed her outfit. Before she had worn the standard Kanoha green genin jacket with a blue shirt and pants underneath the jacket. Now she sported a red top with black pants, and had wrappings on her fists and legs. It was more distinct than her cannon fodder look. And I quite liked it. Nice outfit, looks cute. More people might target her now that she didn't look like cannon fodder. That was the lore of Anime Universes. Thanks, it took a long time to find something I liked. I nodded and we lapsed into silence. Sadly, the silence brought thoughts with it. Does complimenting her count as grooming an 11 year old? I blinked at the thought. It might count though it wasn't deliberate I blinked again inside eyed Asami. Compliments were dangerous I nodded to myself earning a look from Asami. No romancing until they're 18. No manipulating girls into developing crushes. And no looting lolis. I added that to my short mental list of rules. It was right below no experimenting on anyone under 12. Which I forgot about until now I broke that one, perhaps the rules need to be written down. I'll have a plaque made mom was the last of the group to arrive trailing after Aomi at a sedate pace. She brought food so that was fine. Here, she pulled a vial of blood out of her pocket and lazily tossed it at me. I caught it and cradled it like one would cradle a baby. My precious I hissed and skillfully ignored mom's look of disapproval. Asking Kishina for her blood was a long shot and not something I expected to work. She was the closest source of Yuzumaki blood, and I wouldn't lose anything if I asked. I didn't expect to get this I had left the vial with her in hopes that she would think about it. I didn't expect anything to come of it. Did she want anything for it? I told her that for the blood I'd do her a favor, should she ever need it. If she asked for something now it would be a load off my shoulders. Mom shrugged. No, she just said that she'd hold you to your word. I nodded and ignored the probing look Mom sent me. You sharing? I pointed to the yakitori. No. Her reply was immediate. I blinked and pointed over her shoulder. She turned and looked, but turned back when she saw nothing. Sadly, she was now bereft of grilled chicken. I licked my fingers obnoxiously while dodging a series of thrown kunai. Where did you get that? It was good. She stopped throwing stuff and rolled her eyes. I'll be back she disappeared in Shunchen, but not before throwing me a mean look. I rolled my eyes and looked over at Dai who had ignored my lack of youth. He was running through an exercise and had seemingly tuned out the world around him. Hum I dragged my eyes from Dai and started pondering on presents Kashina might want. Sadly, she wasn't as easy to please as Orochimaru. She probably wouldn't like an itch her corpse mom arrived and handed out Yakitori, while pointedly ignoring me. I rolled my eyes and started walking. There were things to ponder and minions to bother. Hopefully, that was enough to keep me entertained during a trip. The trip to Wing Country was rather tedious. Isami was weak and squishy, and thus required rest every four hours. It slowed our process slightly, but that was fine. I wasn't eager to have sand in my sandals. During our travels, Asami was briefed on the situation in Wing Country and given basic instruction on desert survival. She seemed to have been absorbing the information, but would still have to be watched near constantly so she didn't get stunned by a scorpion or bit by a snake and meet her untimely end. The older members of our little group could watch her for a while, or at least until I figured out my place in the camp. I wasn't sure what role I would fill in the camp. They needed medics, toxicologists, and frontliners last I heard. I could probably do any one or two of the roles. They weren't hard. Toxicologist was the only one I would have trouble with. But after a month I'd probably be competent enough to do it. My lab was also dependent on my role in the camp. If I was a combatant I likely wouldn't have as much time to study stuff and get into DNA shenanigans. I guess I'll see how it goes. Clones were always available to pick up the work I wasn't willing to spend time on in person. I watched two guards inspect our papers with an impassive gaze. Though my gaze might not have been as impassive as I thought it was. They were sweating and shivering under my gaze, while trying their best to fill out the required forms with their shaky hands. Hum. I watched one of the guards fumble and drop his pen at my hum. Was my reputation bad? I smiled widely and took my completed papers from the nervous man's hands, and made my way into the camp in search of the command center. Every building in the camp was the same. They were all stone blocks, that were brown and made of solidified sand and earth, only having one a door and a single window to break up the bland surface. I could tell that they were made using ninjutsu, sloppy ninjutsu in some cases. Now and then I'd see eyes peek out of the single small window on the buildings, 
Before returning to what they were doing, where's the command center? I held a passing ninja and asked. He shrugged and pointed to the only different building in the entire camp. That's where you wanna be. I nodded. Thanks. Anything for a hero? A hero I was not. I raised an eyebrow but didn't respond. Delusional or not, he was helpful. No need to correct him. I eyed the large building with a keen eye. The place was in chaos, but it was controlled chaos. Many different people were streaming in and out of the building. I saw teams heading in beside injured ninja, and saw people who had been healed and released as well as people heading out for whatever mission they received. The building seemed to be both a hospital and a command center. Go take over a building. I shooed my entourage away and started towards the building while ignoring any protests. I'd like to meet Tsunade by myself and get a feel for her. After a little searching and some threats, I was finally led to Tsunade. She didn't have the green cloak that I had in my memories but she looked similar to what I remembered. Blonde and busty. Yo, I gave her a cheery wave, and she dragged her eyes from the paperwork to me. Beaten and worn is how I'd describe her demeanor. She didn't look as confident as she did in my memories. Hello. She blinked slowly. I tilted my head and stared at her for a moment. Hayao Gashiro, reporting for duty. I smiled, sent her another wave, though this one was less cheery. She showed no recollection upon hearing my name and stared blankly at me. My smile slowly faded as she continued staring at me. She didn't know who I was or didn't care. It was slightly upsetting. I'm here for my assignment. She remained silent and started shuffling paper around on her desk while ignoring me. My respect for the woman dwindled as she continued digging through the pile of paperwork. Ah, I thought the name sounded familiar. She unfolded a piece of paper and dragged her eyes across it, slowly reading it. Your team is going to be under the command of Nara Shikaku. She said without looking up from the paper. Saya sighed and left, not bothering to speak any further. Siyune was a disappointment. I had a high opinion of her and was let down upon meeting her. She wasn't the woman she was when she became the fifth Hokage. She wouldn't be the person I remembered for a long time. It wasn't something I had put a lot of thought into. Hum. I hummed as I dodged a running Mednin. The Mednin rushed into Tsunade's office and exited my sight. I shrugged and made my way towards the mission desk. I'd ask them where this Shikaku was. And then I'd spend the rest of the day applying Fuenjutsu air conditioning to whatever building my group had commandeered. It was only after laying my eyes on Nara Shikaku that I remembered he was a clan head. I gave him a light bow while eyeing the hair of the Yamanaka clan head. The top and sides of his hair were short, but the back of his hair was in a waist-long ponytail. It was the weirdest hairstyle I've laid my eyes upon. Hello, new friends. I gave them a lazy wave as all my cheer had been sapped from me after my interaction with Tsunade. The Nara hadn't moved, but the Yamanaka gave me a Minato-like smile, which instantly gave me weird vibes. Put that smile away, you're going to blind me. That smile was too sugary for someone who has mind-raped people his entire life. His smile faded but hadn't left his face. I turned my head and eyed Gaia's sensei who had been eating quietly in the corner. I had taken an interest in the Akimichi as they were the only ones. I knew of that Yuzhang release similarly to the Shikotsu Myaku. I sent him a nod and received one in reply. The Akimichi techniques were interesting because they were almost completely Yang in terms of chakra. It reminded me of my chakra. The difference being that the Akimichi molded their chakra into Yang chakra while mine was in a perpetual state of Yang. Any interest in talking about your clan Hydans? I don't want to learn them. I'm more interested in how you mold chakra. The Akimichi clan head didn't take more than a second to shake his head in a firm no. Shame. I shrugged. I probably shouldn't have asked right off the bat, but the answer probably wouldn't change even if we knew each other better. The room descended into silence. I was thinking and the clan heads were studying me, both discreetly and not. Not going to ask to learn my clan's hidens. The Yamanaka spoke in a teasing tone with a slight undercurrent of something I couldn't name. Hum. I hummed in amusement. I'm not interested in rape, but thanks. I sent him a smile that wasn't friendly in the slightest. He looked offended. It's not even comparable to rape. I narrowed my eyes at him, wondering if he was kidding. The Nara tensed when my smile widened. Whatever makes you sleep at night. I didn't have the moral high ground though. Words coming from someone who experimented on people probably weren't worth much, morally speaking. Hum, I hummed and reined my chakra in, as I only just realized that it was the reason for Shikaku's distress. The good old chakra reserves were expanding, and my control was slipping. Perhaps once you got to a certain strength, your chakra naturally pushed you to your genetic limit. It was an interesting theory, but that's all it was. A theory. Anyway, why aren't you interested in the position of Hokage? I directed this question to the Nara who was also a Hokage candidate, although a reluctant one. This was so Shofu I learned from Kishina. You drag people into your pace and keep them on their feet. Usually, they're too surprised to continue with whatever they've concocted in their heads. Troublesome his face was bland. I wasn't sure if I was troublesome or if the Hokage position was troublesome. Ah, so you enjoy your free time then, and a narrow cage would upset Kanoa's current balance. I nodded and bulldozed whatever else he could have said. So, what's my new job? Paperwork. Murder. 
healing, sealing, scouting, sabotage. I held up my fingers as I listed each. I waggled my six fingers, and Shikaku motioned me to stop with a grimace. You and your team are going to be a frontline combat squad. You're doing what you did in Frost. I raised an eyebrow at that. My squad wasn't part of the mayhem I caused. All right, just murder then. I nodded and did my best to smother my smile when the Yamanaka grimaced. Oh yay, I've picked up a stray. She's not officially part of the team, but she's mine. Will that be a problem? I sent them a smile that promised violence. Shikaku shook his head. No trouble. His voice was even but I could hear an undercurrent of annoyance. I nodded happily. Many thanks, friend. It's been a long trip and I'm eager to shower. I hope you don't mind if I leave. I smiled sweetly. Shikaku nodded and shooed me out with his hand. I obliged and took off with a smile on my face. Hopefully, Guy was lurking somewhere. My clone slowly covered the building in seals, while I used a tiny Rasengan to carve my self-imposed rules into a section of stone that I had threatened someone into making. First and foremost was don't stand in doorways. A key rule that I learned early on in life. Second, no experiments on those under 12. I'd already broken that one with Asami. Third, don't let experiments live if they don't belong to Kanoha. Another rule that wasn't followed in the past. And last but not least. Fourth, no looting anyone under 18. One E-sans were free game Sai. It was obvious that puberty was hitting me hard. The one E-sans in the camp weren't safe. After removing myself from my delusions I started pacing around the building while looking at the seals. Everything seemed to be in order. I waved the clones away, and they set off to put air conditioning in other buildings, so they could earn a quick buck. Now, I just needed some blood from everyone who planned on staying here, and things would be good to go home. I eyed the empty building. I'd need some walls put up, and maybe I could acquire a second building for a lab. I hadn't wanted to make one, but it was probably worth the effort. I needed something to do with my time news of the third Rakage's death reached my ears a week after I arrived in the camp. I felt sad, this meant that the war would probably continue slowing down. Cannon fodder can be endlessly created and shipped to the front lines. It's the death of S-Ranks and slowly dying economy from lack of trade. That will bring an end to the war. Sign even after being trapped by a Rochamara the Rakage wasn't the slightest bit more cautious. I need to find a hobby I wasn't sure what I'd do with myself when I had no one to fight. I hated missions but liked fighting. To fight, I'd have to go on missions a conundrum. Aomi, can you train Asami? Start her on nature transformations, preferably water. Aomi nodded and started towards the door. Hum, I hummed and stared at her back as she left. The Hokage had seemingly lost interest, and Aomi hadn't received any letters as of late. So, I was going to continue training her. Eventually, she would get into genetics and take some of the more mundane projects off my plate while I focused on the space god descendants. Also went the new plan. She wasn't likely to be my Kabuto. Her loyalty to Kanoha prevented that. But she was still going to be my student. Aomi left my sight, and I let my thoughts bounce around for a few moments longer before deciding to find some test subjects. I was going to figure out what Kushina's blood slash chakra would do to normal folk, and then I'd make another tumor. Asami was also compatible with Kishina's blood. Super Asami was still a gosai. I reined my thoughts in and headed for the door. Jinjiriki blood might bring me some surprises. I let my eyes wander while Anochi blabbered on during what he had called the weekly briefing. Sune was here, as with a clan head trio. I eyed the assorted jonin surrounding the table, but saw no one notable. Shiro, you and your team are heading to Claw. I nodded and accepted the scroll from Anochi. Claw's daemon had requested my services when he heard I was nearby. I broke the seal on the scroll and started reading it, not caring who saw the contents of the scroll. Yeah! This is not happening. I tossed the scroll to Anoichi who caught it with a grimace. I was supposed to be the Daemon's guard for a few months. The Daemon was a notorious kid fucker, and I wasn't interested in spending time with him. That and I was in the process of an experiment. I couldn't leave now. Refusing could be considered treason. I eyed Shikaki who spoke. It wasn't considered treason as it wasn't ordered by the Hokage. I'd rather not have to kill the Daemon. That pedophile would need to die. I wasn't interested in protecting that scum while denying his advances. If I have to spend time with him, he's going to die. And my time in Kanoha would come to an end. The other daemons would order my death. They couldn't allow the killing of a daemon to go unpunished. This is an order from you, not an order from the Hokage. I spoke and eyed Shikaku while wondering why he was trying to start something. Sunaid leaned forward and looked vaguely interested while Shikaku was stoic. Are you trying to start a fight? I tilted my head and stared at him. I sadly couldn't do the smart person be 100 steps ahead thing. Shikaku had some sort of goal with this conversation, whether it be to paint me in a bad light in front of the Jonin, make Sune dislike me, or something else. No need to be so hostile, Shurikan. I kept my gaze on Shikaku while ignoring Inoichi who had spoken. He didn't look nervous but I could see the shadows in the room shift and become slightly darker. You're trying to start something. Why not run to Suna if you're so eager to die? I smiled and noticed Anochi flinch. My eyes shifted towards him momentarily. Sunaid had put a hand on his wrist and stopped him from making hand seals. We shouldn't be fighting among ourselves. Sunaid spoke slowly and confidently. I nodded to her, thankful I had avoided a mind rape. 
Why are you trying to send a child to a known pedophile? Tsunade stared at Shikaku. Shikaku frowned. We need the money. Shikaku had a touch of a smile on his face. I smirked and reeled in my chakra. Your head would earn us some money. Tsunade sent me a tight-lipped smile, silently telling me to stop with her eyes. Shikaku had accomplished whatever he had set out to accomplish, and I was annoyed. I'm not taking missions. I blew a breath out of my nose. I think I'll just head back to Konoha. I took great joy in seeing Shikaku's eyes fill with panic. That would truly be treason. Shikaku smoothed his expression back into his usual stoic look trying to hide his panic. My smoke widened. I wouldn't get more than a slap on the wrist. I was too important to throw away. I might get branded as unstable or unpredictable if I wasn't already, but currently... I was needed in the war and was safer now. I'll head over to grass then. Me being here is bad for your health. I held back a chuckle. Shikaku was looking more panicked. It seems that me leaving wasn't what he wanted. Well, see you never. I'll pack my stuff. I stood and gave Tsunade a friendly smile. Thanks for saving the Yamanaka clan head. Had he gotten into my mind, he'd have died. Tsunade nodded with a weary smile. Is there any way you would be willing to stay? Shikaku spoke up stopping my dramatic exit. Now I could make demands or I could throw them through a loop, and as fun as trolling them sounded, it probably wasn't the best idea. Talk to me about Yang release. I directed my demands to Chumza who was the only one who didn't seem interested in attacking me. And bring Guy when you come. I hadn't been able to find him. He nodded quietly while looking quite laid back. Swing by my lab when you're not busy, we'll chat. I nodded to him and he nodded back. I'll also only take my orders from Tsunade. I sent her a nod and turned and left before I could be stopped again. I wasn't sure what Shikaku was up to, but it seems we're on bad terms now. Sending a 12-year-old to a pedophile was an odd move, and I had no clue what he gained from it. Was he testing me and my willingness to follow orders? Or was he testing my loyalty to Kanoha? Another conundrum I rolled my eyes and started towards the hospital. I'd leave Tsunade some alcohol as thanks, she definitely earned some points in my books. Interlude. Hayagashiro was blunt, unsociable but oddly cheerful. He cares about his family and few close acquaintances, but cared little for those not within his circle. Though Shiro shows some traits associated with sociopathy, he doesn't have enough to be considered a sociopath. He was bold but not mean. He doesn't respect societal norms, but also doesn't lie and deceive. He makes long-term plans but shows aggressive behavior. Shiro seems to feel some guilt and remorse and follows up on personal and professional responsibilities, but he doesn't seem to consider his safety. Shiro doesn't manipulate or intimidate, at least not often. He doesn't steal, is not addicted to any substances, doesn't needlessly destroy things. He holds strong opinions but can be reasoned with and doesn't seem to have a strong sense of superiority. Shiro can be described as cold, but does show investment in the lives of others. He has a tendency to nurture those who catch his interest and had done so a few times, the most notable being Asada Aomi, who he has elevated to elite joan in strength. Troublesome. I shook my head and slid my report away. I wish I had refused when I was told to test him. I made an enemy, an enemy who could easily kill me if they desired. Shiro was unpredictable, and that made me nervous. Not nervous enough to take preventive measures, but still nervous. After all, we're at war and accidents can happen. My team could get surrounded and captured. We might disappear. It was an unsettling thought, one I was hesitant to share. If we bothered him further, he might lash out. Troublesome, I repeated. I regretted being as direct as I was. I should have taken a more subtle approach. Prodding him as I had was a mistake, subtle observation was a better option. Sadly, I didn't see it at the time. I leaned forward and rested my head on my desk. This was troublesome. Kishina's blood didn't give any amazing improvements. It did exactly what the others did, with only a notable increase in stamina. It wasn't exactly exciting, but I could probably use her chakra to learn wind and water release, should I ever have the urge. I shrugged and threw Ayumi's notes on my desk. The blood injections seemed to be a shortcut to low tune-in, and learning nature transformation. It was something that would probably see a lot of use from myself in the future. I was shit at nature transformations after all. My saving grace was the continued expansion of my range. The more chakra I had the less restricted my range was. It was nice that I was finally able to make tea with chakra strings, without moving from my spot at the table. A true thing of beauty that was. Hum. I hummed and ignored Tsunade who was blabbering while scanning someone I had given Kishina's blood to. People who got blood transfusions had a change in their chakra, and that was able to be sensed by competent sensors. My little experiment was shut down, while Tsunade examined my victims. The blood had left their systems, and Tsunade couldn't figure out what I had done, so I wasn't overly bothered by the whole thing. I wasn't going to be able to do it again though. How many times could you do this? I raised an eyebrow at the question as it was not what I expected. I could do it as much as I wanted, but I didn't want to do it often. Not very often, it takes too much time and chakra for such a minuscule increase in power. I shrugged, and it only benefits those under Chunin level. Making Chunin should be left to the academy. I wasn't interested in wasting my time by pumping them out. I was just trying to see if there were any side effects. Don't do this anymore, it stresses the body and chakra system. I nodded, of course. It did people weren't meant to grow that fast 
and body or chakra, okay? It didn't matter too much, I was done anyway. I couldn't see any more avenues to explore this. Learning nature transformations was all it was good for. You're getting sent to the front to relieve the personal there. I nodded distractedly as I was watching my victim leave the room after Tsune finished her exam. Am I just guarding or can I go chase them a little? We had troops deeper in the desert stopping Tsuna from advancing towards our camp. They were regularly traded for fresh troops, and it seemed that it was our turn. Do what you wish, you'll be the authority out there. Meaning there was no Eno, Shika, Cho out and about. That's ideal. I smiled. Do I have any mission while I'm out there or am I just holding the line? Tsunade shook her head. Just holding the line and repelling attacks, do as you wish. I smiled as I realized that my stay in wing country might not be too bad. Well I'll go pack my stuff, it's been fun. I sent her a wave and ignored her muffled snort. First impressions aside we got along well. I couldn't wait until she was hokage I leaned against the building we had taken over and waited for my little group to finish their preparations, while I basked in the heat. I'd bought a wide-brimmed straw hat from a shop in River Country, and it had become my item of choice in blocking the sun's harsh rays. I looked silly wearing it, but it kept the sun out of my eyes, so it was going to stay for the foreseeable future. Can you put some seals in whatever building we end up in? Asami had her own wide-brimmed hat, though she had also bought a reddish-yellow cloak. That was supposed to blend in with the sand. I nodded to her question, as I planned on placing seals on any buildings we occupied at the front. You'll only be there for a week. I had plans to stay a bit longer, as I didn't want to miss out on the last few battles of the war. I felt like I should get my fill while I could. Experiments could be done during my free time after the war. It's a week too long. I rolled my eyes at her. Battlefields are where you gain strength. She should be trying to stay for as long as she could handle it. Luckily we're not running missions this time, so you'll have plenty of time to rest and train. I couldn't have weak minions after all the front as it was called wasn't far away. It was only a 10 minute run. The front was a small camp similar in structure the main camp, with all its buildings being identical buildings that were quickly thrown up with ninjutsu. I wasn't sure why I needed to be stationed here, as I could arrive in a minute from the camp should I go at top speed. It was a minor annoyance, but nothing more than that. Where's the command center? I eyed the ninja who had approached me to look over the scroll I held out. Brown hair and brown eyes with Kanoha's standard jonin uniform, his only notable feature was the signature fangs of the Inuzuka on his face, and the ninkin trailing after him. Total cannon fodder. This way Hayugasama. I nodded and followed after the man. I was feeling slightly sad. The cannon fodder in front of me was twice my size and twice my age. And yet, I would be the one to see Kagaya's resurrection. I'd outlive almost everyone I met. It was a sobering thought. I was very hard to kill and potentially immortal, though the latter was still up for debate. De-aging my DNA had seemingly worked, but hadn't stunted my growth. So, I wasn't very optimistic about it working. This is it. I nodded at his words and studied the building briefly. It was the same as the others probably so it wouldn't be targeted. Thanks. I made a hand sign and 14 clones appeared around me. I turned towards the now surprised Inuzuka. Can you bring my clones and team to the residence? Certainly. He smiled and nodded. I watched him lead seven of my clones plus friends and family away with a smile on my face. He was perhaps the first Inuzuka I've liked. I only work for hugs. I eyed the clone who had just volunteered for death. Silly clones were the bane of my existence. Hugs for the hug god. His existence was ended with a smack to the back. I sent a nod to the clone who smacked him and received an eye roll in reply. Alrighty the clones were going to work on the seals, while I pondered ways to continue mutating different genes. It was the most straightforward path of advancement I currently had, and the most likely to provide results. Hum. I hummed and looked over the small amount of paperwork I had to do. I just needed to note the supplies, the number of troops lost, the number of enemies captured, and other boring things. It was considerably less than what I had to deal with at Frost. But that was probably because Orochimaru left most of the paperwork to me. I scowled at the thought. Paperwork was the enemy of progress. Hum, I hummed and nodded while ignoring the screams outside. I blinked and stood up when I realized I was no longer in frost, and it wasn't test subjects that were screaming. I activated my Biakigan and made my way outside. We were being overrun my dermal armor formed, and I broke out into a run towards the nearest enemy. This one thought he was clever and was using a puppet while hiding underground. A quick chakra enhanced stomp injured the puppeteer, and a second silenced his muffled screams. The sand wasn't as easy to stomp on I drank in the chaos around me, and smiled a real smile. I don't think I could ever go back to being normal after experiencing battle. It was already too late for me. I aimed my palms at the nearest enemy ninja, and fired bone spears through them. I followed it up with two more spears that shredded another's throat and pierced the fourth, sticking him to a wall. Hum, I hummed and slowed my perception, finally remembering that it was part of my whole fighting style. The most important part. An explosion brought me back to reality, and I turned my focus to an old woman who was causing trouble with her puppets. Perhaps she would be my main problem. An almost blinding amount of chakra quickly changed my mind. A frail middle-aged man waved his hand and buried many of our structures in sand, revealing his identity as soon as Jinchuriki Fuck. I charged up a heaven's palm, shunshined behind him and slammed it into his back as hard as I could. The sand surrounding him came to his defense, 
but it wasn't enough as my attack shed through it and continued through his arm. I jumped away as the Jinchuriki became surrounded by sand. My attack had taken an arm, but it also continued into the camp and pierced a few buildings before expanding and destroying the final building. Die, 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 die. I ignored the Jinchuriki's muffled dies and created a clone before charging up a second heaven's palm. My clone shunshine towards the old woman while I dove towards the sand sphere. Hands made of sand attempted to grasp my ankles while sand tendrils walked towards me. I dodged the first few sand hands and whips but was caught by a tendril of sand that wrapped around my ankle. It tightened but had no effect. A quick application of lightning chakra on my legs, and I was free of the tendril. More tendrils and hands came at me with impressive speed. I ignored both and shunshined above the sphere. Ugh. With a grunt, I smashed my attack into the sphere and shunshined away. The attack drilled through the sphere and expanded inside it. The Jinchuriki sadly wasn't harmed. He had drilled himself into the ground and was now hiding while building up his chakra. I took a deep breath, unlocked my seal and created a clone who in turn created more clones. The clones ran off into the chaos poking people as they went and shutting down organs, blocking Tinketsu, and killing as they went. I took a moment to wrench a bone sword from my knee. While the sand started building above the Jinchuriki, he rose from the ground, half covered in sand and blue markings, his eyes and teeth on his injured side, were no longer human looking. I eyed the tail behind him, while wondering if killing him would cause the one tails to escape. You've made me angry. I ignored his weird demonic voice and instead focused on the sand that continued to creep onto him expanding his form. He launched a large clawed hand at me with both rage and glee. Sorry. I coated my sword in as much lighting chakra as I could muster and vibrated it as much as I could. I shunshined right to him and cut deep into his torso. The sand resisted but was ultimately cut in half along with his body. I'll enjoy killing you. I rolled my eyes as he became more bestial, and his two halves reconnected using sand. Because of course cutting him in half wasn't enough, he opened his mouth and started launching sand balls at me like a machine gun. I shunshined around him a few times while giving myself time to put more lighting chakra into the sword. I deprived him of his tail with swing, and a clone scoped it up with surprising quickness. The one tails and I stared at the clone in surprise. I'll kill you. The clone stuck its tongue out and shunshined away from the danger, leaving me with an angry tailed beast. More sand gathered, and I started to panic a bit as I didn't want to fight a fully transformed one tails. I made a one-handed hand seal and created a construct on my sword, further lengthening it. I dodged a dusty wind launch from the creature's mouth and shunshined behind it for what I hoped would be the last time. I enhanced my muscles as much as I could and swung. Sh asterisk my sword cut through the sand toward the human hidden within. The chakra in the sand shifted and lashed out in the form of whips as my sword continued towards the Jinjuriki's head. My sword split the head at the same time I was hit with the whips. Eoof asterisk I was embedded within the sand in a poof of dust. I watched the sand bubble and writhe for a moment before simmering down as the chakra within slowly dispersed. I laid there for a moment feeling slightly numb as I hadn't planned on killing a Jinchuriki today I ignored a clone who scooped up the body with glee and turned my focus to the now retreating Suna army. They had come in full force, only lacking their cage in Sasori, who I had been looking forward to fighting. My clones had ganged up on the old woman and were chasing her down. While a woman with a bloodline of some sort defended her, the old woman was missing an arm, and probably wasn't going to be happy with me in the future. I knew she was in canon but couldn't remember her name. My clones and the women left my range, and all that was left was the slower soon and then all those that surrendered. Sigh. Another page in my tale. I deactivated my Byakugan and realized that I had forgotten my mask Shiro. I turned my eyes to Shikaku who was standing on the edge of the pit I was in and was staring at me. A rush of memories hit me as my clones had been taken out by an awfully convenient sandstorm. That covered the fleeing ninja. Give me a minute, I'm going to lay here for a bit. I waved Shikaku away and stared at the sky enjoying the cloudless view. More and more memories hit me as the clones that didn't enter the sandstorm dispersed after giving up. I held back a sigh as I realized that the clan head trio had done me a solid and held back bloodline woman while I killed the Jinchuriki. Aomi had deprived the old woman of an arm with the help of mom in defense of Dai who had been poisoned, and was being rushed back to the main camp. I closed the seal and got started on sending some of the excess chakra back into it. I'd have to catch up with Dai so I could save him if things went south with that in mind. I shunshine towards the main camp. Dai thankfully wasn't in bad shape, however, I was reminded of the poison and disease resistance I had forgotten about. It was probably time to make everyone poison resistant. I'd get some blood from around the camp, and have some clones work on it. With the addition of poison resistance from Suna, I'd say it'd be pretty good. But if I was already doing an overwrite why stop there? Surely bigger reserves and denser chakra would be applicated would they not? I nodded to myself. A few sneaky changes wouldn't hurt anger was temporary. Power was forever after all, a briefing was held and time was wasted. With the death of the Jinchuriki, it was likely Suna would drop out of the war. They were fighting us and Iowa currently, and their Jinchuriki was the only thing stopping Iowa from stomping on them. With their lack of Jinchuriki and Iowa's surplus of them, it seemed obvious that they would quit when they were ahead. Also Shikaki said I thought that it probably wouldn't be the case. 
The battles between Kumo and Iowa had become more frequent, and thus Iowa was committing more of their resources towards Kumo, as well as Kanoha. Kumo was only fighting with one village, while Iowa was fighting on three fronts. Us and Suna were fighting on two fronts so, Suna still had a chance even without their Jinchuriki, as no one could commit a lot of resources to destroy them. I figured they knew that and would stay in the war. Suna hadn't lost much yet, and could still afford to lose more. The same held for most of the other nations, only their lack of income and failing economies would cause them to pull away from the war. It was a fun state of affairs. Sorry, but I'm not interested in taking an apprentice at this time. I nodded having expected a refusal. At least Tsune was polite. I had expected a much harsher refusal. That's fine, I'll continue teaching her. I had wanted her to learn from a medical specialist. Although I could make it work, I wasn't good at medical ninjutsu in the same way Tsune was good. Reading notes and having someone verbally teach you were different. Are you interested in undergoing a de-aging procedure? Tsune scowled. I realized I might have made a mistake. Are you calling me old brat? Tsune smiled at me, but the smile wasn't friendly in the slightest. I shook my head quickly. No, I've developed a de-aging procedure and your chakra reserves would make the whole thing relatively easy. I was taking a slight gamble. I wanted her DNA, but I had no way of easily getting it. An anti-aging overwrite was what I came up with. It's only viable for those with large reserves, a yang affinity, and under a certain age. Sune looked slightly interested, but I could tell she was on the verge of refusal. I racked my brain for a solution, but couldn't find one. My brain was failing me. I'd essentially be able to de-age your body, but only once, and after the age of 40 it becomes increasingly harder to do. Sunade raised an eyebrow which I considered a success. Making stuff up was hard. Sunade was around 40, and I was trying to sell this as her last chance to have a younger body. Your lifespan would still be the same you'd just have a physically younger body. That wasn't true at all. I was just worried Tsunade wouldn't want to live for longer than necessary. I saw Tsunade still didn't look interested and shrugged as I'd already done what I could to convince her. Don't talk about the de-aging procedure. It's extremely hard to do, and I'm not able to do it for most people. I blew a breath out of my nose. I only offered because you meet the requirements and I owe you. Tsunade nodded but didn't speak. Sai no send your DNA for me it seems. I already had Kishina's DNA so it wasn't too big of a deal. There would be other opportunities to get send your DNA. I can tell you're not interested, but take a bit to think about it. I sent her a little wave and started on my way out of her office. I had planned on getting into Kushina's DNA, and had put it off for too long. Suna wasn't too likely to attack after having lost their Jinchuriki, so I had a good bit of free time, before I got sent back to the front. As I had the Jinchuriki's body and a tail from a tailed beast, I was excited to see what I could figure out. My clones and I had sealed the chakra extracted from the tail away, and were now digging through the Jinchuriki's body and DNA. There wasn't much, some mutated genes. Nothing unusual for someone with strong chakra running through their body. However, something was going on with his genes for affinities. He had wind and earth, but they were both unusual. I'd almost chalk it up to a bloodline, but he hadn't used it in a fight, his weird affinity genes, and his genes for chakra density, were the only other things of note. Sai, I'd call this a bust as there wasn't anything to be gained from the body. I'd preserve everything I could, and then I'd go through it at a later time. Maybe I could find something I missed. I mulled over the idea for a moment before coming up with a better plan. I'd take a peek at the bingo books, and see if the Jinchuriki was known for any bloodline usage. Maybe those affinity genes would be something special. Or maybe the host gained the affinities of the tailed beast, and that's why they were so unusual. Soon as Jinchuriki had a bloodline magnet release, it was good news. It made the body more valuable. But it made me wonder why he hadn't used his bloodline maybe because the one tails took over so quickly. Maybe. See if we can get our hands on some prisoners. Aomi nodded and set off to do her task. I turned my eyes towards the clones who were working on Kishina's DNA. They had been doing a fine job, but hadn't found anything too useful. Kishina's DNA was wildly different and not at all something a normal human should have and was taking a long time to pick through. Whether that was because of the Nine Tails Chakra or because of her bloodline was unknown. Her unusual DNA seemingly didn't give her any amazing abilities. But it did put her above a normal human in terms of chakra and bodily strength. Nothing she had was worth using an overwrite on myself, but perhaps it would be useful in the future. I turned my focus away from the clones and onto my notebook, where I had sketched out a few vague plans. First, I could stick with my bloodline's body and chakra and slowly mutate them until they reached an insane level. Second, I could start trying to add additional bloodlines to myself and make myself like Kanan Orochimaru, who was trying to make the optimal body. Third, I could keep collecting better traits and add them to myself. Fourth, a combination of all three. All of them sounded good in my head, but the first was the easiest to do. Mutation currently seemed to be the way to go, though I'd have to do a little of the second and third to get the tense again if I got to the moon. When I got to the moon I nodded to myself, 
Sadly, the power of positive thought wouldn't get me to the moon. I rolled my eyes and dragged them back to the notebook. I'd need living Hyuga test subjects to get anywhere with mutating my bloodline chakra density was easy to mutate, as it was easy to observe. Other traits wouldn't be as easy to do so. Maybe mutation wouldn't be as easy as I thought. Unless I made flesh and blood clones which sounded too expensive to do at the moment. Sigh, I didn't need more bloodlines, nor did I need to collect better traits. What I had now was good, as my reserves grew, and my chakra got denser, my body would continue to get stronger. It wasn't likely I would find any better traits anyway. The rakages were near the top in terms of strength also, bloodlines that had a lot to do with the body, were hard to transplant after a certain age, according to Orochimaru. He said that bloodlines that had a lot to do with chakra, were the easiest to acquire, though usually at the cost of DNA degradation and abilities that were weaker than the original bloodline holder. Knowing that bloodlines were probably out I let myself slump and held back a sigh. I probably wouldn't see a vast improvement in the future at least not until I aged or could get to the moon am I obsessed with the tense again? Probably. I crossed my arms and settled in for a thought-filled wait. I needed those prisoners to make any progress on Kishina's DNA. So, all I could do was stew in thought until I got them a few prisoners I had acquired, were given some chakra from the One Tails, and had shown some interesting results. Aside from the normal mutations and the expected but barely notable increase in strength, the prisoners also experienced an easily noticeable change in spiritual energy. Their spiritual energy now had a tinge of tailed beast to it. It was interesting, and I called it spiritual pollution as that was the first thing to come to mind. Their spiritual energy had changed, and the change seemed permanent. But more study was needed spiritual pollution could happen with the acquisition of any chakra, and the change was so slight that it was barely notable. Upon gaining my chakra prisoners would gain an ever so slight tinge of shironess to them, according to mom. The same was mirrored when they acquired her chakra, though they were notably more hyuga like in terms of spiritual energy, with the combination of both my chakra as well as mom's. It wasn't as notable as the change from the tail beast chakra, but it was still notable. It was something to look into in any case foreign spiritual energy could pollute your own need. I was once again stationed at the front in the time I was away. The buildings had been dug up and reconstructed. The occasional abnormally large mound of sand was the only thing left behind from the battle. It was almost like it hadn't happened at all. How's the training going? Isami had no interest in medical stuff, but had a surprising talent in ninjutsu. If she had bigger reserves, she would have a bright future in front of her. It's been alright, water is hard, but I'm getting close to learning some jutsus. I nodded. The academy wasn't made to teach ninjutsu. That was the job of the Jonin sensei, which Asami hadn't had. Finish water nature transformation and jump to fire immediately after, jutsus can be learned later, and Ayumi won't always be available like she is now. Learn what you could, while you could. It was probably time to up her reserves, exhaust your chakra and swing by tomorrow. She met my eyes and nodded. I'll need a bit of your blood first. She nodded and started walking away leaving me puzzled. She tapped Ayomi on the shoulder and started speaking while gesturing to her arm. Ah, I could have drawn her blood. But I guess it's good for my minion to have stuff to do now. How big should those reserves be? Cage level or tail beast level? Cage for now I probably shouldn't be creating tailless tail beasts. Kishina's DNA governing chakra was doing an excellent job of killing everyone who got it. It was a bit odd. It was almost like her DNA was poisonous to any who received it. There was one semi-successful test where one of the prisoners received her gene for chakra density. But even then, his chakra coils were eaten by the chakra in a matter of hours. Was it perhaps because she was exposed to tailed beast chakra for so long? Possibly. But I thought that was unlikely. Her blood had no negative effects. I'd have to test out the One Tails Chinchuriki's DNA, as well CLAP asterisk all right. I clapped. Sorry for spacing out. Isami nodded not looking too bothered. So I went to clap again, but stopped myself. Your chakra and natural bodily limits will be expanded. I trailed off and pointed to the override seal. That took up most of the floor. You just need to lay in the ominous circle. And you will no longer be limited by pesky genetics. I smiled but could tell it wasn't a good smile. Your future will be determined by your own hard work and talent. My smile disappeared as fast as it came, and I strutted towards the seal. ELAP asterisk almost forgot. I clapped again as I couldn't contain my glee. I've included poison and disease resistance. It was a little too much to do at one time, but the changes to her DNA wouldn't immediately affect her body. And she'd already had dense chakra in her body. So an abrupt increase in density shouldn't be too much of a shock to her body so disastrous results were unlikely. Did you make the seal ominous on purpose? Isami put her hands on her hips and stared at me. I smirked. Of course, I did. The purple glow completed the whole look. It just wasn't as ominous without a glow of some kind. Now remove your pouch and step into the ominous circle. Isami scowled at me. But I ignored her and shooed her into the circle. Sai Asami sighed and tossed her kunai pouch against the wall before stepping into the circle. Hopefully, I could get through some overwrites without using all the chakra in my seal alrighty. It wasn't likely as I had been using it a lot. 
but a boy could dream Isami laid down as instructed and closed her eyes with a grimace. I took my place at the edge of the circle and started filling it with my chakra. Maybe I could do two overrides today. I ignored the pull on my reserves with an ease born of the repeated use of the override seal. Dai's refusal of poison and disease resistance was unexpected. I figured after his poison scare, he'd be open to the idea. But apparently not I pulled myself from my thoughts and turned to the usually silent Aomi. Alright, you won't receive the same benefits that Asami will, even though the DNA you're getting is pretty much the same. I wasn't sure how to say it nicely. Your body is less malleable because of your age. Being blunt was probably not the best way to go about it. Aomi looked quite sad. Don't look so put out, you'll still gain some benefits, just not the same amount as Asami is going to. I didn't want my minion to think I favored Asami over her. So, I had to be clear about the whole age thing. I didn't want resentment to build in my favorite minion. It will also take a little longer for these changes to take effect. Lots of training will speed up the process though. The change in chakra density was the only immediate improvement she'd see. Everything else would take time, and training in the case of chakra reserves. I'm increasing your potential but you won't see rapid growth as you are not in puberty. I summed it up as best I could and moved towards the seal. She was moping, and I didn't want my favorite minion to feel sad. Poison and disease resistance will take effect as soon as you step out of the circle, so you have that to look forward to. I stood at the edge of the circle as a thought hit me. If Kishina's DNA was annoying to work with, would Naruto's be the same? Perhaps. Alright, step into the circle. This won't take long. I wanted the gene for Naruto's reserves, what I had was pretty good. So it didn't matter if that wasn't possible, Mom was the final person on my list of people to override. She was also resistant to changes of any kind being done to her body. Which was a shame, is there a reason you're so against an override? I ran a hand through my hair and leaned deeper into my seat. Mom shook her head and continued sharpening her kunai, without bothering to look at me. I'm just not interested. His tone was light but I could see from her tenseness that I shouldn't continue hounding her. I couldn't fathom why she didn't want to undergo some sciencing. There was minimal risk and nearly no negatives. Unless one was using animal DNA, I let the idea of animal-human hybrids roll around in my mind for a moment. Could cat id maids become a real thing? I scowled at the thought and pushed it into the deepest, darkest corner of my mind. Thoughts like those shouldn't see the light of day. I should be focusing on mom, but perhaps later. She was still tense and would probably be more receptive to the power of science when she was in a better mood. Due to a lack of human test subjects, I restarted my efforts to mutate the Hyuga chakra density gene. What I had achieved with it was great, but there was room for continued improvement. Chakra density was the easiest to observe, especially when clones could carry the blood and observe its effects. I'd also need to start collecting sensor DNA. It had saved me some work when I eventually decided to get back to it. Aomi stood beside me as we overlooked the fleeing Suna Nin that we had just encountered. Suna doesn't seem too interested in fighting me, do they? Their expressions of terror as they fled made it obvious. No, they do not. Aomi's voice rang out. I raised an eyebrow as I hadn't expected a response. Do you think I have a flea on sight order? I raised my hand and pegged the slowest ninja with a bone spear. So, I could say that I didn't just let them flee. Maybe Aomi nodded with a bored expression on her face. I was hoping she'd pull out a bingo book. That could have been a cool moment. All of these seemed to be genin level. I think they were doing a survival exercise of some kind. Though they should have done it away from the borders it was odd that they were so close to us. Let's go. They're running straight to Suna, and I'd rather not get surrounded by whatever S-ranks are protecting their village. Their current cage used iron sand in the same way the Jinchuriki used normal sand. I wasn't confident in my ability to pierce his defenses, as sand was already a challenge. Iron sand wouldn't be any easier. I think I'll get started on another nature transformation soon. I eyed Amy who raised an eyebrow. I probably won't need you around for a while once I start it. So you'll have lots of free time to pursue your own interests. Aomi nodded and looked rather unbothered. I turned my eyes away and focused them forward. I'd need to get the affinity genes for whatever nature transformation I wanted Sai. I waved Aomi off when she looked at me. I had just said not long ago that I wasn't going to do another override on myself. But if I was going to do one, I might as well give myself all the normal affinities. There was almost no point in not doing it. Even with them. I'd still take forever to learn anything, unless I made another Chuma baby. I smiled at the thought of another Chuma Chan. Chuma Chan and I had such fun together, ha ha ha. I chuckled I'd make Chuma Chan, and the clones could continue with Kishina's DNA interlude. Shiro's steps were silent and agile. He was a very light sleeper and could go days with little sleep. Shiro's eyes were always looking different from my own that remained unaware of my surroundings. I started copying Shiro's behavior, the confident but lazy way he holds himself, the way he walks into a room, which demands attention, and his silent and agile steps. What I tried not to copy was his blunt mannerisms and unsociability, though as much as I tried some slipped through. Closeness to Shiro had blunted my speech. I spent a lot of time observing him, trying to adapt his movements as my own. Though try as I might my steps were never as agile, 
nor was I confident as he seemed. He's late. Aomi spoke pulling me from my thoughts. He's never late. I nodded but remained silent, not really sure what to say. Shiro worked quickly and efficiently, sometimes starting things hours before to avoid being late. His punctuality was well known, as was his distaste for those who went early or on time. It was unusual for Shiro not to be early, let alone late. It meant that something pressing happened, something that required his attention. Shiro arrived soundlessly and tapped Aomi on the shoulder, causing her to jump. Yo! Shiro waved cheerily as his eyes studied her forms, perhaps making sure we were ready. Ah, there's been an outbreak of sexually transmitted diseases. Shiro smiled, not looking bothered by the subject. So, if you or someone you know has been having mysterious rashes or blisters on their lady bits, make sure to head to the field hospital. Shiro eyed Aomi for a moment and turned his eyes to me before quickly shifting them towards the sky. My face reddened and I stared at the ground. I wasn't mentally ready for the subject. Now, I might have to give this mission to someone else. Shiro tapped his chin. I'm supposed to visit the brothel where this started and treat anyone who works there or frequents the brothel Shiro continued, not at all phased by my or Aomi's apparent discomfort. I'll probably have to go through the whole town. Every man and their wife probably have something Shiro rubbed eyes. I wish we could just open a brothel in the camp. It would be a lot less work. Sai Shiro sighed and started back towards the camp. Let's go. We need to make someone else do our mission. Shiro turned and smiled at the two of us. Aomi and I met eyes. I didn't want to spend the next few days looking at people's genitals. And I doubted Aomi did either. Alright, we've got a Shiro, Aomi, and Asami adventure ahead of us. Shiro's smile widened. There's lots of fun to be had. I shook my head and increased my speed to catch up with him. This wasn't a mission I wanted. But when you were a tune-in, you had very little choice in what you did. The OOM asterisk I watched in amusement while a group of Suna Shinobi paid the price for being alive and perished in a fiery explosion. Had they not been so persistent in chasing me when I clearly didn't want to fight, the outcome could have been different. Not much different is cannon fodder was cannon fodder, and they would have died eventually. But still, it could have been different. I remember when I killed my first person with fire ninjutsu Aumi stared blankly as the surviving ninja fled. Hum. I let out on inquisitive hum as I wasn't sure why a seal made her think of ninjutsu. I cried the first time. Aomi frowned deeply. Ha ha in ecstasy. I said with a laugh. No, in terror. Aomi didn't miss a beat, and my smile vanished at her words. I nodded in slight understanding. Chakra can cause such devastation. I wasn't sure if that was what she was getting at. Perhaps she had something more profound in mind when she cried. Alright, let's head out. We don't need another ambush. I wasn't too interested in making more conversation at the moment. We had crappy mystery scrolls to deliver. Our encounter with the company of Suna Nin delayed our arrival by a few hours. But that was only a minor annoyance. I waved airily as if 150 Suna Nin weren't a big deal. One of them had the summoning contract for the weasels, and those little buggers were annoying. I wasn't going to fight them at first, but they brought it upon themselves. Having long rat things chewing on my ankles was beyond annoying. Anyways, a weasel with a sword gave me a surprise haircut, and in a bout of righteous anger, I killed everyone fast enough to keep up with us, which was about 50 or so people. Sadly, I was still pursued and had to send 50 more to meet the death god. Sunade and Aomi shared a look between each other. Hopefully the Shinigami apricated my efforts. I ended my report with a shrug as that was about all that happened. Sai Tsunade sighed in exasperation while Aomi nodded sympathetically. I rolled my eyes at the two drama queens. As fun as this is, I've got a minion to train. I tilted my head towards the door. If you'll excuse me. Tsunade nodded and waved me away. While Aomi trailed after me, Isami was doing alright. She wasn't impressive in terms of Tajutsu, but made up for it with her ninjutsu. She was mid chunin but had pretty substantial reserves. I was hoping the overwrite would shore up some of her weakness, and give her a higher raw potential, so she could work her way into the realm of S-ranked shinobi. Sadly, that seemed like it was going to take a long time, or at least longer than I thought it would. Srank was probably 10 years away for Asami, or so I guessed. It came down to her own effort for the most part. She could lose motivation or she could become more motivated. It was up to her now. I let my thoughts wander for a while longer before standing up and rolling my shoulders. Alright breaks over, back to Tajutsu GROA and asterisk Aomi stood with a groan, and wobbled her way into the sparring ring we had marked with rocks. A little pain now will stop you from being armless later. With those motivational words, I stepped towards Asami, who had gotten into a sloppy stance. Alright, just dodge don't worry too much about hitting me. Asami nodded and I nodded back. I kicked out toward her leg and she jumped into the air. Off the ground is not where you want to be. I grabbed her by her shirt and flung her further into the air. Flinging jumping opponents might become one of my favorite things. Isami sailed across the makeshift arena and landed in a puff of sand. Keep your feet on the ground. Unless one could fly jumping was generally a bad idea. I ignored Asami's groaning and pondered on the wonders of flight for a moment. Alright get up. Flight sounded interesting. But I knew it could be done with the tents again, so I probably shouldn't spend too much time on it. Alright, we'll do this again tomorrow. I said when it became clear that Asami wasn't getting up anytime soon. Haha, <laughs> I got a thumbs up from Asami causing me to chuckle. 
My minions adopting my mannerisms cracked me up. How's my chakra? I stood arms and legs spread while mom stared at me with her bayakigan. She shrugged, really dense, with a bulging middle. She didn't look overly concerned, so I accepted the answer and didn't question her further. I wanted a more detailed answer as I looked like a glowing stick man, while my bayakigan was active. How's it feel? I stared at her. Mom shrugged again, warm but chaotic. I rolled my eyes at the vague description. I brought my chakra to my hand, and it was covered by a white glow. My chakra hadn't changed much in color, but apparently it was chaotic now perhaps because of my new affinities. I let the idea roll around while mom continued studying me with her bayak again. Anything. I got an immediate head shake in response. Good. Okay. Thanks for your help. I blinked at her when she nodded with a happy smile. Anytime. I'm happy to help. I blinked at her again as she made her way out of the room and towards the exit. She was weirdly happy there whatever Jinchuriki DNA didn't want to mesh with normal DNA it seems. It made Kishina's blood and the Jinchuriki's body near useless. The fact that Kishina's blood didn't cause any problems. While her DNA did was also annoying. It was weird. But I chalked it up to tell beast shenanigans. Alrighty I eyed Yuzumaki tumor Ruto as I called my newest tumor like mass of flesh. The amount of physical energy it produced was pretty scary. But that wasn't unexpected. As the Yuzumaki were known for their vitality and chakra. I'd overwritten myself one final time. And acquired both the wind and fire affinities. I'd have done more. But my body was starting to reject my chakra. And I was worried I'd have to use an override. And go back to a previous save if I did any more. Two new affinities were a large jump, and my body was struggling to adapt. Tumor Ruto seems to be doing quite well. It was doing better than the previous tumor did. I turned to Aomi who shrugged. Alright, I'll be trying to use the power of wind to annihilate some paper. I gestured to my desk which contained said paper. You're free to do your own thing for the next few days. I'd be hiding and trying to stay away from senses for the next little while. Can I have your notes on Fuinjutsu? Aomi smiled nervously. I raised an eyebrow at her nervous smile. Are you interested in learning? I questioned while studying her body language. Hints of anxiety and fear were apparent Aomi nodded. Yes, I want to get started so I can get right into DNA manipulation when I have the required chakra control. She looked unsure, but I didn't know why. I smiled as I was feeling amused. Notes won't be enough to learn Fuinjutsu, I'll start teaching you. My minion was interested in DNA shenanigans. The thought warmed my heart. I'll start you on DNA once your medical ninjutsu is sufficient. Hopefully, that wasn't far off. Aomi nodded. Thank you. I nodded in return. Alright, I've got to tend to Chumaruto for a while. I waved her away as I was eager to start on wind release. Aomi nodded and started towards the door. Alright, I turned to Chumaruto. Wind and water are what I need you to teach me. I pointed dramatically. Aomi grumbled to herself quietly and shut the door behind her, leaving me alone with Chumaruto. I rolled my eyes and stuck my hand into the nutrition solution. I was ready to rumble learning when nature transformed transformation was easy enough. Using the tumor didn't make me any better at learning ninjutsu, but it did save me months of training. Thus, I held the weekly briefing in my hand and watched with glee, as it was reduced to shreds. I'd had trouble with water nature transformation, but I was able to use it to some extent. I wouldn't use it in combat currently, but maybe in the future. Alright, could you write down some easy water jutsu? Aomi nodded and wandered off to do just that. Minions were great. But making great minions was hard. Guy, it's good to see your youthful face. Guy's face was sporting a wide youthful smile as was mine. Guy did his nice guy pose. A thumbs up, wink, and a winning smile. Shiro, my most youthful friend. It's been so long. Guy had tears streaming dramatically down his face. I ignored his tears and gestured to Asami. Guy, this is my friend Asami. I pointed to my minion. Asami, this is Guy. I pointed to my youthful friend. The two exchanged greetings while I watched with amusement as Guy weirded Asami out. His weirdness shouldn't be surprising as she spent a lot of time around Guy. What brings you here? I've been bugging Chumza to bring Guy around and chat with me. But he's done neither. That fat scum. I've been youthfully leading a team to gain experience in the youthful art of leadership. Guy smiled widely and gestured animatedly as he started to regale me with tales of his youthful missions. I nodded idly while Guy spoke. Asami was fleeing, and Dai's eyes were streaming youthful tears. What a life I have I thought while Guy mind beating up a missing nin. I took a sip of my green tea, and let the bittersweet taste on my tongue distract me, and quell my wrath slightly. Weekly briefings were annoying if not anger-inducing, which was probably why we didn't do them in Frost or Rochimaru probably thought they were annoying as well. You look bored Shiro, Shikaku was trying to make conversation again. As much as I dislike the scum trio, it was probably good to stay on speaking terms. That's because I'm bored. I trailed off as Aomi added more tea to my cup. I pulled the cup towards myself and stared at the liquid within. The lack of action is disheartening and boring. It seemed like we had an advantage that we weren't pushing. If we had hit sooner right after the death of their Jinchuriki, we probably could have forced a surrender from sooner. I going to bail. Sire. I gave the group a cheery wave and sunshine away before anyone had time to react. 
Fuenjutsu was proving to be difficult, which wasn't surprising. If Fuenjutsu was easy everyone would be using it. Omi, please offer Asami the chance to use Chumaruto. I said without looking away from my mess of English and kanji. Trying to use English as my own custom script was looking to be a bust. If she isn't interested, we might need to hold a funeral for Chumaruto. Ayomi was visibly disgusted. She gave me a dirty look and made her way out of the lab. Ha ha ha, I cracked up as she sent me a second dirty look before she left. The idea of holding a funeral for the Chuma seemed to have upset her, usually there's no shortage of enemies. I said while gazing apathetically at the wave of Sunanin approaching the camp, but these all look to be the worst Suna has to offer. I kept my focus on the approaching ninja while trying to figure out their plan. I couldn't see anyone above Chunin level which was slightly worrying as the strong ones were probably elsewhere causing problems. Shikaku. He raised an eyebrow and I waved him closer. I frowned. There's no one here above Chunin. He nodded not looking perturbed. Don't worry too much about it. The main camp has sufficient forces should it be attacked. That wasn't my worry. But I didn't say anything. Me worrying about them attacking the camp looked better than me worrying about them sneaking past us to get water from the land of rivers. Do you want me to head to the main camp or stay? I asked while watching a particularly skilled Inuzuka shred her opponents. She was brutal, shredding Jenin and Chunin with a smile on her face. I took a moment to memorize her face while Shikaku spoke. Stay? We need you here for when the s rank shinobi show up. I frowned as I didn't think that was likely. They probably had no intention of fighting us. This was clearly a distraction. Alright. I just nodded and continued watching over the battlefield. I wouldn't interfere as it was good for the army to get some practice in. Fighting foes at the same level as them would hopefully do them some good. The few surviving soon and then fled. They were of course chased. But I decided that they weren't my problem now that they were leaving. Hum I hummed and deactivated my Byakugan when I noticed Asami heading towards me with a cheerful smile on her face. She looked positively joyful, even though she was soaked in blood, and had a deep cut on her right shoulder. You look happy. I said as I turned her shoulder towards me so I could see it while I healed. The cut itself wasn't bad, but the blade that did it was poison poison resistance was already proving its worth. Yeah, I raised an eyebrow. But she didn't continue. Whatever. All right, you're all healed up. I patted her on the shoulder and showed her away. I had to stand around and look pretty for a little longer. I was proven correct when it was revealed that Suna snuck past our camps and attacked Tanigika while we were occupied. Now Suna and Kanohu are in peace talks, and if those succeeded, I'd probably get sent somewhere else once again. Which was annoying. I now had to rush my projects so I could finish them before I got moved somewhere else. Between possibly moving again and teaching my minion with my half as Funjutsu knowledge. I was feeling pretty annoyed. Your writing is pretty good, but it has to be perfect. I examined the lines in her kanji. Every stroke has to be in the correct order, or you'll mess up the seal. When it sometimes took 5 strokes per kanji, it quickly became annoying when remembering the correct brush strokes. You could slow down a little as well. It doesn't matter how long it takes as you're not in a rush. I took a pen and circled all the kanji that had been done incorrectly. At this point, it's more important that you do it correctly rather than quickly. It was a lesson that took me a while to learn. I wasn't using Fuenjutsu in combat, so I didn't need to be quick. But other than that you're doing well. I said with a pleased smile on my face. Aomi nodded and ran her fingers across the circled kanji. I did calligraphy in my Kinochi classes. It hasn't been too hard to pick it up again. I nodded in understanding. Prior learning was a boon even if you didn't use it until years later. Learning was never a bad thing or a waste of time. Once you get good enough it'll become easier. Clones will significantly speed up your progress later on as well. Once everything became muscle memory the rest could be left up to clones. After that, it was smooth sailing. So long as you weren't stupid and didn't injure yourself often. It's slow in the beginning, just keep working at it. Aomi nodded and switched her paper with a fresh sheet. I turned my attention to the clones who were mutating DNA. Although clones could be given blood or flesh that produce physical energy, they couldn't produce more spiritual energy. They could regenerate chakra to some extent, but it came out yang heavy, as they couldn't regenerate spiritual energy once it was used. It was neat. I wanted to look into making flesh and blood clones, but I was wary of leaving a copy of my body around, if they ran out of spiritual energy. A slight conundrum I rolled my eyes and turned my focus back to Aomi who was hard at work. If only my younger and easier to manipulate minion was eager to learn what Aomi was learning. I drifted off into thought and wondered what I was going to do when they inevitably moved me to a different battlefield. There were only three and a half months of war left, according to my rough timeline. It could be more or less, but it still meant that I wouldn't have a stable supply of test subjects soon. I'd have to pursue other projects for a while, at least until I had a reliable way to secure test subjects for myself. I shrugged to myself and continued pondering on my future. Plans would have to be made, and goals would have to be set. I'd need to find other things to do so I didn't die of boredom when the war ends. It was hard being mad I thought with an amused smile. Iowa has pulled out of rain, and has redirected their forces to grass, and caught Sune paused and surveyed the room. She was happy with what she saw and nodded to herself before she continued reading. Takigika has allied with Iowa, 
and has started attacking our troops in Grass from the southeast while our focus is on the north and northwest of Grass. Sune paused and took a sip of water. Kiri has sent forces into the Land of Fire and is working on establishing camps along our eastern shores near Wave. Sune pursed her lips. Kumo has entrenched themselves in the Aisu Bay and is frequently attacking Awagaka while building more infrastructure in the bay. Sune tossed the briefing into the center of the table, signaling the end of the meeting. I ignored the chatter around me and grabbed the briefing with some chakra strings. The briefing flew into my hands, earning some raised eyebrows from the surrounding ninja. I ignored them and gave the briefing a quick red. Kiri was low on strong ninja, but hadn't given up on causing trouble, while Iowa was getting smashed from all sides and still seemed to be doing fine. Iowa and Kiri were the most annoying villagers. Iowa was too strong, and Kiri couldn't stop fighting, even when they lost most of their strength ninja, bearing their second Jinjuriki, who was half rouge. The briefing flew from my hands and was stacked neatly in the center of the table, with a little more than a thought. I had asked to be stationed in grass, but nothing came of it. The war was ending soon, and I was looking forward to getting into a big battle of some kind, so I could come out of the war with fond memories. But it didn't look like that was going to happen anytime soon. Asami sent a torso-sized bolt of lightning at me, which was cut in half with a swing of my wing-covered sword. I pointed my index finger at Asami, and launched an apple-sized ball of water at her. She sidestepped it and proceeded to launch a dozen fist-sized lightning balls at me. With a few coarser swings, the lightning balls were cut in half and dispersed into the air, while I sidestepped the remaining lightning balls. You have to switch it up, lightning Lightning is not working. Isami responded by sending a water whip at my face. I rolled my eyes, grabbed the whip, and started sending electricity down its length. Isami muscles tensed, but she ignored it and sent a second water whip towards my stomach. I let it grab me and sent electricity through it as well. Isami ignored it, just as she ignored the electricity running through the first whip. She tried to pull me towards her, but my feet remained anchored to the ground. She strained for a moment more, futilely trying to move me. I cut the whips with my sword, and half-heartedly tossed a small rasengan at her legs. She dodged it and breathed lightning at me after a few hand signs. I again cut it in half, while wondering when she would run out of chakra. The spa was starting to get repetitive, and I wasn't sure I could tolerate much more. Alright that's enough for now, let's go again tomorrow. Isami nodded and dramatically collapsed on her back. I eyed her for a moment before turning my gaze to the sky. It was a clear cloudless day as most days in wing country were. I tucked my bangs behind my ears as they were getting in the way and sunshine towards the lab. I had to make sure the clones hadn't destroyed it, test tube babies were on my mind a lot these days. I had quite a bit of DNA, and making a test tube baby was well within my means. I could combine and genetically edit the egg or sperm in any way I desired, giving it any bloodline or traits. I thought would mesh well. It was tempting as they would be easy to make, as long as there was a surrogate mother. The thought of combining my DNA with the DNA of another bloodline holder to make a child was also tempting. Especially when it was extremely likely that the child's DNA and chakra would be compatible with my own chakra and DNA. Make a child that was genetically similar to me, that had whatever bloodlines I desired, and switch my DNA for his DNA. It was a nice idea, if only because it gave me a lot to think about. Test tube babies and the acquisition of stable multi-bloodline DNA. It was something that I'd continue thinking about my clones continued to tirelessly mutate the higher chakra density gene, and were making good progress. It has gotten to the point where I didn't want them to mutate it any further, as my body might not be capable of accepting such a huge increase in chakra density. I scratched my nose while staring at the clones with my biacugan. Further mutation could probably wait. I now needed to decide if an overwrite was worth it or not. I had wanted to avoid more, but I'd already given myself two more affinities, another increase in chakra density wouldn't hurt right. Hum I hummed and shrugged while pondering what else I could set the clones on now. Genes corresponding to chakra or related to chakra were the easiest to monitor so. Maybe they could mutate the genes for chakra reserves or the affinity genes. Affinity genes or chakra reserves was the question chakra reserves were harder to test so, affinity genes it was. I shrugged and created some shadow clones, so they could make an override seal and get started on mutating the affinity genes. More stuff to do at least I'll be entertained for a while. It seems like we're going to be here for the rest of the war. I said blandly while staring my orders from the Hokage. Sunaid and I are supposed to stay here, while most of the non-essential troops are being moved to grass. Isami looked apathetic to my plight, and Mom looked nonplussed. What do you guys want to do? I could have a stationed in grass if you're interested. I realized I probably shouldn't be dragging the squishy people into warzones. I'd rather not have to move again. Isami nodded, seemingly agreeing with Mom. It didn't matter overly much to me. I wanted to fight some more, but if I could keep the people, I cared about happy that was fine. I guess we're staying. I pursed my lips. I still needed something to do. I can't seem to figure out what I want to do with my time. I keep changing my mind. I shrugged when I received no reply. Whatever, 
Alright, if anyone wants a break just apply for leave. Mom shook her head at me, and Asami raised an eyebrow. Don't abuse your power. I rolled my eyes. Power was meant to be used and abused. Sure mom squinted at me but didn't continue. I a w n asterisk I rolled my shoulders and yawned. Whatever, I'm going to train with Guy. Mom nodded and Asami sent me a little wave. I made my way towards the door, leaving the two ladies by themselves. News arrived and it was about Abito, who was dead and gone. I rolled my eyes and crumpled the letter. At least I got an invite to the funeral I rubbed my eyes, feeling stressed. Abito's dead and the Hokages granted us leave so we can attend the funeral. Cannon was still somewhat on track it seems, if nothing else Abito would be predictable. Better an enemy I know than an enemy I don't. Poor Rin's probably heartbroken. Isami's eyes watered and she blinked away the tears. I'll go let the others know. I blew a heavy breath from my nose and nodded. Isami scampered away and I was left to my thoughts. Was this the bridge thing or was this an unfortunate accident? I asked the empty air and received no answer. I hoped that Abito was alive and predictable. But things rarely went exactly as I wanted them to. With a hand sign, I was surrounded by clones who quickly went about finishing what needed to be finished and packing up what needed packing. At least Abito's death got me a week of leave. I was enjoying our quiet trip through rivers when mom spoke. What are your current plans? When no one answered I realized that it was me she was talking to. Hum. I hummed to buy myself some time. I'm going to buy a lot of buildings and rent them out. Hopefully I can cut down on the missions I need to do. That was the plan. Become well off and train a lot. Why are you asking? She shrugged and I raised an eyebrow at her. She was silent for a moment. I've been offered a position in the Anbu. I smiled wearily. People weren't supposed to know you're in Anbu. If you want to do it you can. But I'd feel better if you didn't accept. Mom nodded so I continued. I'd rather know where you are so I can keep you safe should you disappear. I probably wouldn't be told anything. Okay? Mom nodded. I stared at her, wondering if that was the end of the conversation. She didn't speak so I focused my attention back to the direction we were going. Anbu was only for those who were extremely loyal, and those who were unfeeling monsters. Mom was closer to the latter, but I still didn't want to test her mental strength. If you're interested we can talk more when we get home. Mom nodded. I raised an eyebrow at Asami who had been listening in. She quickly looked away and I huffed at her. That wasn't very slick. I sent my clones off to check on Kishina, Minato, and Kakashi, while I checked on my favorite Kohai. How are you feeling? I grabbed Rin's wrist and used the diagnostic jutsu. She was still eating at least sorry, but I need to be alone. Rin rubbed her eyes. I nodded. Are you sure? Rin took a deep shaky breath and nodded. I was feeling guilty about not revealing Abito's survival, but I cared more about predictability than I did about the temporary guilt. I'll come over tomorrow. Sorry for dropping by unexpectedly. I left the manju I bought on the table and made my escape. I laid in my bed and dwelled on how foreign the house felt. I had made a place for myself in Frost, and since I've left, nothing has felt like home to me. The absence of sound was slightly off-putting, as was the feeling of silk sheets. I had gotten used to the screams and clashes of steel, and I missed the coarse blanket that had been provided to me. Winged Country hadn't been as homely as Frost was, but it was close enough that I hadn't minded it. Now I was home with the awareness that my time on the battlefield was coming to a close, and I was feeling more lost than I usually was. Idleness will be the death of me. I flipped the pillow over and rolled over to the other side of the bed for maximum coolness. I wasn't sure if the emptiness that plagued me was from some DNA shenanigans that I'd messed up, or if it was because I was becoming an edgy teenager. It could be both. I closed my eyes and curled into a ball hoping for sleep that probably wouldn't come. False hope was better than no hope. Abito's funeral was much busier than I expected. Many a Cheha clansmen attended as well as people from the academy class. Minato, Kakashi, Rin, and an assortment of Achiha stood in a line in front of Abito's coffin, heads bowed and eyes closed. He doesn't belong to a clan, but he possesses the Sharingan. Kakashi tensed and Minato turned and gave the one who spoke a menacing stare. Hum I hummed and patted a young Itachi on the head. He looked young and innocent. Sadly that wouldn't be for long. If things went as they did in canon. I ignored his questioning stare and the reproachful stares of the other funeral goers. I think I'll have a look at Kakashi's Sharingan. Maybe I can make it less of a burden. The Sharingan seemed to drain less chakra. When it wasn't exposed to light. The drain was still there. But it wasn't as bad as it was when the Sharingan was exposed to light. Closing the eye seemed to help lessen the drain. But covering it seemed to be the way to go. You are going to need an eye patch or something to lessen the drain. I ignored his frown and continued. I can't deactivate it. I'd liken the Sharingan to a parasite. But Kakashi probably wouldn't take it well. If you're willing, we can work on changing your chakra. So your Sharingan doesn't eat it as fast. I scratched my head. I just needed to pollute his spiritual energy with a Chiha chakra. It would probably take a long time. And we'll need an Ichiha to supply you with chakra. I trailed off in thought. A transplant of some kind would be the easy solution though. Though it probably wouldn't be as effective as I wanted it to be. Spiritual pollution might be an unexpected boon. I hadn't been thinking too deeply about it. But it might be the key to the awakening of the Tensigan. I quickly quashed the joy I felt. It was just conjecture. I didn't have solid information to go off of. I could also alter your genes and make your chakra denser. That could help as well. Not that much as the Sharingan favored Yin Chakra and altering chakra density through the DNA. 
would cause it to lean towards Yang. It's up to you. I stared at him. Kakashi stared back. Thank you. He said quietly. I just nodded. Go see Rin. She needs some company. I showed him off. My presence didn't cheer her up any. Maybe Kakashi could succeed where I had failed. Thank you. Kakashi repeated as he left the room. I let out a heavy breath and rubbed my eyes. Only one of his friends is dead. And he's already much more tolerable. Good thing I can keep those thoughts inside. Choking down my nutritious health drink was not how I like to start my morning. But it was necessary. Thankfully mom arrived with a distraction that made my daily ritual bearable. Shiro, research and development sent another letter. I motioned for her to open while I choked down the sludge I had in my mouth. They will give you a personal lab if you work on artificial summons. Mom nodded and continued. It doesn't say anything about funding. She smirked. I shrugged as I didn't care too much. I'll write a refusal. I didn't want to burn bridges, at least not yet. They hadn't done anything to earn my ire. Yet, researchers are the quintessential nerds. You could probably bully them into giving you what you want. She smirked and I laughed. Ha ha ha. I could be the king nerd of research and development. Mom telling me to bully the nerds cracked me up even though I might also be considered a nerd. I don't think that's necessary. Even if I got what I wanted, my freedom would be heavily restricted. Which was not what I needed. But thanks for that, it cracked me up. I smiled and she smiled back. I took what was left of my health drink and slammed it back with a grimace. Are you interested in buying an apartment for me? I could do it myself. But it was easier when the one buying it wasn't 12. Have you got the paperwork settled? I nodded in reply. Did you get any loans? I again nodded. Sigh mom sighed and rubbed her face. You should stay away from loans. I nodded in agreement. I would have, but it's cheap enough now that it's worth taking out the loan. I could save up the money. But how many annoying missions would I have to suffer to get said money? Anyway, don't worry much. The bank just needs a 15% down payment, and we're good to go. I had to pay the loan back within 10 years. But that probably wouldn't be a problem. I'll send a clone with you, in case you need help. A hand sign later the room had gained one clone. The clone looked annoyed. But he made his way to my room in search of the papers. Sorry for eating up a few days of your time. Mom shook her head with an amused smile. I'll just send a clone of my own. No worries. I smiled as well. I probably should have done that in the first place. Thanks. Mom nodded and went towards my room. I stood and grabbed my empty glass. Before making my way towards the sink, the apartment building was going to get taken care of. That was a load off my shoulders. Just a few more buildings and I'd be wealthy. Interlude. Shiro rubbed his eyes looking half awake as he stared into the cereal I had provided. I felt bad about making him come over so early in the morning. But I wanted to talk to him about something he had said. You told Kakashi you could help him with a Beto Sharingan. I decided to be direct as that was what Shiro preferred. Yet, yeah. Shiro stared at me with unconcealed annoyance while stirring the cereal. Can you? My voice came out more desperate than I had intended, mainly due to the fear that Abito's Sharingan would cripple Kakashi. Shiro nodded, still looking annoyed. Yes, I just need an Ichiha to donate some of their chakra. Shiro took a spoonful of milk and brought it to his mouth, ignoring the cereal. If you can get an Ichiha on board, then I can lessen the amount of chakra the Sharingan drains. I blinked. It wouldn't be too hard to get the chakra people owed me favors, and even if they refused Makoto would be willing to give up some chakra, should Kishina ask. If it doesn't work, Shiro scowled at me. I know what I'm doing. Have some faith in your student. I smiled. Former student. And I'm not sure I taught you much, you did most of the learning yourself. Shiro shook his head and took a bite of cereal. Don't sell yourself short, you are still my teacher. I smiled and nodded, Shiro smiled back before digging back into his cereal. Is there anything else you need? I shook my head and blinked in surprise as Shiro shined away taking my bowl and spoon with him. I stared at the open window, wondering if I would ever get my bowl back. At least Kakashi would be alright, a bowl was worth Kakashi's continued wellness. One chapter this week. I don't have the same motivation or time I once had. I don't enjoy writing this fic at the moment, so I might drop it. I used to pump out four chapters a week, but now I can barely summon up the will to do half a chapter. Anyways, this fic has gotten too popular, and the criticism I get is overwhelming. Which is especially annoying, as it's always the same criticism from people who don't write themselves. This is my first posted fic, so of course, it's lacking. I know it's lacking. I don't need to be messaged about my crappy writing. I know, it sucks. I've already been told tens of times. Anyway. I don't enjoy writing this or even writing on this site. I might move to space battles or sufficient velocity. Hopefully, when everyone can see the interactions between me and the reviewer, they will be less cunty. But that is probably a vain hope. Anyway, this is a warning. This fic won't continue much longer. I'd give it two months. Stay safe, much love. Don't worry, pain is only temporary. Kakashi grit his teeth and nodded. I continued my work by beating his body into submission with my chakra. I had to smother his chakra and allow his spirit energy to come in contact with the Achiha chakra. Alright, let's stop here. Kakashi's body was similar to mine in that it didn't want anything foreign in it. Luckily or unluckily for him, 
This minor problem could be solved with brute force. Kakashi did not have amazing chakra control, so he couldn't coax his chakra into mingling with the Ichiha chakra. So, it was up to me to beat his chakra into submission and spread that Ichiha chakra all around his body, while also letting it mingle with his and mine, which his body didn't like. Let's do this one or two more times. A few more wouldn't hurt, but it was fine as it was. The Sharingan wasn't sucking him dry anymore but it was still a burden. Or at least I thought so, Ken and Kakashi might disagree. I'll see you tomorrow then. Kakashi nodded and made his way up the stairs and out of the basement. I watched him escape while feeling amused. Spiritual pollution hadn't been as effective as I imagined it being, but it did work. It just took a lot of time, and a willing or unwilling chakra donor. Each session tainted your spiritual energy, and little by little, you gained a hint of the flavor of whatever spiritual energy you were using. Direct spiritual energy to spiritual energy contact might be faster or more effective, but I wasn't good at directly manipulating the spiritual energy of others. Maybe in the future though, the days trudged by, and soon it was time to head back to wing country. Mom was staying behind as some paperwork for the apartment building had to be finalized, and I I probably wouldn't be allowed to stay. I had the whole gang including Guy at the gates, and they were ready to go. Guy was bouncing on the tips of his toes as was Dai who was trying to match his son's enthusiasm. Alright, let's go. If we hurry, we can stay at Tanzaki Guy for a night or two. I waved my minions in the direction of Tanzaki Guy and took off before they could respond. They had adults with them, so they'd survive if I wasn't around. I kept the group on the edge of my Byakugan's range while looking for bandits to abduct. Sadly, there seemed to be a lack of bandits in the Land of Fire. Thus, I returned to the group unsuccessful. I'm going to do some gambling. I turned to Aomi who I had mentally dubbed the unofficial leader. If I'm not back tomorrow morning, feel free to leave. Aomi and Dai nodded. I gave them a wave and headed into Tanzaki Guy, ignoring the gate guards, and speeding into the city with a shunshun. I scaled the large building and looked over the city. Its most notable feature was the Tanzaki Castle, as well as its various brothels and gambling dens. I was here for the gambling dens. I hoped to henge into some brown head cannon fodder so I could cheat my way into wealth. But I'd see how that went. Most of the people here seemed to be peasants, and peasants didn't have a lot of money. How did it go? Isami blinked at me in askance. Did you rob everybody? I frowned at her look. It went as well as I thought it would, which wasn't well. Even with the addition of 20 shadow clones, it wasn't that profitable of a night. I'm not great at dice. Between me and the 20 clones, there was a good bit of profit, but it almost wasn't worth the time or energy. I was cheating with chakra strings. But once the stakes get higher, there's ninja presence. Kanoha having ninja in Tanzaku Guy made sense, but it annoyed me to no end. I probably would have done better had I stopped early, but I kept going and lost a good bit of my winnings. What about you guys, have fun at the brothels? Guy and Asami sputtered, while Ayumi shook her head with an eye roll. I ignored them and turned my eyes to a suspiciously quiet Dai. We stared at each other for a moment, and I knew I had unintentionally hit the nail on the head. Isami and Guy's trip to the brothel aside, did anything interesting happen? Isami and Guy were denying having anything to do with brothels, while Dai and Ayumi shook their heads. Alright, let's go. I nodded towards the red-faced duo. Unless you two want to get one last brothel visit in. They sparted and denied my kind offer, and jumped out of the window, before they could continue defending themselves. Well, good news it's not cancer. I congratulate Aomi. It's just some sort of fibrous growth. I hummed and gave her cheek a second helping of the diagnostic jutsu. It's probably from biting your cheek. That was my theory. Do you want them removed? The growth on the right side was the worst. But if I was going to do one, I might as well do both. She nodded. Alrighty, this will only take a moment. I smiled happily as the right growth was slowly cut away and healed. Alright, now the left cheek. The fibrous flesh was slowly sheared away, while new flesh grew and replaced it. And we're done. I smiled. It's been a while since I've gotten to see something new. Now, what were we talking about? Aomi derailed my train of thought with her panic talk of mouth cancer. Sunaid wanted you to know that our prisoners were being returned to Suna. I stared at her and she shrugged. That's a shame. But it wasn't entirely unexpected. The same thing happened with Frost. Are we getting our own back? Aomi nodded. That's good. I smiled. Though the loss of test subjects was annoying. We need to secure some more prisoners. I had been wanting to figure out the magnet release as well as inject some more of the One Tails chakra into people. The small amounts originally used had been interesting. A larger amount would probably be more interesting. I should probably use someone young though. They would change the most and would provide the most observable results. I had expected the One Tails chakra to mutate the affinity genes and grant magnet release. But obviously, that didn't happen. See if we can get some of the local bandits brought in. If that's not possible we'll focus on learning. Learning and mutation might be my focus for the next few months. Do you have any requirements? I nodded but then shook my head. No, telling people to capture young bandits probably wouldn't go over well. I just want a few, no more than five. I crack my knuckles. I'll be training with Asami if you need me. Aomi nodded. Sire. I gave her a wave and shunshined away. I had a minion slash potential teammate to train. Mom arrived at the camp bruised and burnt. Her visibly burnt hands and black eye made me angry and concerned in equal measures. Don't worry. 
I gave more than I got. Mom smiled and gave me a pat on the shoulder that caused her to flinch. I nodded but wasn't pacified. Let me see your hands. I took her hands in mine and started pumping chakra into them. I was ambushed in rain. My attackers had Iowa forehead protectors and armor but they probably weren't from Iowa. I nodded while focusing on her hands. Why do you think so? I numbed her nerves and started to cut away any her sleeves, so I could get at her wrists and arms. Mom shrugged, the action causing her to wince. Hum, Mom hummed. They didn't fight like Iowa Nin. I rolled my eyes. You don't sound sure. My eyes met hers and she shrugged again. Anything we can go off of? I questioned. They wanted to kill me. But I caught them off guard and killed a few of them. Mom smirked. I turned the tables on them. Mom looked gleeful. I raised an eyebrow at her creepy smile. Usually, it was her that told me not to smile creepily. But it might be my turn now. You think someone was trying to frame Iowa? I peeled some burnt skin off with chakra revealing fresh pink skin. Mom nodded. That or they were extremely incompetent. She smiled again. They put up a good fight so I don't think they were incompetent. Hum, I hummed and nodded. We were already at war with Iowa, so this assassination wasn't directed at Kinoha. It was probably meant for me. Go and make a report. I'll finish healing you in a bit. Mom nodded and I let out a heavy breath when she left. Targeting my mother this was going to be annoying. There were a lot of people I could blame. Suna, Kumo, and Danzo being on the top of the list. Kumo and Suna were my main suspects because they were the ones I was caused problems for. Danzo was on the list because it was probably him when things went wrong. Never assume it was not Danzo. Ha 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 when in doubt blame Danzo. I chuckled. It seems I've found a new rule for my list of rules. Fuck. My temporary cheer faded. Now I needed to worry about mom being assassinated. I had accepted that it would happen eventually. But it made me wonder if I should have stayed under the radar. I scratched my head and leaned against the table. This was going to be a problem eventually. I'm just glad nothing too bad happened. Mom was going to need to stick with people. Her being alone wasn't a good thing. There might be a leak in Kinoha. The Iowa Nin shouldn't have known her route. It made me more suspicious of Danzo. IAW and asterisk I yawned and halted that train of thought. Danzo probably wouldn't start something like this while we were at war. Or at least I'd like to think so. I wasn't too sure. It might not be Danzo anyway I could ponder this later. After my mom denied me my chance at being a shaman action character by surviving. I was once again experimenting on helpless bandits and scum. Alright, get him onto the circle. I pointed at my test subject. Knock him out? I don't need him rolling out. Aomi nodded and did as instructed. The bandit was unconscious, in the center of the seal, and was ready to receive my tender mercies. I unlocked the seal on my forehead and was flooded with chakra. Alrighty I placed my hands down, and the seal glowed. Eventually, the glow faded signaling the end of the override. I closed my seal and sent most of the remaining chakra back into the seal. Move him onto the autopsy table. Aomi nodded. I made a hand seal and two clones proofed into existence. I need what's left of the one tails. The clones nodded and went off to do as they were told. I walked over to my test subject and started looking him over with the diagnostic jutsu. He appeared to be fine, and his body didn't seem to be close to collapse. So things were looking fine. Alright, let's see how this goes. My clones wandered over and got to work on unsealing the one tails chakra. The chakra was unsealed, and we quickly surrounded it with our chakra and tore a chunk from it before sealing back with an urn where it was kept. Without a word, the chunk that we had taken was pushed into our test subject, who thrashed in pain, but soon settled down when the process was finished. All right, we're done. Aomi and I were done. The clones would still need to siphon the test subject's chakra to ensure the one tail's chakra doesn't get pushed out or attacked. I was trying to cheat and give someone the magnet release using the one tail's chakra and some DNA from the Jinchuriki. I was pretty sure Naruto got the magnet release from the one tails, but I wasn't sure. My memory of canon wasn't too great. I need blood drawn from him every hour. With that final order, I left the clones and made my way into another section of the lab. I needed to get back to mutating the affinity genes mom and I were sitting in silence. I was going over my notes and trying to plan for the future while mom was reading something. I want you, Dai, and Amy to form a team. I spoke dispelling the comfortable silence. As much as I like them, I needed to distance myself from them now. Don't want to spend time with us old people. Mom raised an eyebrow. I shook my head. I'm going to retire soon. I paused. Well, I'm going to stop taking missions. I paused again. I just need a stable source of passive income and I'll retire. I couldn't think of a better word than retire. Mom frowned, she didn't look happy. I'll still be somewhat active, I'll just not be accepting missions. By the time the Nine Tails attacks, I should be able to quit completely. Mom nodded, but she didn't look particularly happy. If that's what you want, I don't think it's the right choice. But I respect your decision. Mom took a deep breath. I'll be happy as long as you don't stagnate. You must keep growing and keep advancing. Her eyes bore into mine, and I nodded. The same goes to you. 
This assassination attempt won't be the only one you'll face. I was powerful, Mom was not. The chances of someone capturing her or killing her to get to me were high. It wasn't something I had been concerned with, but seeing her burnt and bruised was a wake-up call. Since we're on the topic of advancement, will you accept an override? Mom grimaced causing me to frown. I didn't like that the thought of an override caused her to grimace. I don't like the idea of changing who I am, or what I am. Mom rubbed her with both hands. But I'll do it if it gives you peace of mind. I carefully smoothed my face. I was extremely happy she was accepting. It took me a lot to break her down. Her being stronger was good. I wouldn't need to worry about her death being caused by some cannon fodder. Thanks, it'll make me feel better. Mom nodded but still didn't look happy. She let out a heavy breath and stood. I need to go lie down for a while. She sounded annoyed. I nodded and walked her to the exit. I'll see you later. Mom nodded and stepped out the door. The door closed and a smile covered my face. Super Mom. My smile widened and I danced my way back to my chair. Finally, Mom would be less killable. My little experiment involving the One Tails Chakra and Jinchuriki DNA was a success. The One Tails Chakra mutated the body and allowed it to accept the Jinchuriki's DNA. Though his body accepted the genes for chakra density and reserves, the test subject had a weak version of magnet release, which could be because the rest of his body wasn't made to use the magnet release. Or it could be because he never completed his ninja training and was unable to effectively use his chakra. Still, it seemed to be a semi-success. Either, I needed a ninja test subject, more genes corresponding to the magnet release need to be identified, or the body needed to adapt to the chakra to use it more effectively. Regardless, I had some success in giving someone a bloodline. Though it wasn't as impressive as the wood release or the Sharingan, it still gave me hope. It wouldn't be impossible for me to transplant bloodlines. I had thought I'd have to wait for Orochimaru to figure it out, but I might be able to do it myself. Another possible step towards obtaining the Tensigan. I just needed to keep going, keep advancing, keep moving. Steady progress would get me where I needed to go. I just needed to keep at it. I sat at my desk thinking on the One Tails Chakra. I only had enough for three or four more experiments. I wanted to play around with Tail Beast Chakra, but I didn't have it in me to waste it. It seemingly did nothing to normal people but it might do something to people with Otsutsuki genes in them. After all, the tail beasts were just parts of the ten tails which was Kagaya plus the god tree. So, do I use some of the chakra on myself? Or do I make some minions with the magnet release bloodline? Their magnet release would probably be weak. But even if their magnet release was weak, their children might inherit a better version. Or maybe possessing the chakra for long enough might change their body decisions. Decisions use the chakra on myself. Use the chakra to make a new clan or new minions within Kanoha. Did both. I wasn't too sure. I didn't want the bloodline myself. But if I was already using the chakra, I let my thoughts drift around for a little while longer before I stood and made my way towards the door. It was about time for training with Aomi. I arrived silently behind Asami who was working on her third nature release. She was sitting with a bucket and trying to manipulate the water within. Do want a bloodline? Asami jerked, startled by my abrupt question. Don't do that. Asami shook her fist at me. I ignored her anger. Magnet release, yes or no? I asked quickly. Asami frowned at me. Where did this come from? She blinked at me. I haven't heard anything about you experimenting on bloodlines. I rolled my eyes. That's because it's a secret. Only Aomi had an inkling to what I was doing. Anyway, I've mostly perfected the process. You just need to survive your DNA being rewritten in the initial chakra injection. Isami's eyes widened. But if you get past that you're pretty much good to go. It's the first few hours you need to worry about. Once you get past that, things will be fine. I continued when Isami didn't speak. Isami frowned. Let me think about it. I nodded. Sure, take your time. I only had enough chakra for two more uses. If Asami didn't want it, I'd use it on myself to see what happens. I'll be around, come find me if you want to talk. I gave Asami a cheery wave and sunshine away. I stared at the One Tail's tail. It had been drained of most of its chakra, but was still corporal, and had not vanished as I thought it would. I knew that one could eat the flesh of a tailed beast, and gain powers similar to a Jinchuriki's. It was tempting to have a go and eat the tail, but I remembered the two reanimated brothers from Kumo being used to birth the ten tails. Something similar might happen to me if I ate the tail. There were also stronger tail beasts to eat if I was going to do so. Hum, but maybe eating a tail from each beast will be beneficial. I let the idea of becoming a pseudo ten tails Jinchuriki roll around in my mind for a while. The chakra wouldn't have any consciousness, so perhaps I really could become a pseudo Jinchuriki. I wasn't sold on the idea. But it was something to look into there was also the possibility that I would gain a forehead eye. But the sage didn't have the forehead eye. But that was probably because the sage only had its chakra. I would only have the chakra as well. It's something to think about I decided. Eating tail beasts I think I'll use a portion of the chakra and keep the tail. I nodded to myself. That sounded like a plan a spontaneous poorly thought out plan. But a plan nonetheless. Since I'm being spontaneous let's do that now. I cracked my knuckles and set off towards the urn. Alright. I've got your DNA edited, and the override is ready. You have one more chance to change anything you want about yourself before we go through with this. I eyed her hair while thinking.
thinking it would look good if it was white. Mom shook her head. I'll stay as I am. She was still uncomfortable about the override. Appearance wise. She added. I nodded. All right, lay down in the circle. Mom nodded and did so. Okay. This will only take a moment. I unlocked the seal on my forehead and was flooded with chakra. Just close your eyes, it'll be over before you know it. I placed my palms on the edge of the seal, and started fueling it with my chakra. Mom fell unconscious and I continued powering the seal. When she woke, she would wake with more potential than she had before. As long as she kept training I wouldn't have to worry about her as much. She could be strong and safe. I need to get back to indexing the Hyuga's DNA. I spoke mostly to myself. There was so much I had thrown to the side. So much to get back to. In a month and a half, the year would end and the war would soon follow. I had limited time to pursue anything that required human test subjects. It would be harder to get them once the war officially ended. Has the rice and wheat been shipped in? I tucked my hair behind my ear. Ayumi nodded. It's in storage. I held in my side that almost bubbled out. Go get it before some idiot cooks it. Genetically modified crops were the next project. It was so no one could say I didn't contribute. Aomi nodded and headed for the door. Thanks. Aomi nodded and left. With larger crop yields, Kanoha would depend less on merchants and other countries. Hopefully, the council would see that, and it would earn me some brownie points. But a bunch of old ninjas probably wouldn't see the value in increasing crop yield. I might have to come out and tell them it'll save Kanoha money. I didn't think highly of the council or the current hokage. I had been low on prisoners so I picked up a project I had forgotten in favor of something that provided immediate benefits. I studied the Byakugan I had attempted to create using stem cells. It was near perfect in terms of structure being the same as mine genetically and physically. But, did it work? Probably. I was extremely confident it would work. Aomi, do you want a Byakugan? I held the eye by the optic nerve and dangled it. If you don't want it, I'll remove it right after. Aomi looked visibly sick. No, that's okay. I swung the eye back and forth. Are you sure? I can change the eye color. The eye slipped from my grasp, and I caught it with my other hand. This might be the only chance you get to see what the Byakugan sees. Aomi looked torn between disgust and wistful longing. I mentally noted Aomi's interest in bloodlines. It can be shut on and off. No one will even know you have it unless you show them. I held the eye out towards her. No. She shook her head. If I'm caught with it I'll die. I disagreed. She was my most useful minion, and I've put up a good fight to save her. Alright. I relented. Now, I needed someone else to test this on. Now do I replace my eye? Or do I use a prisoner? I mused. A Hyuga was the only one who would know if the eye worked as it should. So, it would probably be my eye that gets replaced. The artificial Byakugan worked, but not well. It had less than a quarter of my original range but its sight was normal and unaffected. Why did you keep the eye white? Aomi asked. I blinked and stopped supplying my Byakugan with chakra. I was worried I'd forget which eye I replaced and pull the wrong one out. Well, I was worried a clone would do it. You couldn't trust clones to do a job right. Right the Byakugan seemed to be perfect, but its range was shit. Are you sure you don't want a Byakugan? This one will be destroyed once I'm done with it. I pointed to my one white eye. Aomi shook her head. All right. I shrugged. If she didn't want the eye then it was getting turned into stem cells. Well, you can go. I'll replace my eye on my own time. Aomi nodded, keep this secret. It's something that could get us killed if it was known. Aomi swallowed and nodded before she started making her way out of the lab. I stood there rubbing at my slightly itchy new eye, while wondering why its range was so pathetic. Maybe it's because it's not been saturated in my chakra for years. I spoke to myself. It was possible, but I wasn't willing to walk around with one weird Byakugan to see if it eventually changed. Should I give a pure Hyuga Byakugan a try? I scratched my head while sinking into thought. Maybe I settled on eventually. My body didn't like foreign stuff, so I doubted it would like the Byakugan. More stuff to experiment with. I made a hand seal, and a shadow clone appeared beside me. Get this fucker out of me. It was itchy beyond belief. The clone smoked at me. Asshole. I looked down at one of the few prisoners I had left with a frown. I wanted to use him to make a clone. The idea was to turn him into stem cells, and use those cells to craft a body for a bone clone, thus making a complete body for the clone's conscious to inhabit. Blood clones were a thing, bone clones were a thing. Why couldn't this work? Well, if it's any consolation, I palmed a Semben with an overwrite seal on it. Your death will bring me closer to making a new technique. I jabbed the Semben into his ribs and held on while the Fuinjutsu spread across his body. The prisoner lost consciousness, and his chakra was quickly drained, and the Semben soon started pulling on my chakra. I kept feeding it while looking for any changes to the prisoner. Things seemed to be fine, so I turned to my pre-made bone clone. Well, you know what to do. I pointed expectantly with my free hand. The bone clone nodded and places both of his hands on the prisoner. My reserves dwindled and I pulled away from the Semben, causing the Fuinjutsu to recede. Reserves are almost big enough for a full override, I noted. My clone ignored me and started to turning the prisoner into stem cells. He rapidly became a puddle of red sludge which my clone sucked up with a hollow bone tube it had grown from its finger. I watched the prisoner melt until he was just a pink skeleton, and the stem cells were consumed shortly after. The clone stepped away from the bones and took a seat cross-legged on the ground, and closed its eyes. All I could do now was wait. 
The clone needed to spend time crafting its internals and making sure it got everything right. Come here. I blinked and turned to the clone. I need to use your body as a template. It's easier. I nodded in understanding. Good point. It was probably easier than doing it from memory. That was a stupid assumption I made. Of course, making a human body cell by cell was hard. The clone was somewhat of a success. Its body produced physical energy but couldn't do the same for spiritual energy. The clone would continue to live as long as it had chakra even if its chakra was mostly physical energy. The clone lost consciousness when its spiritual energy was exhausted, but upon giving it chakra it woke and was ready to go. The clone had most of my abilities, bearing some of the more destructive ones that the clone couldn't do with the little chakra it had. Now I have a body double to perform risky experiments on. The clone nodded but rolled its eyes. The flesh clone was the equivalent of a rechargeable battery. It could be recharged, but the number of times you could recharge it was limited. Eventually, that chakra it originally had would have to be replaced so the clone could operate better. It was a step in the right direction. I now had a way to fake my death and perform risky experiments, should I feel the need to. The newly dubbed flesh clone was going to be useful. Want to eat some tailed beast flesh? I asked with a smile. My clone shook his head. No, I should be watched for a little longer before that. I gave the clone a nod. You're surprisingly responsible for a clone. He shrugged. I'm more premiant. I need to preserve my life. I nodded. That made sense. Alright, I'll see where this goes. And then we can get some tailed beast in you. The clone nodded. Sounds good. Have you thought about it? I asked Asami who had intruded upon my lab while I was working on overriding some rice. Asami ignored my question and pointed at the grain of rice that I had surrounded by Fuenjutsu. Why are you playing with rice? I huffed silently. I wasn't playing with rice. I was making a genetic masterpiece. I'm manipulating the rice so it's bigger and more nutritious. I was also to make it so it didn't fertilize rice that wasn't genetically manipulated. I if people wanted to steal my magic rice, they needed to work for it. There would be no easy way to breed my rice with other rice. I'm going to move on to wheat, tomatoes, and farm animals in that order. Kanoha mainly farmed wheat and animals, but it didn't hurt to have variety. There are few rice paddies, and they are located outside of the village, so rice is just a test run. Hum Asami hummed. What will you do to the animals? I shrugged as I wasn't wholly sure. I'll make them bigger, faster growing, and disease resistant. The stuff Orochimaru gave me wouldn't help me there. He wasn't focused on farm animals. I'd have to make them infertile though. I tapped my chin in thought. The chances of my super animals escaping and causing problems were high. They could escape and devastate the environment. I could also make them short-lived. Or, I could make them only produce male offspring. It's still in its beginning phases. There were lots of problems that needed to be solved. Back to you. I lifted my palms from the override seal. Have you decided? Isami shook her head. I don't need a bloodline to be strong. Her face was stoic, and her voice was resolute. I exhaled heavily as I didn't agree. Bloodlines were everything, very few without a bloodline was strong. Alright, no problem. It seems Asami wasn't getting the magnet release. More tell beast for me I guess. I'll see you tomorrow. We can work on wind release together. I dismissed her with a wave. Asami nodded. See you tomorrow. I nodded and waved as she made her way out of the lab. No bloodlines for Asami. Does everyone hate bloodlines? I turned to my clone who had been minding its business and reading in the corner. It seems so. He said non-committedly, while not taking his eyes away from the book. I rolled my eyes at how laid back my clone was. Come exchange chakra with me. We need to see if we can still share memories. I eyed the book the clone was reading. My clone rolled its eyes and set the book down. No need to be in such a hurry, relax a little. I stared blankly at the clone. You should keep your advice to yourself. Seno RT asterisk the clone snorted but approached me. Well, let's do this. I nodded. Let's. We joined hands and closed our eyes. I sent chakra down my right arm. And the clone captured it and dragged it in through its left arm. The clone sent its chakra down its right arm and I received the chakra with my left. We created a loop of chakra and mixed the chakra until it was even in both spiritual and physical energy for the both of us. When we exchanged chakra, we also exchanged memories, the spiritual energy being the medium of exchange. It's strangely intimate, but it works. The clone spoke, breaking the slight trance I had entered. This should be our preferred method of refueling. I nodded as that sounded easy enough. Sounds good. I just don't want anyone to see us doing this. Walking in on me and my clone holding hands and facing each other would look weird. Now the question is, if I die will my chakra and soul migrate over to you? I said to the clone. He smirked. Want to find out? A laugh bubbled out of me. Ha! Huh. No, not on your life clone. I'm fine with not dying. The clone smirked and I smirked back. Did I accidentally make a friend? I blinked at the thought. Neat. Okay? Let go of my hands homo. The clone jokingly sneered at me. I rolled my eyes and released his hands. Whatever I scratched my head and wondered what to do next. Lots of things to work on I hopefully won't be bored for a while. How about we make some sort of seal that automatically exchanges chakra between us? I raised an eyebrow. Hum. I hummed to buy myself time to think. The current process isn't an issue. At least I didn't think it was, thought the clone might disagree. If I had a chakra-centric bloodline, as long as our chakra was constantly mixing, 
you could make use of the bloodline. It would also double your available reserves. The clone waved a hand lazily towards the sky. If I had a body made out of Otsutsuki DNA, it would save you the trouble of rushing to incorporating it into yourself. The clone dropped its hand to its side and continued. We would also be constantly sharing memories. We would just be an extension of each other. The clone shrugged at my surprised look. It would be one soul piloting two bodies through the creative use of Fuenjutsu. A discount six parts of pain if you will. Hum I hummed quietly as I was at a loss. If I got a hold of Orochimaru's immortality technique, my soul could travel between bodies as it pleased. It would make me extremely hard to kill, but I still don't know how to mix chakra. That was the issue. Let's put the idea off. If I figured out how to combine chakra, I'd come back to it. We've got other things to pursue before that, like having the clone eat tailed beast flesh. I guess we'll see. We'll see. The clone repeated and nodded to me. Lots of stuff to do. The war ended a little earlier than I expected. It was early September when it was officially announced. Everyone in the camp partied and drank. I had no idea where they procured all the alcohol, but it was in abundance. Sunaid and I were among the few who didn't party. I wasn't interested in limiting my mental facilities, nor was I interested in talking to anyone. Sunaid wasn't interested either, and was packing her stuff so she could leave as soon as possible. Well, it's been fun. I eyed Sunaid's nearly bare office, while reminiscing about all the silly mission briefings we had. I'll come to hunt you down and visit you when I'm bored. I decided. No need brat. Sunaid smirked. You won't find me. Her smirk was cocky. I was definitely going out of my way to visit her now. Stop by and see Orochimaru sensei. Though he might not express it, he has been lonely. Or so I thought. Who knew with Orochimaru? I'll try. An empty platitude. I shook my head. I let you pack in peace. I gave her a backward wave as I left. Sire. Sunaid nodded. See you brat. I smiled as I left. I like that woman. Hopefully, we will meet again. It took a lot of effort to corral everyone after their night of drinking and debauchery. But eventually, everyone packed and ready to go despite their hangovers and grumpiness. Well, I stared at everyone with judgmental eyes. Let's head out. My mom scowled. She had been the most insistent on staying as she was extremely hungover. Why couldn't we wait a day? I shrugged. Early bird gets the worm. I shook my head and started towards Kanoha. I wanted to get set up as soon as possible. My clone was ready to go and we were eager to do some experiments. My clone and I stayed home while the rest of our group went to watch the Hokage's speech. I wasn't interested in listening to the Hokage spin a tale about our victory in the war. I had more important things to do. Like, watch my clone eat tell beast flesh. So, how's that taste? I pointed at the strips of flesh that had been thinly sliced. My clone rolled his eyes and popped another piece into his mouth. Just like chicken. The clone deadband. Sen o r t asterisk, I doubted it. Feel any different yet? I was hoping for fast results. But nothing's happening. My clone shook his head. Alright, I'll check back in later. I had to get some stuff unpacked and hidden away. And the wheat wouldn't genetically manipulate itself after all. A shadow clone was bothering Kishina about Fuenjutsu, while I and my clone experimented with its newfound powers. The clone gestured and sand bubbled out from the ground and pulled beneath him. I was trying to make a dome. The clone frowned. It seems my ability to manipulate sand is lackluster. I shook my head. Not necessarily. You might just need time to train. More than two days the clone smiled bitterly. Time. I don't have. Now that his chakra and DNA were changed, he couldn't be refueled as easily. We need to decide whether or not we want to keep this or overwrite my DNA. If we kept it, my DNA would be rewritten, and our chakra would be compatible again. Or we can continue as we are while exchanging spiritual energy instead. I offered my idea. It's too early to decide one way or another. The clone gained the ability to control sand, and the magnet release. I didn't want to go one way or another. I wanted to observe him for a while before making decisions. Spiritual energy is hard to extract once it's merged with chakra. The clone spoke, pulling me from my thoughts. True, but I was willing to give him my memories even if I didn't get any in return. But we'll figure it out. It wasn't as big of a problem as the clone thought it was. We can start looking at Mystery Woman's DNA again. I spoke. She could assimilate things if I remember correctly. At the time it seemed like she could assimilate foreign cells and chakra. But I was less experienced then. I might have misunderstood the process. We have to find a way to give someone that bloodline. Or we will have to make an embryo with stem cells and fertilize it. The clone gestured to its junk. Then we just use the cells that are made. I ignore the clone's gesturing. I'm not too interested in killing babies. I ran a hand through my hair. Killing soldiers and bandits is different than killing babies. Unpleasant thoughts begin. Then let it live. The clone shrugged. We just need the DNA, not the kid. I let myself digest the thought, and the clone continued. We use my sperm, and we make an egg with Mystery Woman's DNA in cells. The clone joined me in running a hand through its hair. It would be a somewhat natural merging of all of our bloodlines, and Mystery Woman's bloodline would help with the acquisition of future bloodlines. I wasn't sold on the idea. I didn't want a child with more than four bloodlines running around. Write it down. 
I'm not sold, but we can come back to it later. It was more important to see if the clone's ability to manipulate sand could be improved. Let's not be hasty, we still need to look at your DNA anyway. It would be pointless if the clone's DNA was degrading. Fine. The clone shrugged. Let's work on mixing chakra. If we can do that you can have access to my new abilities without the required DNA. I nodded. It sounded good. Alrighty I might need to put some clones on weak duty. Let's get to it. The modified crops were important to my plans. There was a surprising lack of DNA degradation. I had expected the clone's DNA to be a total mess. But surprisingly it wasn't. The tail beast flesh evolved you. That was my current theory. Have you figured out the cloak yet? My clone shook his head. No, but my chakra is red and tail beasty. The clone frowned. I've lost the ability to use the gentle fist, and my chakra has become too potent. It exhibits a corrosive effect when used on another. That sucks. I like the gentle fist even if I seldom used it. Can you use medical ninjutsu? He shook his head. Not for anyone other than myself. I frowned. I might not be able to manipulate DNA either. I rubbed my forehead. That's not good. I probably should have expected it. I think we should hold off on mixing chakra then. Or at least hold on for a while. Medical ninjutsu and DNA manipulation were everything to me. I couldn't afford to lose them until I had the tense again. I agree. The clone nodded but frowned a moment later. I need to give DNA manipulation a try. I nodded. Give it a go. I waved him towards what I had dubbed the ceiling table. Don't forget to take notes. My clone nodded with an eye roll and made his way over to the table. My chakra probably won't change you. It's the flesh that you have to worry about. I tilted my head in confusion, but the realization kicked in. Oh, the test subjects didn't experience any obvious change when they got the one tails chakra, but long-term exposure could cause change. I'd still like to wait, just to be safe. All right. The clone shrugged and turned to the ceiling table. I shrugged to myself and turned back to the indexing seal. I had more to do. Mom, Dai, Asami, Ayumi and I sat around our table eating. Team Irregular had been dissolved. Mom shrugged when she spoke. I nodded while Dai frowned. Are you Dai and Ayumi going to form a team? I gestured to each of them as I said their names. Mom shrugged while Dai and Ayumi frowned. It's up to them. She stared at each of them in turn. They nodded and Mom smiled. It seems they've still got a full team. I'll make a team with Asami. Though we won't be going on too many missions. Isami frowned and I continued. Just enough to cover expenses. Most of our time will be spent training. Isami didn't look satisfied. We can work it out later. I'm up for negotiations. Isami's face relaxed and she nodded. It seems money might be a problem for Isami. I'll ask Guy if he wants to be our third member next time I see him. Dai nodded. He won't refuse. I know. What else do we need to do? I trailed off in thought. Isami and Ayumi still need to be trained. I had a clone who could do that. Or the clone could do missions. It didn't matter either way. Mom also needed to be kept on track. But I probably shouldn't say that aloud. We'll figure it out as we go. Isami spoke up breaking the silence that had fallen over the table. I nodded in agreement and got back into my food. This rice wasn't going to eat itself. Our main problem with eating tail beasts is getting used to awaken the ten tails. I thought back to the Kumo brothers being used as a substitute for the Nine Tails. We could use that to our advantage, and try to become the Ten Tails Jinchuriki I shook my head at the idea. Why would we seal a giant chakra battery into ourselves, when we could become strong enough to not depend on a giant monster in our stomach? I gestured to the clone. It's possible to become more than the Ten Tails Jinchuriki. Being a pseudo Jinchuriki was an infinitely better option than having to constantly worry about an immortal chakra beast, that wants to escape and destroy the world. We could probably become a pseudo Otsutsuki if we went for it. We've got so much time. Nearly 20 years. We shouldn't focus on something that's a decade away. Especially when there were more options to explore. Maybe we can snatch a chakra fruit from the Otsutsuki, the clone suggested. They planted more than just the one here. I blinked. That was a neat idea. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. Why were we thinking about snatching chakra fruits from space gods when we couldn't even get to the moon? We can't even get to the moon. We shouldn't bother thinking about hoping dimensions like the Otsutsuki. My clone had bigger dreams than I did. I hadn't thought about the chakra fruits. It's just another thing to think about. The clone brought a glass of water over to me. Fuenjutsu is going to be our priority for the next few years. I nodded. Fuenjutsu was our key to the moon. Well, let's get back to it. As fun as chatting with yourself was, it was a waste of time. The clone nodded, left the water on the desk, and walked away. The clone couldn't heal, but it could still splice, index, analyze, and override. So, it wasn't completely useless. The clone was going to analyze its DNA, while I focused on my genetically engineered crops. Lots of stuff to do for the next little while. Mutating the affinity genes hadn't borne any fruit. There were some minor changes, but it wasn't worth pursuing. A minor change in how much it costs to use a technique isn't worth much when you have cage level reserves. I still had Hayuga, Ichiha, Yuzumaki, and Mystery Woman's DNA to play around with. Maybe I should start trying to clone them. 
Mystery woman specifically. I needed to get to the bottom of what was up with her bloodline. Should I make an embryo from her cells and implant it in someone else? Maybe. We need to start on mystery woman's DNA. I spoke suddenly, causing the clone to fumble with a vial he was carrying. We need to give someone her bloodline or we need to make a test tube baby from her cells. I left the idea of cloning in my head for now. I wasn't sure I was ready to bring clones into the world. Sounds good. I'm nearly done on my DNA, and the tomatoes can be put off for a while. I nodded. I need to book a meeting with the Hokage now that I'm thinking about it. I needed to get the prototype wheat and rice planted. Do you want to do the meeting or do you want to start on finding test subjects? The clone and I could share memories, but it took a lot of time to exchange spiritual energy between the two of us, now that our chakra was drastically different. So, it was now a once a week thing instead of a once a day. I'd like to look into test subjects. I nodded. Look into the apartments as well. They needed to be renovated. Put a mostly forgotten carpentry apprenticeship to use. The clone nodded. Easy enough, I'll just need some more spiritual energy. So I can make some shadow clones. I gave him a nod. Sounds like a plan. He nodded back. Things would either speed up or slow down for the next few years. I hoped I could keep the momentum that I had going. But who knew what would happen? I'll have to send a shadow clone to bother Kishina. I said to myself. The clone shrugged and wandered to a different section of the basement lab hybrid. I scratched my head and started pondering my meeting with the Hokage. I wasn't sure how much I could get for genetically modified crops. The Hokage and elders might not see their value. I shook my head and tried to dispel my anxiety. There was no use in worrying about it. I stood across from the Hokage while admiring his silly hat. It made him look like a mushroom. The thought cracked me up. The mushroom cage. I shook my head trying to shake the silly thoughts from my my head. So, I've modified some crops to grow faster, have better yields, and have better nutrition. The Hokage nodded and motioned me to continue. I want permission to have them sown in a few fields. The Hokage nodded easily, which surprised me. You can have them planted in the spring. I frowned as I realized December wasn't a good time to bring the planting of crops up. If they do as you said, we will start using your modified crops in place of our usual crops. The Hokage smiled at me and returned to his work. I stood there and blinked dumbly. I had expected more resistance, more of a fight. This was weirdly easy. Thank you. Hokage Sama. I bowed and turned to make my exit. He didn't even want to know what type of crops I was growing. Did he already know? Or did he have some trust in me? I quietly made my way out of the tower, feeling slightly confused. That was way less of an ordeal. Then I thought it would be I've always been amazed by the amount of useless shit people collect in their houses. Aomi seemed to collect knickknacks that she acquired on her travels. There wasn't a surface in her home that didn't have some weird little wooden doll or vase. Well, I came to figure out your schedule, but now I'm looking at a painted wooden monkey. We don't have one yet. Aomi fiddled with a porcelain hand that had a kunai within its grasp. We are trying to figure out what missions we are going to be taking. I nodded only half paying attention. Instead, I was pondering how upset Aomi would be if her house was accidentally burnt down. That's fine, just stop by the house, and I'll continue teaching you. Aomi was a bit of a hoarder. We won't have a lot of test subjects, so most of what I teach you will be done with animals. I turned my eyes towards the ceiling hoping to have some reprieve for my eyes, but was met with different knickknacks hanging from the ceiling. Holy shit, no wonder she's single. Well, I'll be going, keep in contact. I sent her a wave and went about escaping. Bye, Shiro. I nodded and sent her a second wave. Bye. I got out of the house and took a deep breath. Aomi was unexpectedly weird. She seems to have a bit of a problem with collecting useless shit. I shook my head and tried to put it out of my mind. I shouldn't think about it. It wasn't my problem. Three months passed. It was spring and my modified crops had been planted. Nothing had happened with them and nothing would until April or May. It was slightly annoying but I was willing to wait. My clone had gotten more adept with his sand manipulation and magnet release, but it still wasn't anything impressive. But I could afford to wait longer. The clone had only had the abilities for a few months, it was likely that he'd get better as time passed. I also got knee deep in Fuenjutsu, I was once again making steady progress. I still wasn't able to use languages from my previous life, but I was steadily getting better at putting my intent into custom symbols. I was starting on making my own custom seals. Nothing truly innovative, just more personalized seals. Soon, I'd be making my own Flying Thunder God seals. And after that, I'd be invading the moon. I was slowly getting closer to acquiring the tents again. I couldn't wait to get my hands on it. Mystery Woman's bloodline was surprisingly easy to integrate. The clone was able to integrate the DNA after a small amount of experimentation on some local bandits. The clone had integrated the bloodline into himself and didn't have any problems so far. Rapid healing would be a problem as the bloodline didn't heal everything correctly if there was too much damage. Mystery Woman's bloodline allowed for the integration of foreign chakra and cells, which was extremely ridiculous. No matter how many times I viewed the process I couldn't figure it out, and it was frustrating. It also made me realize that I might have given a roach marry the key to the perfect body. He would be able to combine multiple chakras and multiple different cells to create a mishmash body that could use multiple bloodlines, although probably at a lesser proficiency than a natural bloodline user. Having the DNA was better than having a mishmash of cells. The clone was happy with the bloodline. 
but I only wanted the assimilation part of the bloodline. I didn't need the 40 healing factor, at least it wasn't too much work to refuel the clone now. Your chakra has changed again. Mom spoke, knocking me from my thoughts. I nodded. Exchanging spiritual energy with the clone changes my chakra a bit, but only a bit. My physical energy remained unchanged. It'll change again in a few days, so don't be too surprised. I was going to overwrite myself with a modified version of Mystery Woman's bloodline. I just needed to do a few more tests before I did so. It would hopefully make it easier to assimilate DNA, even as I aged and got older. Have you been training? I asked, hoping she was making the best out of the overwrite. Mom nodded. Yes. I waited for her to continue for a moment. She didn't and I figured she wasn't interested in the topic. Any interesting missions? I elected to change the topic. Any maidens rescued? Any bandits killed? Mom shook her head with an amused smile. No maidens or bandits. She smirked. We did kill some Iwanen though. I nodded with a small smile on my face. You had fun I'm guessing. Mom smiled back. We all did. I waited for her to continue but she didn't again stopping the conversation. Alright, I've got experiments to get back to. Mom nodded and waved me off. And I shook my head and headed to the basement. I'd need to make another lab. I can't bring farm animals into the basement because of the smell. And because mom would probably disapprove. I was at a weird place where I was strong. And could kill a literal army of ninja. But I couldn't last more than a while against a Rinnegan user. Or so I thought. I did know a good bit about the Rinnegan, so maybe I could eke out a win of some kind. I mulled over the thought for a while and dismissed it as wishful thinking. The Rinnegan wasn't something I could overcome without bullshit eyes of my own. Did you get a place set up for the animals? I spoke up trying to get myself away from daydreaming about the tents again. The clone nodded. Yes. But you could have just overwritten them elsewhere. I blinked and nodded as I realized he was right. I could do my gene editing at home and overwrites elsewhere. Oops. I rubbed the back of my head sheepishly. That was a blunder, an expensive one too. Well, how was Orochimaru? I changed the topic feeling a little embarrassed about my lack of thought. The clone shrugged. He liked the Baikigan. I smiled as that was good news. The Jinchuriki body made him excited, but he was more interested in the Baikigan. My smile grew. Good, glad he likes it. With the Baikigan Orochimaru could now see Chakra. I wondered what he could do with it. Hopefully he's not stingy with any fines he makes. I didn't hold much hope, but maybe Orochimaru would share. Don't get your hopes up. The clone shook his head at me. You know he's not one for sharing. Sigh, I just sighed and nodded. The clone was right, even if its nagging was annoying. I shook my head and stared down at the seal I had long forgotten in favor of daydreaming. It was supposed to record everything about a body right down to its DNA, and record it for later Persual. It wasn't going to be useful. It was the first thing that came to mind while I was pondering how I could test my abilities in Fuinjutsu. It was somewhat hard to make, but not very useful. I'm having dinner with Team Minato in a few hours. Team Minato had adopted Guy and Asami which was nice as I didn't have to do as many missions. Team Minato dragged Guy and Asami out often enough that we didn't need to do them as often. Do you want to go instead? My clone smiled. Why would I pass up the chance to freak Minato out? Minato didn't like the clone. Something about its chakra freaked him out. And the clone loved that. Good. I nodded. I was glad I wasn't forced to eat subpar barbecue and make conversation. Poor food and pointless conversation were among my least favorite things. After a somewhat minor override, I was feeling unexpectedly good. Mystery Woman's DNA seemed to have done something beyond give me the the ability to assimilate foreign cells, and chakra easier. I haven't felt this good in a while. I had a giddy smile on my face. My clone shook his head with a smile. The bloodline makes you adapt, or so I think. The clone shrugged. It seems more like adaptability than assimilation. I raised an eyebrow, and the clone shrugged in response. He had to have figured that out within the last few days as we recently shared spiritual energy. I guess adapting to foreign cells makes more sense. I started cracking my fingers one by one, and the clone looked at me with disgust. Adapting, in general, makes sense. I corrected myself after some thought. My clone nodded approvingly. Not all adaptations are good, but some are. I nodded in understanding. Right now, your body is adapting to your chakra. It's why you feel so good. Your body isn't about to explode from excess chakra. I shook my head trying to shake the image from my mind. Have you had any problems with the bloodline? My clone immediately nodded. Yes. I heal too fast now. Makes it hard to draw blood. I raised an eyebrow, and the clone shrugged. Not much of a problem for you though. I guess faulty healing was not a problem when one was adept at medical ninjutsu. As long as one was vigilant enough, it wouldn't be a problem. You should make a strength of 800 seal. I tapped my forehead protector, which hid said seal. If I gave you a good bit of my chakra, you could go months without a refill. The clone didn't look overly enthused with the idea and shook his head. That's too much time. I can't go that long without using chakra. He scratched his cheek. I'll die of boredom. Sigh, I wanted the clone to have more freedom, but I wouldn't push it. I had trouble fighting off my boredom with chakra. I couldn't imagine how bored I would be without my chakra. I've become a workaholic. I shook my head and headed upstairs. I'd eat something and have a look at my DNA. I had to make sure it wasn't degrading. DNA degradation would be a nightmare. After getting my hands on some of Itachi's DNA, I spent a week or so comparing it to the brown-haired Achiha DNA. 
and didn't find anything amazing. I had expected to find Atachi's mystery illness, but found no such thing. Or at least no signs of it. I had hoped I could mix that illness, and have some way to gain favor from Atachi. But no chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or cystic fibrosis for Atachi it seems, maybe it was Manjikum related. Hum I hummed and considered the thought. I faintly remember Madara being bedridden and nearly blind before getting his eternal Manjikum. Abito didn't have any problems, but he was half Hashirama with all those cells he had. Fugaku also had a Manjikum that didn't cause him problems, but I hadn't seen Fugaku use his Manjikum for anything more than Jinjutsu, so I wasn't sure if that was the case. Maybe it was the Manjikum, maybe it wasn't I'd have to wait and see Shiro. You don't stop growing. I returned Kishina's hug while she screamed in my ear. Why do you keep getting bigger? Kishina tried to pick me up, but I anchored my feet to the ground with chakra. She pouted and released me from her grasp. Stop trying to carry me around. I exhaled heavily. I'm 12, much too old to be carried. Shem ph. Kishina fed and continued pouting. I rolled my eyes and made my way into the apartment. Her ceiling supplies were out, and she seems to have been working on something before I arrived. What you working on? I leaned over the half-drawn seal, trying to decipher his purpose. Energy containment, energy compression, and energy sealing were what I could gather. The rest was gibberish. Most likely self-made symbols. I dunno. Just something to pass the time. Kishina trailed off as I stared at her. Hum. I hummed, not believing her. Seeing my disbelief, Kishina opted to change the topic. Do you need any help? She started sashing her projects away hiding them from sight. I just shook my head both in refusal and because she shoved a lot of her work under a couch. No, I just came to see how you were doing. I was maintaining our relationship with Visits and Raymond. I also brought Raymond, said Raymond appeared in my hand with a puff of smoke. Oh, Kishina snatched the Raymond from my hands and ran to the kitchen. She disappeared from my view and came back with an empty bowl. I raised an eyebrow and accepted the bowl back. I feel like I should have brought more thanks, Shiro, that hit the spot. Kishina smiled and patted her stomach. I nodded in acknowledgement while trying to decide whether I should stay or go. All right, I can see that you are busy. I gestured to the paper that she had pulley hidden beneath the couch. Feel free to stop by if you have time. Kishina nodded, looking slightly embarrassed when I pointed out the papers hidden under the couch. All right, thanks Shiro. I nodded and shunshined away. I had other people to visit, mainly Asami and Aomi. One needed training and the other needed some practice in manipulating DNA. She wasn't good enough to do anything properly, but it never hurt to start early. It would give her something to aspire to in any case. I found myself feeling lost and bored without the war. There was always something that needed to be done during the war, but now that I was at home, I usually had nothing to do. With every experiment or task, I crossed off my mental list. I got a little closer to my numbing boredom. So, I opted to create more work to stave off the boredom. Mainly by bothering Minato. Minato, teach me about sage mode. I poked him in the side, while mentally cursing my shortness. Minato was tall, and it made me feel like a midget. I can't. Minato ruffled my hair. You have to sign the toad contract if you want to learn senjutsu. Hum. I hummed and raised an eyebrow. Was that an offer? Minato nodded his head in the affirmative, and I drifted into thought. The toad contract wasn't a bad choice if one was looking for a summon, but I wasn't sure it was what I wanted. The toads were very mild-mannered. I was worried they wouldn't like me. I'm interested, but I don't think the toads will like me. I said after a while. Let me think about it. I'll get back to you on it. I had tried to sense nature chakra, but I was extremely incompetent in terms of sensing. It just wasn't something I was good at. I might have to get back into the sensor DNA. I had a whole lot of it, and I could assemble a sensing gene if I desired. But I didn't know what kind of sensor I would want to be. How much range did I want? How detailed would I want it to be? Would my sensing be passive or active requiring focus? Did I want to take someone's already established natural gene? Or did I want to make an artificial gene catered to myself? Lots of questions. Lots of thinking to do. I guess I've done what I set out to do. I've created more work for myself well. Talk to the toads about me. I gestured to myself. If they're interested, I'm interested. Having the toads refuse me at a distance was less painful than having them dismiss me to my face. Will do. Minato nodded and returned his focus to Rin and Kikashi who was sparing with a Samian guy. I'll come to get you when I get an answer. Meaning, don't come to get me. I'll get you. All right. I nodded and shunshine away before I got dragged into sparing. I wasn't interested at the moment. Wind ninjutsu was pretty uninteresting as far as ninjutsu went. Most of the wind ninjutsu that the village had involved sending various amounts of wind blades at an opponent. There were a few jutsus that involved sending a blast of wind at an opponent, like Great Breakthrough or Girl Palm. But those were the only ones I could find. That didn't involve wind blades. Everything good was either in other villages or hidden away somewhere. Blades and walls of wind couldn't be all that the village had, could it? I shook my head and rid myself of the notion. As always, the good stuff was hidden, meaning I would have to get the good stuff myself. Which was annoying. But at least I had something new to do. That was more than I could ask for. On the plus side, fire and ninjutsu was plentiful if also uninteresting. I got to choose between small fire, medium fire or large fire. 
Every fire ninjutsu was a variation of the other, the only difference being the size and sometimes shape. It made picking easy as every jutsu was nearly the same, but it also left me dissatisfied. Why weren't there more interesting fire jutsu? It can't be that hard to make something original I shook my head. The lack of interesting jutsu was annoying, but I could always make my own. There was no need to settle for the generic jutsu when I could be original and make my own. Time passed as it inevitably does, and Minato was granted the position of Hokage by the third. Most of Kanoha was happy with Minato for a cage bearing the Achiha, who had wanted Fugaku to be the Hokage and of course Orochimaru, who had wanted to be the Hokage. Orochimaru felt betrayed when the third chose Minato over him, and made quite the scene by trashing his lap and scaring his assistants. After Orochimaru's rage was quelled, he fired all his assistants, and had holed himself up in his lap. I tried to accompany him, but he wasn't interested, and I was promptly shooed out of his lap. All in all, life was boring. Safe but boring. I had used my mother's sense of genesis as a base, and adjusted them until I had a slightly different gene more suited to myself. And after months of training, I now could sense chakra sensing wasn't passive like I thought it was, or at least it wasn't for most people. Sensing required concentration to use, sometimes even needing hand seals for those who were unskilled. Sensors could also sense other sensors who were sensing, making sensing even more worthless than it already was for someone who had a Byakugan. It was a welcome addition to my arsenal, even if I probably wouldn't be using it all that often. I had my Byakugan which provided a far clearer picture of what was happening. My sensing was limited to a single kilometer, so it probably wouldn't see much use. It was a bit of a bummer, but I could easily change the gene or genes and swap it out if I found a more useful one. Like Karen's mind's eye of the Kaguroham, I hummed at the thought. Even if I gained her weird sensing genes, I probably wouldn't be able to use them effectively. It would take countless hours of training to make use of it, and countless more to become truly proficient. And even then, my Byakugan would likely increase in range, making it useless. I might be better off focusing on passive close range, sensing it would prevent people from sneaking up on me. And that's all I wanted from sensing in the first place I found myself in a tree and staring at our mission targets. It was how most missions that had killing ended up. Every time someone needed to die, I ended up in a tree one way or another. It was almost predictable at this point. I don't feel like slaughtering some helpless bandits today. Isami gestured to said bandits, who were gathered around a fire after a long day of pillaging and raping. Sorry, my most youthful friend, but neither am I. Guy added from the base of the tree while doing handstand push-ups. I remained silent and alternated my gaze between the both of them. I didn't want to kill the bandits either. I had just gotten new clothes and wasn't in a hurry to damage them. I took this mission because you guys wanted to do one. I pursed my lips and stared at Asami, as she was the one in my line of sight. I didn't want to do all the work on a mission that I didn't want to go on in the first place. Will you do it please? Isami blinked in what she thought was a cute and innocent manner. But it was hard to find anything she did cute, when the picture of her burning ten men alive was vividly printed in my brain. Sure. I turned away from her and stared down at the bandits. They were mostly normal humans, but they were led by a Jonin and his two Chunin henchmen, which was why this mission was arranked. Well, I said while dropping from the tree, you know what they say. I started running through hand seals. If you want something dead, drown it in flames. I finished my seventh hand seal and inhaled, and exhaled a literal sea of flames. The bandit camp was drowned in flame. The surroundings weren't spared by the flames and added to the super hot fire. I stared at the destruction I had birthed. It was beautiful and horrifying. The poor bandits hadn't even had time to scream. Fire ninjutsu was only for destroying. It had no other purpose in the Naruto-verse. What jutsu was that? Isami tugged at my sleeve pulling me from my thoughts. Can you teach me? I ignored her and turned my eyes to Guy who had stopped his workout and was looking solemnly into the fire. It's called Great Fire Destruction, which was an apt name. And if you can book Training Ground Zero Henshaw, the Ambu hogged the training grounds where big jutsu were practiced. So, Training Ground Zero was the only one I could use to practice big fire jutsu, as it was 80% lake. Apparently, it became a lake because of the second hokage. But that wasn't a story I knew. Weren't we supposed to capture the leader? Guy pointed at the still burning sea of flames. I stared blankly ahead and stayed silent. I hadn't paid attention to the briefing, and had missed the part about capturing the leader. Ah, I nodded slightly. Slowly, Ipsasami exhaled heavily, while Guy continued staring into the flames. This was going to be one of those missions that I'd look back on with fondness. But right now, I felt incredibly stupid SLAP asterisk house life. I slapped Kiji on the back, causing him to fumble with the flask he was trying to sneakily sip from. It was good until you started fucking bothering me. He grunted while slipping the flash into a pocket. My kid's mom has been giving me hell. But it's been fine otherwise. I nodded languidly. That was how my past father taught. It brought back memories I'd rather not dwell on. Ah, that's how it is. I shrugged. Just don't fight with her. It will make everything easier. Kiji rolled his eyes and nodded. Whatever you say, kid. I shrugged again, not bothered that he ignored my advice. I wouldn't listen to a 12-year-old either. So, I couldn't fault him for dismissing my advice. Still working in the hospital, I changed the subject as neither of us was interested in continuing. Kiji nodded with gritted teeth. Yay. 
can't fucking leave the place. Kiji was a little too unstable to do anything other than hospital work. He couldn't be trusted on missions as he would probably run straight into the enemy, ignoring any orders. Want to go on a mission then? I threw the offer out there. I could make sure Kiji stayed alive and had some fun. It would probably be entertaining, and it would eat up some of my time. As much as I like the sound of that, it's probably not a good idea. Kiji grimaced. Hum. I just hummed and shook my head. I like the idea in my head. But it wouldn't be as fun as I imagined it being anyways. If you say so. I tilted my neck and it released a satisfying crack. Alright, I'll see you around. I sent Kiji a wave and he sent one back. Sire kid. I nodded and left the cage tower. It was good to see Kiji. It had been a while. And I had been wondering what came of him. So, you want to make super orphans and seed the orphanages with them? Minato summed up my plan with a mere 13 words. It wasn't quite how I would have worded it. But he also wasn't wrong. I wanted to seed Kanoha with superhuman orphans. They would be made from a multitude of different genes, making what was essentially artificial bloodlines. Yet, I popped the pee and blinked at the look Minato was giving me. It wasn't unfriendly or negative in any way. It seemed like he was deep in thought and not dismissing my idea right off the bat. Minato drummed his fingers on the desk and stared at me. I shifted uneasily. A word from Minato could have me killed. I was taking a pretty big risk in revealing some cards here, but I was willing to do so. Why? Minato spoke, making me slightly more nervous. I blinked stupidly at him. Can you be more specific? Vague questions like that were meant to make people nervously stammer, and reveal more than they originally planned to. It was best I let him be specific. I didn't want to bumble my way into a verbal trap. Why are you trying to strengthen Kanoha? Minato stared into my eyes, and I shifted uneasily again. Minato was doing a good job at pressuring me. Asking unexpected questions was a good way to throw someone off. I plan on staying here for the rest of my life. Which was true. Originally, I planned to jump ship and join the Akatsuki. But now I had people I liked and people I didn't feel comfortable abandoning. Increasing Kanoha's strength is in my best interest. I paused and tore my eyes away from Minato's. Strengthening the village was in my best interest if I wanted a better future. Having strong allies will ensure the safety of my friends and family, should they fight side by side. I wanted to slowly strengthen Kanoha's gene pool. Little by little every generation would be better than the last. It's not a selfless desire to strengthen Kanoha that drives me, but the desire for safety for my friends and family. Eventually, we bulldoze the other countries in terms of base strength and talent. It would just take a few generations. Think of it like the clan's selective breeding. I tap my chin trying to figure out how to better sell my idea. Over the next few generations, our ninjas will be stronger and better while passing on those traits to the next generations. There was silence in the office, and I started feeling nervous again. Don't wear that hat, it makes you look silly. I killed the silence with a poorly thought out comment. Insulting the Hokage was probably a bad idea. How many children would you make and what would you need? Minato slumped slightly and the serious atmosphere disappeared from the office. I blinked in surprise. My idea was being considered. It was more than I expected. I just need lots of women willing to carry a child. They can keep them or they can put them in the orphanage. I rubbed my face, feeling slightly stressed at the thought of purposefully creating orphans. The more willing women we have the more super children we can make. Hum Minato hummed. I'll look into it. Do you need anything else? I shook my head and Minato waved me out. I made my way out and stood in the hallway for a moment. That was so much more successful than I thought it would be. I had expected my idea to be shot down and to be put under watch. But my plan to make super children was a go. Hopefully soon though. The sooner I started, the sooner I could produce results. My clone had taken over most of my day-to-day -day activities. So while he was out training a Sami, I got to hide in my lair like a goblin and work on whatever caught my interest. My current interest is making a Fuenjutsu lightsaber. The making of the help wasn't the problem. I already had 10 of those commissioned. The problem was containing the lightning without stopping me from hitting things with my lightsaber. I had to contain the lightning and allow things to pass through the containment while containing the lightning. It was lots of fun and had breathed life into my inner weed. Making semi-useless props using Fuenjutsu was now my hobby. Sadly, overriding farm animals was taking up a lot of my time, so I couldn't hide in the basement and make cool things all day. Shiro, I blinked and turned to Minato who had invaded my lab. He was the one who did all the Fuenjutsu on the house, so I had expected him to intrude at some point. No, I'm busy. I shooed him away with my hand and turned back to my lightsaber. This was my free time, and I didn't like Minato enough to spend any of said time with him. Your plants have been harvested, and I've heard the results were extremely good. I stopped fiddling with my lightsaber and glanced back at Minato who was now leaning against the doorframe. Silly hat and all. The flames are cool. I gestured to his new attire. Good choice. Minato nodded amicably and stayed silent. So, what did you want? The crops were out of my hands and a non-issue. They could be replanted and harvested without my input. I'm not needed now that you've got the seeds. Minato stared off into space for a moment before gathering himself. If I let you make super orphans as you called them. Minato paused again and drummed his fingers on his arms. We need to make sure that no one knows of the children and that they aren't treated any differently. The process also has to be sufficiently safe, so neither the child nor mother are put at risk. 
Minato stopped drumming his fingers and stared at me deeply. You wanted them to be marked or have distinct traits, so they can be easily tracked and monitored. I nodded. That was the plan. All genetically modified children would have a distinct eye color, making them easily recognizable. What traits are you changing about the super orphans? I blinked as Minato hadn't continued talking about the distinct traits I wanted them to have. I had thought we'd talk about that. Chakra reserves, chakra density, blood type, bone density, muscle composition, pain tolerance, love of physical activity, personality traits hair and eye color, and possibly intelligence. I quickly ran through the things I wanted to change or add to them without being too specific. I'd also like to make them taller, more attractive, and fertile. I quickly added before Minato spoke. Minato frowned at me and shook his head. I want a complete list of intended changes. I will approve or deny them. I frowned back at him. I had hoped I'd get the go-ahead. But it seems Minato was putting more thought into genetic engineering than the third did. He gave me the go-ahead without even thinking about it. No problem. I shrugged. Is that all? Minato nodded. For now. He nodded at me and disappeared in a yellow flash. Sai I sighed heavily, both in relief and annoyance. With Minato's oversight, I probably wouldn't be allowed to mess around with personality traits. Intelligence and fertility might also get nixed, which was probably for the better I shouldn't be messing around with personality traits. That was bound to be a disaster. At least there's thought put into it I spoke to myself and stared at my palms. Was it right for me to manipulate life? It was a question that I was a little too late to answer. I had already made different modified animals. There was no point considering it now. I was already too far in a lot of genetic manipulation as swapping one gene for another. I made a hand sign and projected a mental DNA model to Omi via Jinjutsu. It's easy to swap a crappy gene for a better gene. It's much harder to make a crappy gene into a better gene. The amount of knowledge and skill you needed to make a gene better was stupid. I would rather just swap a fully working better gene from someone else and not risk making a mistake. DNA in genes are just instructions on how to make your body. Swapping out genes is just swapping out instructions for other better instructions. The problem was, sometimes all the instructions didn't mesh. You can disable genes by mutating the gene or taking the gene away entirely. Aomi raised an eyebrow, and I shrugged. Mutating the gene sometimes makes it inert or useless, and removing the gene removes the instructions from the equation. I ended the Jinjutsu and rubbed my eyes. DNA that has been edited is officially called recombinant DNA, which pretty much meant non-natural DNA. There's also gene cloning. Aomi stared at me dully. Gene cloning is self-explanatory. You need more than one gene, so that if you mess up you still have the gene. I returned Aomi's stare causing her to look away. There is of course gene splicing, DNA indexing, DNA analysis, and DNA override, most of which you see me use or have used yourself. Aomi was already getting into splicing, analysis, and indexing, so I didn't need to explain them. Overriding is just using Fuenjutsu to do most of the work on an already grown person. It does lots of splicing and cloning. Aomi looked bored. It's pretty much just copying edited DNA inserted into the Fuenjutsu and applying it onto a body. I summed it up as best as I could. That's what we'll be using. Write it down and stare at it until you memorize it. Then we'll get into the fun stuff. The fun stuff was learning what genes did what. We'll get into using the techniques after you learn how to make the indexing and analysis seals. Some mediocre seal work and amazing chakra control were all you needed to manipulate life. After you can consistently make the seals will start on splicing and overrides. Aomi smiled and nodded. I shook my head and rubbed my face. I didn't like teaching. Training was boring and slow, but produced steady results. I certainly didn't like training, but it was at least interesting when I heavily limited myself. Since acquiring the Shikotsu Myaku I had been pretty much unchallenged in close combat, and that hadn't changed. But when I limited myself in its use, I found myself falling back on the gentle fist and my lightning ninjutsu which I had neglected in favor of other more interesting techniques. Training with my less used moves allowed me to have other things to fall back onto if my other techniques were ever to be ineffective. Limiting myself also allowed me to train Guy and Asami. Asami and Guy were getting stronger slowly, but steadily. It was taking a while, but their slow steady progress would eventually bring them into the big leagues. Things were progressing nicely, and my only complaint was that my modified farm animals weren't being approved of. But other than that life was grand, I was getting stronger, and time was marching on. My clone was whole, Hale and healthy. It had been a few months since it had eaten the tail beast flesh, and nothing worrying had happened. It made me less hesitant to mirror the changes in my own body. Sand control and magnet release would be a welcome addition to my arsenal, but having that weird tail beast like chakra was asking to be used in Kagai's resurrection. Being used to resurrect a space god was a no, no. It wasn't something I was even remotely okay with risking Kekaki. I turned and stared blankly at Orochimaru, who had startled me with his creepy laughter. I was in my second lab, 
which was not as well protected as the one in the house was. I guess my Fuinjutsu needs some work I trailed off as I noticed Orochimaru was shuffling through my notes with not a care in the world. But I guess they're good enough to keep most people out. He was being extremely rude barging into my lab and manhandling my notes. Ah, I nearly forgot. Orochimaru placed my notes back on the desk and straightened himself. I've heard that you were planning to make some super orphans as you call them. I frowned with narrowed eyes, which caused Orochimaru to smile. It wasn't supposed to be known, meaning there were listing devices in the Hokage's office or my lab. No one's supposed to know about that. Orochimaru's smile widened at my lack of denial. I rolled my eyes at him and his creepy smile. It's not as well hidden as you might think. Orochimaru smiled mysteriously. Not everyone in the Anbu is loyal after all. Sai I sighed heavily. Danzo probably knew about what Minato and I were planning and passed it on to Orochimaru. That's annoying. I rubbed my face. Orochimaru nodded. Quite. He agreed. We stared at each other for a moment. Orochimaru leaned forward and smiled, not breaking eye contact. Perhaps we could come to a mutual agreement. He leaned back, but his smile widened. I want some children made with my DNA. I blinked in surprise. That wasn't what I was expecting. Do you want clones of you? Or do you want a mix of your DNA and someone else's? It was Orochimaru's turn to blink. You can do the latter. I nodded slowly. I just need some of your sperm and an egg from whatever bloodline you want. The child would be a mix between the two different DNAs. I probably didn't need to explain that. Though orphaning your child might not be the best option. Orochimaru nodded slowly, seemingly lost in thought. I had just given him a way to solve his future problems after all. Though that might not be what he was after when he asked for some children made with his DNA. He might have just wanted to be a father. Though I figured that was extremely unlikely. I need some time to think. Orochimaru side eyed me for a moment. You've presented me with some interesting options. He turned and disappeared in a shunshun. I was left staring at the open door, wondering if I was making the right call. Daddy Orochimaru might have a reason to stay in the village. He might love his child and take an interest in its growth. Or it could end as it did in canon, with Orochimaru becoming a murder hobo. At least I could say I tried subtle manipulation wasn't my strong suit. I much preferred bluntness and confrontation. Trying to strengthen the village was hard work mom stood and stared at the plaque on the wall. It was of course the plaque I had made in Wing Country, though with a few extra rules and a literal gold frame. The lockboxes from Shimo had contained a lot of gold, and I couldn't exactly sell off so much gold, so now I had my plaque framed with gold. Though perhaps I should have made a small golden statue of myself, that might have been a better use of the gold so. Mom continued staring at my plaque, though I could tell she was speaking to me. I leaned back and waited for her to continue. I could tell she had something on her mind as she had been distracted lately. I've been dating someone for a while and I want you to meet them. Mom didn't turn to face me. A smile stretched across my face as I realized she was nervous and embarrassed. So much so, that she couldn't even face me. It was adorable. When, I carefully smoothed my face over. Mom kept her eyes glued to the plaque. Sometime within the next month, she said quietly. My smile resurfaced. This was too funny. All right, bring them around the house. I couldn't be in public anymore. I had become somewhat of a celebrity, and got sworn when I sat down for a meal. No restaurants. Mom nodded and left without looking at me. I watched her go with a smile on my face. I was happy she found someone she liked, but also worried. Hopefully, it was also someone I liked. Nothing was worse than your parent getting together with a garbage person. I had seen both of my former parents fall in love with garbage people after their divorce, and I might be seeing it again. Hopefully not though. Hopefully everything would be alright. Minato was a fine guy and a good hokage, but he was currently annoying the shit out of me. He was dragging me out to the Hidden Lock Village or Jume Village. I had to join him and Kakashi on a journey across the Izoku Sea, where we would disembark and travel through Wolf Country, the Land of Marsh, Valley Country, Demon Country, and finally landing in Key Country. It sounded long, annoying, and potentially hazardous. It was everything I hated in a journey. The only plus was after we crossed the sea there were fewer ninja villages in the following countries. Only the land of Sky and Key Country had ninja villages. And then only Jmei Village was known about. The hidden village in Sky wasn't known about or wasn't canon in this world. At least I hadn't seen anything about them in the books I had read. So, I was in for a mostly quiet journey to another continent with barely any ninja presence. It sounded like a shit mission, and it was a shit mission. Jmei Nin were known to be mediators between two negotiating parties. That was the whole reason we were traveling to Ki. The assholes wanted the Hokage to personally make the trip. What was worse was that Minato was making said trip. What a total piss off. You don't bow to the whims others when negotiating. Why are we making a month long trip for some inconsequential negotiations? This was annoying beyond belief. Our trip to Wolf Country was quick. And by quick, I mean near instant as Minato flashed Kakashi, Rin, and I across the sea into Wolf Country. Minato had been here before, but hadn't done more than set a few markers as most of the countries didn't have ninja villages. So, we still had a long trip ahead of us. Alright, why are we going so slow? I eventually asked after an hour of slow, silent walking. I was already bored, and the mission wasn't even half over. 
I would rather be genetically prodding different animals or even making some sort of half user seal. Do you have somewhere you need to be? The clone had enough chakra to last a month, Guy and Aimi could feed and water themselves, so I guess not. No, my no came out more petulant than I had intended. Minato and Rin looked at each other and smiled in amusement. Then why are you in such a rush? Enjoy the peace. Let your mind wander and enjoy nature. That was exactly what I wanted to avoid. I would have spit in his mouth had Minato not been taller than me. Chem PH. Kakashi grunted in what I thought was agreement also putting him on my mental list of people I wanted to spit on or in. I eyed the cheerful trio with undisguised disgust, though I remained silent from then on. Our torturous trip was finally over and done with. We had arrived at Key, and we would be teleporting back so I was spared the return trip. I had most definitely ruined the trip for the others, judging by the looks I was occasionally receiving. But how was I supposed to know that using Jinjutsu to make a bear pull a wagon was frowned upon? And who knew bears were so oily and flammable? It was the bear's fault for sitting so close to the fire. Ah, Minato-sama, you've arrived. I was pulled from my thoughts and stared in horror at the thing that spoke. She was so ugly that she could stop bird shit in midair. She was the ugliest woman I had ever seen and probably would ever see. Rin stepped on my foot bringing me back to the terror that was my current reality. Ah, Minato-sama, you must be tired after such a long journey. Come follow me. We must accommodate you at once. The voice that came from that thing was sweet and feminine. It didn't belong to the horror that I was currently witnessing. Shiro, stop staring. She has cancer and knows she had cancer. She doesn't need you staring at her tumor. Rin whispered and grabbed my sleeve, dragging me along like the child I was. I hadn't even realized there was a tumor. Was I the only one who was horrified by her ugliness? It took me a long time to return to reality after gazing at what could only be called an eldritch abomination. Her existence had shattered my reality and opened my mind to things I didn't understand. She was the literal manifestation of ugly. I could I couldn't take any more and knock myself out, both for a bit of theater and to spare myself further consciousness. The woman was once a fairly strong Kinochi, but after some sort of unnamed accident, she was rendered disfigured and cancer-ridden. I sat down and digested what I saw, while Rin continued to berate me for my behavior, which was only slightly exaggerated. She's not that ugly Shiro. Rin was shouting at me, not that I cared. I was still recovering from what I had seen today. Like it or not, you have to interact with her in the future. I blinked and turned to Minato who had spoken. You're going to heal her as part of our agreement with Jimei. I blinked slowly at that. I hadn't known we were negotiating with Jimei. I had thought they were just going to oversee the negotiations. So, they want me to fix her face. I might as well fix her genes as well and spare the world further horror. Minato shook his head. No, you're just removing some cancer. I blinked slowly. Why hadn't the mission brief contained that? Can't say I like surprises. I opted to fill the silence while making mental plans in my head. I was most definitely going to fix her face and cure her cancer. If I couldn't do that, I'd give her the gift of death. It was a surprise to us as well. Minato said, and Rin nodded. Kakashi shrugged and nodded. I took a deep breath and prepared myself for what I would have to do. Take me to her. I will do it now. I mustered up my courage if I've learned one thing in life. It was to never procrastinate. Minato nodded and started towards the exit of what I realized was our temporary housing. Chakra in the Naruto-verse seemed to push evolution forward. It was why there were so few fat or ugly people. The genes for good looks were heavily favored and eventually got spread around the population. It was why everyone in the Narutovus was average at the very least. Or at least that was my theory. It could be that there was some unspoken law of anime at work that made everyone look average at the very least. The point was that I hadn't seen someone so ugly in my entire existence, and being around the general inhabitants of Kanoha had dulled my tolerance for ugliness. The second look I had at the thing wasn't as mentally shocking as the first one. I could not look at her and not want to bite my tongue off. The third look was even less mentally shocking, and by the fourth look, I was once again able to act like a normal human in its presence. Who would have guessed that the daemon was blind? That of course was sarcasm, unappreciated sarcasm. Rin and Minato stared at me in disapproval, though Kakashi looked vaguely amused. We'll get her in here, and catch me in case I faint. Which was a real worry. She was gross. Minato nodded and disappeared out the door. I'm ready. The woman stepped into the room and I turned my eyes to the floor. I didn't learn her name in fear of forever tainting the name. Once I associated her name with her face, the name would be forever tainted. All right, lay down. And I'd put you to sleep. The woman nodded nervously but did as I said and laid down. Alrighty, when you wake up, you'll be a brand new person. I tapped her on the neck and threw a towel over her face to cover it. I ignored Rin's disapproving look and shooed Kakashi and Minato away with my hand. Alrighty, I ignored Kakashi and Minato not caring if they left. I instead opted to scan my patient whose survival was dependent on me finding a way to fix her. I wasn't kidding when I said I would give her the gift of death. That's a lot of cancer. Perhaps even the sage wanted this woman dead. There was an uncomfortable amount of cancer throughout her body. I wasn't sure it was even possible to fix it. You're a lot like your mother. I turned and raised an eyebrow Rin. I turned back to my patient a moment later and pondered what I wanted to do. Insanity runs in the family. Rin nodded blankly, and I stared solemnly at the ugly woman. She had cancer in everything but her lungs and was nearly impossible to save. 
I had very little hope of saving her. And even if she was saved the cancer was genetic and would eventually resurface. There's not much I can do for her. I frowned. All I can do is try and make her last longer, which was cruel. I didn't want to extend her suffering more than necessary. That's all right, no need. The woman spoke and sat up surprising me and Rin. I tossed the towel away and stood up in a smooth motion. Don't get too excited, get back onto the table. I poked her in the neck, this time successfully knocking her out. All right. I can at least cut down some of the cancer. It'd reduce pain and extend her life a little. I'd also fix up her skin which was the most cancer-ridden part of her body. I'll see what I can do. Even if she was more cancer than human, I could still use those few remaining human cells and override a bandit. Rin nodded and stared expectantly at me. Go get a prisoner sentenced to death or a bandit. Rin blinked but didn't question me and headed for the door. I reached into my kunai pouch and started on gathering stuff for some fuinjutsu. I had quite a bit of work ahead of me. The ugly woman was alive and mostly cancer-free, bearing some cancer in her brain. Her DNA was too scrambled for me to do anything about it, not unless I had some samples from before whatever happened to her happened. So, with the woman healed and her face less offensive than it originally was, I was ready to do something I had wanted to do for a while. I was going to take a quick run around the village by Akigan Active and steal any ninjutsu of value. I was for the first time in a while going to use my esoteric Byakigan skills to seal from a ninja village Jumei village was weak as a whole. The village was dedicated to information gathering and espionage. The village leader was so weak I had thought he was a decoy. Why was he at genin level? He was the weakest village leader I've seen so far. Him I hummed and delved through the books and scrolls in the village leader's office. There wasn't much, most of it was blackmail, and a few unique kinjutsu used to strengthen the mind. I quickly sorted through the information and found nothing useful. The kinjutsu had the side effect of losing one's emotions, but granted one perfect recall and detailed memory. I had my version of that, so it wasn't really necessary. I memorized it, but put it out of my mind. I instead opted to focus on what the village leader was writing. I mind reading, by subtly weaving signs with their eye, the user can delve into the mind of their target through eye contact without them noticing. This can also be used on a target that is currently reading the user's mind. The user is even able to perform this on themselves to restore or remove information in their own mind. I stopped walking and stared in shock at what I had just read. What in the ever-loving fuck? The leader continued writing, and my shock slowly disappeared. What the fuck this was a powerful technique. It had a very small range, was extremely slow to use, and the user was left vulnerable when reading minds. But it was still everything I could ever ask for in a mind reading technique. I could also hide my memories. That was one of my main weaknesses. Should a Yamanaka ever get in my head, I would be fucked using Fuinjutsu to protect memories was impossible to my disappointment. You could use it to destroy or seal memories, but those memories would be inaccessible to you. If you didn't know you sealed your memories, how would you get those memories back? Using one of the most complicated ninja arts to mess with the body's most complicated organ usually wasn't good for one's health. Shiro, why are leering like that? Rin startled me causing me to flinch. I blinked and memorized the contents of the scroll before speaking. I was just eyeing their village and looking for threats. I blinked my eyes and dismissed my Baikigan. The village as a whole is looking good so far. I dismissed the Jinjutsu around my eyes. Rin raised a disbelieving eyebrow at me, and I raised an eyebrow back. She shook her head and turned her focus to our escorts who were watching from a distance. Knowing that this village had a technique like this made me raise my guard. Being here was a huge risk both to Kanova and myself. Now the question was, do I tell others about this technique or do I keep this to myself and be careful? I was leaning towards the latter I quickly went over my memories. I don't think anyone had been reading my memories, but I wasn't wholly sure. It was likely that these people had been through Minato's memories though he had been meeting with the village leader, as had Rin and Kakashi. Let's get back to the hotel. Rin looked confused but nodded. Okay, we turned and headed back towards the hotel. Being out like this was extremely risky. The eye mind reading technique was used by the guide who brought her food. Rin had her mind read, and I got to watch the technique in action. The guide's eyes flickered, and a tendril of yin chakra slowly wormed its way out of her eyes and into Rin's. The whole process only lasted a few seconds. When the tendril retracted it came with a few chunks of Rin's spiritual energy. Hum, I hummed. The technique allowed one to look into spiritual energy and view memories from it. What I was seeing now wasn't in the scroll. It looked like the guide was taking her spiritual energy, so he could look through it at a later time. Our food was presented to us and the guide bowed before leaving. It's weird that the guides are so weak. Rin hummed and turned her eyes to me. I just shrugged and leaned back, pulling a ration bar from my pack. I wasn't interested in eating the food. I doubted they'd poison us. But there might be some sort of substance in the food that made our minds easy to read. Maybe I was being paranoid. But it was better to be paranoid than to have my mind read. Here's your food, sir. I nodded with a smile but kept my eyes on the ground. I took the food and quickly closed the door, accidentally meeting the guide's eyes as the door closed. Fuck. Apparently, that was enough for the guide to establish a connection to my mind. I could feel the chakra connecting us and grabbed it in panic. We fought over the chakra for a moment, my will winning over his. His yin chakra was slowly pulled from him and into me. 
Little by little his memories became mine, little by little his experiences became my own. The experiences were faint, the memories far away. It felt like I had watched them, but not like I lived them. I blinked and woke up on the floor covered in vomit and confused. Rin kneeled over me, hands on my chest, probably using the diagnostic jutsu. I stared at her for a moment before blinking and falling unconscious. Every time I woke, I would blink and wake up somewhere else. It was disorientating. It felt like I was teleporting every few seconds. I kept waking in different places until I eventually ended up in Kanoha. My mom's chakra lulled me into a more permanent sleep. It turned out that taking all of one's spiritual energy could damage someone's brain. The guide had tried to be sneaky and have a peek into my mind. It was working until I panicked. I had used the technique in a half as to attempt at combating him. It had worked but not in the way I had expected. I had ripped his yin chakra from him, mentally crippling him and giving me some brain damage. On the plus side, I had gotten some practice looking through his spiritual energy. Though my clone had to eject that spiritual energy as it was mixing with my own, and giving me the memories of the guide causing a very noticeable growth and change in chakra. All in all, it was a boon. Getting some memories of the guide using the mind eye reading technique was a huge gain. I wouldn't be bumbling around and hurting myself in the process of learning it. Did I finish healing that ugly woman? I honestly couldn't remember. And did whatever negotiations we were doing happen? Rim bolted upright, and Kakashi who I had directed my question, lazily shook his head. Attempting to kill Kanoha's butcher with Jinjutsu was not good for negotiations, Kakashi said dryly. I put my palm out and stopped Rin from hugging me. Sorry, I just woke up and can't deal with human contact yet. Rin nodded, though she looked saddened. I turned to Kakashi. Did I accidentally start a war? My voice came out more excited than I intended. Kakashi shook his head and remained quiet. The room sunk into silence, so I reached over and wrapped an arm around Rin. Rin returned my one-armed hug with two arms, breaking the unspoken rule of one-armed hugs and bringing me more human contact than I was ready for. So, how did things turn out? Rin detached from me with tears in her eyes. She blinked them away and rubbed at her eyes for a moment. There was a large fight, Kakashi set the inn on fire, and Minato knocked a good part of the village's ninjas unconscious. Rin blinked a few times. Your nose, eyes, and ears bled. Everyone thought you were dying. I blinked. It was unexpectedly tame. I expected Minato to cut his way through the village. Ah, I just nodded. That still sounded pretty bad well. Who wants to eat? I stood up ignoring the breeze I was feeling. Hospital clothing was the worst. People were going to get a show. I was too hungry to care about that though. Alright, it's time for Raymond. Rin went to speak, but I placed a finger over her lips shushing her. And how long was I out? Rin pushed my finger away and spoke. Nearly a month. I blinked. Your clone was the one to heal you. Oh. That definitely wasn't good. I made a hand seal and sent a clone off to feed my more permanent clone or visit Minato if the clone didn't need chakra. If it took a month for my clone to heal me. I was definitely in bad shape. Well, it's time for food. Rin went to speak, and I once again shushed her with a finger. I blinked at her and shunshined away. The doctors probably wanted to see me, but I was too hungry to care. One meal later and the clone and I were exchanging memories. Though not in the traditional way. This time we were using the mind eye reading technique. The clone had been giving me its memories when I was in the hospital, which was why I had known what happened to me when I first woke. Apparently, the clone had used my memories to avoid conflict with Jimei, which I guess was a good thing. Fighting mind reading ninjas probably wasn't a good idea, even if their village was extremely weak. We finished the exchange, and the clone disappeared in a shunshin. I sat down and started on some fuinjutsu. Why did you run straight to your lab and not visit me? Mom stood at the bottom of the stairs, hands on hips, and a frown on her face. I pushed the fuinjutsu I had been making away, as I had messed it up. I need to make sure my brain is working alright, give me a few minutes. Mom's frown faded, and she nodded. I pulled out another scroll and unfolded it. My clone had already checked my body, and I was fine, but I wanted to be sure. Being sure involved some fuinjutsu and lots of tests. Sorry. But I need to make sure I won't die anytime soon, be patient with me. Mom's frown completely faded, and her face returned to her usual neutral look. Tell me what happened first. I blinked slowly at her. I just wanted to make sure I wouldn't die, was that too much to ask? Someone used a very powerful Jinjutsu on me and put me into a coma. Or at least that was the story concocted by Jimei's weak leader, and corroborated by my clone. They also put themselves in a coma in the process. Mom nodded and remained silent from then on. I turned back to my scroll. I had a body to scan, and DNA to look at. One could never be too careful. The mind eye reading technique was completely useless in combat. But out of combat, it was amazing. I was essentially a Yamanaka now. Currently, I wasn't exactly sneaky, but with time and practice, I would be. Soon I'd be reading minds and stealing techniques. It was only a matter of time. But until then I was reduced to reading the mind of my mom's girlfriend, who she had been dating for two years. The woman was tiny, standing at about 5'3". Her hair and eyes were black, 
and she had a mane of itchy hair like spiky hair. She was wearing the standard cannon fodder Jonan attire, and was looking quite itchy her like. She wasn't an itchy her though, the name Kumeho Asano made that clear. My mother and her had bonded over their mutually dead parents, and shared Jonan's status. They had been happily dating for the past two years, and mom finally felt comfortable introducing me to her. She was a lovely and kind woman, if not blunt enough for my taste. I didn't have any problems with her as her love for my mom was genuine, and she hadn't been doing anything suspicious. So, mom and Asano looked at me expectantly. I stared back at them, not sure what to say. I hadn't known mom was into women, and would have appreciated a heads up. It was better than her being into young men like I thought she was. Turns out the tiny footprints on the windowsill weren't as sinister as I thought they were. A little heads up would have been nice. I was expecting a stepfather. Mom winced at that, and Asano snickered. I blinked in shock. Someone had laughed at something I said. Had I suddenly become funny? Or was she laughing to spare me an awkward silence? Sorry, I thought you figured it out. I blinked slowly at Mom. She did leave her clothes and stuff around the house. I'm pretty sure she overestimated my observational skills or underestimated my ability to ignore anything that wasn't important to my general life. I didn't I trailed off and decided to redirect the conversation. But I approved quite the catch. I winked at mom and gave her a cheesy thumbs up. I would have high-fived her, but my high-five would probably be ignored. Thanks. Mom blushed and Asano smoked looking amused. I nodded and stared down at the food that I hadn't touched. The restaurant was Akimichi owned, so they might be offended if I didn't at least take a bite. Alright, let's eat. We'll chat later. Mom and Asano nodded, before digging into their own food. I studied them for a moment before digging into my own. So far, I have approved. I had awful step-parents in my last life, and hadn't had much hope for this one. But Asano seemed fine both mentally and in person. I blinked as I realized I had just mind-raped someone. I was doing what I had hated. I scorned the Yamanaka for their jutsu, and now I was doing something similar myself. My apparent hypocrisy hit me. I had just mentally violated someone, my mother's girlfriend no less. I took a deep breath and returned to my meal. I wasn't exactly a shining beacon of morality but I would at least like to have some morals. I probably shouldn't be using my new technique all that often, or at least not on people I know or will know well. The clone had handled most of the drama before I had woken up, but what he hadn't handled was the Shiro fanatics that wanted to go to war with Jmei. I appreciated the support, but was pretty weirded out by my supporters. They were an odd bunch, most of them under 16, and most of them male. I was the ninja equivalent of a teen idol, and it was odd, especially so because most of my followers were male. What brings you here, sensei? I smiled as I had sensed Orochimaru before he revealed himself. I had tried to find him when I first woke, but he had been hiding somewhere. He was probably too busy experimenting on children in his hidden lab. I've come to see if you've made any progress on your super orphans. He smirked when I stared blankly at him. I had just woken up not long ago, and Orochimaru probably knew that. He was only asking to be weird. No, Minato is stalling. I scratched my nose with my thumb. He doesn't feel it's right to condemn children to orphanhood before they've even been born. It shouldn't have been a problem. The solution was to find people who wanted kids and give them super not orphans. Shame. Orochimaru frowned and I joined him in frowning. Why did Kanoha make it hard to strengthen Kanoha? It was either paperwork or bleeding hearts that slow things down. Have you figured out what you want done? I was itching to look at Orochimaru's DNA. I couldn't wait to see what he'd done to himself. It had a lot to do with animal DNA, as that was one of his main focuses in genetics. There was no way he wasn't half snake. I wanted to know how his DNA stuck together without unraveling. Yes, I have. Orochimaru smiled but didn't continue. I stared at him with unconcealed annoyance. I wanted that DNA. But it seems I wouldn't be getting it until it was time to make baby Orochimaru. Orochimaru continued smiling, and I continued staring at him. Alright, do you need anything? Orochimaru shook his head, not losing his smile. Just checking on my favorite student. Orochimaru's smile faded, and he nodded seriously at me before shining away. I stared at the space he occupied wondering if he really came to check on me. It was possible but unlikely. I shook my head and drifted off into thought. I had my modified farm animals, Funjutsu, and Super Orphans to work on. I had the stuff to do for the foreseeable future. That was all I wanted in life nowadays. As long as I was busy, I was happy shit. I should have tried to read his mind he might have measures in place though. I had finally gotten someone to use my modified animals. It took much longer than I wanted it to, and my modified pigs were banned, but things were finally on the move. I only wish it hadn't taken so long. The year was almost over, and I needed to start preparing for the Nine Tails attack. It had slipped my mind until I saw a very pregnant Makoto in the market one morning. It made me realize that I was completely forgetting the attack. According to my notes, Naruto should be conceived within the next few months and born in October, meaning I had a little more than 10 months until things kicked off. If they kicked off Rin was very much alive and I hadn't heard anything about Kiri in a long while. It likely that Abito wasn't undergoing his transformation into Tobito. I figured Madara was crafty enough to turn Abito even if Rin wasn't dead. But nothing was currently happening. So, I settled in for more waiting and some planning. Once the Nine Tails attack was out of the way, I'd get started on my travel to the moon. 
I just needed to decode Minato's flying thunder god and adjust it to myself. Then it was just a matter of getting something to the moon. Things would start coming together within the next few years. I was close to acquiring the tents again, and could hardly wait. Why is there such a variety between the genes each child is getting? Wouldn't it be better if they all get the best possible genes? Minato slid the stack of paper across his desk into me. I grabbed it and tucked it under my arm. We are trying to create people who are strong and individual, not strong clones that are all the same. I held in the sigh that wanted to escape. Different people will make different skills, and will add variety to Kanoha's arsenal. It would have been better if I could enhance some clan kids. The Hayuga finally pushing out some notable shinobi would be nice. Or even the Inuzuka, they could use some good genes. I'm trying to create diversity by giving them each different strengths. It's better to have different and unpredictable ninja than it is to have 100 of the same. Or at least that was my thought. 100 breakage level ninja would be nice. But it was nearly an impossibility anyway. Most wouldn't have the will to train enough to get past cage level even if they had everything the Rakage had. How many aspiring mothers do we have anyway? The more we had the more ninja Minato would get. Minato's face momentarily shifted into a frown, dimming my hopes. 20. I stared blankly at him. I was unsurprised but disappointed. It wasn't enough, especially if they weren't ninja families. Are they at least from ninja families? If they were civilians, they wouldn't get the necessary training to become good. I might as well give up if that's the case. Yes, I reached out to ninja first. He nodded and I exhaled in relief. At least then they'd have a head start and expectations on what they were getting into. Hopefully, that would keep them in the ninja program. That's good but not enough. Bluntness was always the best approach. Ask ninja who are infertile if they want to raise a kid. Or even order some ninja to have children. Minato blinked at me. Keep finding people. We need 50 ninja raised kids. 50 ninjas of cage caliber was a dream come true for any village. But I didn't think Minato would be able to find that many. Nor did I think all of them would live to become cage level. At best we would have 10 or so by the time this batch of kids grew up. The idea is to have them at least spread their genes. Even if they aren't strong, their kids will have the chance to be. I wanted to slip some clan DNA in there too. A few Uchiha or Hayuga not born in the clan would benefit the village. Especially if their eyes didn't match the typical Hayuga or Uchiha coloring. Any luck on acquiring bloodlines from the other villagers? Minato nodded causing my spirits to lift. I wanted some more bloodlines but was too lazy to chase them down. After all, why couldn't I make Minato get them for me? Mud release and explosion release was all we were able to acquire. I blinked feeling underwhelmed. I was hoping for something like swift release. Or something interesting like steel release. It was a letdown. I had expected more. Neither of those are worth using. Though explosion release had its charm. Said charm being possible self-detonation. It might just be better if I gave everyone two or more affinities. It was easy to grant someone a bloodline before birth. It was after their childhood where there were problems. I'll see what I can come up with though. I felt like I was wasting an opportunity by not making some children with bloodlines. It seems I need to do some more work. Minato hunched over his desk and steepled his fingers together. I shook my head. I was okay with other people knowing about what we were doing. Minato wanted to keep it a secret. Orochimaru already knows what we're doing. So it's not all that hidden. Minato's eyes widened slightly before quickly returning to normal. Get someone else to do some of the work. It's not a secret anyway. I trailed off as I realized how much work it would be to create 20 super children. It would eat up a good portion of my time unless I let a bunch of clones do the work for me. Which sound good in my head but was usually bad in practice. Clones weren't always sane, or well intentioned. We can talk more about it later when we have more willing mothers. Minato rested his head on a palm, looking tired. I'll contact you soon. Minato lazily shooed me away with his palm, not at all acting like the cage he was. I bowed and retreated from the room with thoughts of super children on my mind. I wanted Kanoha to be better off than it was in canon, though it might already be. Time would tell if what I was doing was working. I had a lot of hope that it would. As much as I liked Aomi I still didn't trust her. She was one of the first to get her mind read after I was sufficiently confident in using the technique. She wasn't a trader, just an ass kisser. By answering the Hokages she hoped to gain his favor or at least make a good impression. It was annoying, but not traitorous. She wasn't working against me, nor was she trying to hinder any of my progress. I couldn't murder her for wanting to curry favor. I still liked her too much to distance myself. So, things would continue as they were. Not bad. I lied, shamelessly. Aomi had butchered the DNA she was working on, rendering it unusable. Aomi had gotten excited or nervous, and ruined a lot of the DNA she was working on. She was slowly getting better, just not fast enough for my preferences. I panicked and mushed at Aomi looked down at her feet. I shrugged not seeing the problem. The DNA wasn't valuable, nor was I expecting her to do it perfectly. You had the gene in the right place. You just panicked when you were linking it back together. Emotions affected chakra. Aumi likely got excited or panicked. It's just repetition from now on. Soon you'll be good enough to work on your own projects. I was generous when it came to teaching Aomi. She probably got more access to information than I did when learning under Orochimaru. 
You still need to spend a lot more time on Fuinjutsu though. Aomi really wanted to get into DNA manipulation. She felt she was missing her chance to improve herself. She was right. The longer she took the less she would gain from messing with her DNA. The body wasn't as malleable after a certain age. Fuinjutsu is almost half of what's required to edit DNA. I can't be making the seals for you. You need to learn to do them yourself. Aomi nodded seriously. I aw an asterisk I threw my head back and yawned loudly, not bothering to cover my mouth. I think I'm done for the day. I stepped away from the mess of seals that occupied the table. Feel free to continue, there's plenty of seals in the cupboards. Aomi nodded and stifled a yawn of her own. I smiled in amusement and made my way to the stairs. On second thought, come eat. I turned and waved Aomi over. We can get some takeout. Aomi had been down here with me for the last eight or so hours. She could use something to eat. Sure. Aomi nodded and jogged to join me at the stairs. I stopped myself from yawning and made my way up the stairs with Aomi in tow. I had some more fuinjutsu practice with Kishina this evening, though I wasn't feeling up to it at the moment. My life into a comfortable routine and I had many friends. It was more than I expected from my post-war life. Nobody was trying to bother me nor was anyone plotting against me. Life was ideal as far as I was concerned. Wouldn't it be easier to make existing children genetically stronger? Why go through the effort when you can already modify existing and known children? Minato threw the idea out, breaking the silence that had befallen the office. I guess we don't even need to make that many new children. I eventually decided. We can do lots of testing to see if their mentality is stable, and they're fit for duty before we give them the ability to reach cage level. Making talented but genetically weak children stronger was probably the best way to do it. It was a better idea than what I had come up with. I guess this is why scientists gather and discuss their plans. I said to buy myself some time to think. What's obvious to one might not be obvious to another. I'd have to a little less rough with older children, but that was fine. A bunch of little gene edits was faster anyways. We could also sponsor talented children from civilian families and have them receive group training. It would make their strength explainable. I nodded, not paying attention. It sounded more like a Minato problem and wasn't something I would have any say on. Think about genetically modifying the Inuzuka's dogs, the Inuzuka could use a leg up. Minato nodded, but it looked non-committal. Minato wanted me to stay away from modifying the clan's bloodlines. I felt the same way but for different reasons. I didn't want to make anyone stronger than myself. It wasn't something I worried about before, but now it was on my mind. After all, who wanted to be killed by their own creations? Alright, let's do some of both. We make some super children and enhance those who are talented, but lack potential. Minato nodded and I bowed before leaving. This was becoming more work than I wanted, but at least Kanoha would be stronger when it was done. It would just take a few years to bear fruit so, this is the little guy eh? I bounce Minikiji on my knee, while noting the similarities between the two. He got Kiji's looks and facial structure, but he had his mother's blonde hair. Are you sure you want him enhanced? I asked for what was probably the tenth time. Kiji nodded easily and without much emotion. Either he gets strong and lives a long life or he dies a young prodigy. Kiji paused and scratched his beard. I want my child to be great, not another name carved into the monuments. I nodded, half paying attrition. I was more focused on the baby who was currently trying to stick my finger into his mouth. Kids who are modified will be pretty much forced into ninja hood. By doing this you are taking away the choice from your child. Kiji rolled his eyes not looking bothered. If he decided to be a baker, I'd beat the love of pastries out of him anyways. Kiji smirked. He can become whatever he wants when he's stronger than me anyway. I nodded and let some plans roll around in my mind for a moment. Kiji named his son Ajiro, in some delusional hope that the name would grant him some power. Sharp newborn son was a funny name when translated literally. Sharp was probably exactly what Kiji wanted his child to be. I'll have your child be the last in line, I'll have enough experience to not mess up by then. Not that there would be any messing up. I was pretty good at doing things right on the first try. Thanks, brat. Kiji didn't know what to do and settled for a thankful nod. I nodded back and handed him the baby. Alright, I'll keep in touch. I gave him a cheery wave and sunshine away, not wanting to say goodbye. There was a noticeable lack of combat, death, blood, and gore in my life lately. It filled me with a vague dissatisfaction and longing for the good old days where I got into heart-pounding fights near daily. The fights nowadays didn't make my heart pound like they used to. Not that most of the engagements could be called fights. They usually turned into a chase of some kind, when my enemies fled. So, she's moving in then. Mom had been trying to broach the topic for the last week or so. I had been busy training and getting ready to create my super children, and hadn't been around. So, she decided to corner me in my lab, while I enjoyed my lunch and daydreamed about the good old days. Yes, but only if you're comfortable with it. She trailed off and looked away as my eyes narrowed on her. Not because I was angry or anything. I was just weirded out that I had a choice in the matter. It was frankly more courtesy than I expected to get from someone. Yes, that's fine. I just need to get used to being dressed in the house. Walking around the house wearing nothing but boxes might be a thing of the past. Mom snickered instead of becoming lost in thought for a moment. You'll need to take clothes to and from the shower too. No more running to your room naked. I didn't blush. 
But it was a near thing. I will. I promised. Both for my dignity and in the hopes that I wouldn't scare Asano off with my frequent nakedness. I'll stay as dressed as I can. I wouldn't want to chase away mom my somewhat likable future stepmother. How are we on groceries? I opted to change the topic to something less embarrassing. Mom blinked with a knowing look. Good, we just need some eggs if you are out and feel bored. I nodded easily and we drifted into a comfortable silence. I went back to eating. And Mon hovered around the lab looking at my projects with minor interest. Kinoha's clans mainly taught their hydens by older members of their clans through speech or oral means. The hydens were never writing down, preventing them from being stolen, but also causing the clans to lose some of their hydens during times of great strife. Most hydens were rooted in yin or yang release, and thus were hard to learn without the required affinity or body type. The Akimichi, Nara, and Yamanaka were prime examples. They didn't have bloodlines, but bodies that were adapted over generations, that enables them to use their hydens to great effect. But if someone else had the required chakra type, then learning the hyden was easy. Hence why the clans never wrote down their hydens. I was trying to track down and corner Chimzar, so I could read his mind and find out about the Akimichi clan's juicy knowledge on Yang release. I hadn't had luck in the past week, but I'd keep trying. I wanted the knowledge very badly. Found it. The clone pushed his notebook into my face, showing me what work he had been doing with the Hyuga DNA. He was looking for the reason that the Hyuga were limited in terms of Jutsu. It turned out to be genetics, which was exactly what I expected. It's a mix of our ancestors not using ninjutsu and some weird mutation in our chakra density. I nodded in understanding. The Hyuga gained the ability to block chakra points, but lost the ability to use ninjutsu. The trait bred true through the generations, and eventually, the Hyuga could no longer use ninjutsu as effectively as their fellow ninja, even if they didn't have said gene. It's a mix of genes and issues of ninjutsu. The more I used ninjutsu, the more range I seemed to have. So maybe I was awakening dormant genes through my ninjutsu use. It's lucky that had a very mild version of the gene, which was a mutation from mom's family. Lucky me, I guess. So, I probably don't have to do anything. Just keep using ninjutsu, then. My clone nodded in the affirmative and snapped the notebook shut. He waved the closed notebook in my face. Or you can just get through some DNA together and increase your range artificially. I pushed the notebook out of my face and scowled at the clone. Why did he always want to resort to DNA manipulation? Stop trying to push unneeded overrides on me. I made my way to the stairs to get away the clone. I shook my head and bounded up the stairs in a few steps. Creepy clone always wanted to mess with my DNA. Children of a similar age to myself were funneled into my lab little by little over the week. I averaged about three children per day. Mostly because I was reading their minds before I gave them the potential to reach cage level. I only caught one spy who was under Danzo's employ. So things were looking fine. I notified Minato. And it was not my problem any longer. Minato and Danzo would wonder how I figured it out. But I wouldn't talk. I was allowed to have some secrets. With 21 kids done... I refused to do any more. A week straight of overrides ate into my stored chakra and was exhausting. So now I had a month or so off to refill my seal and bumble around. Rin hadn't been turned into a jinjuriki, but neither had Abito appeared. Madara might have been able to turn Abito, though not in the same way he had in canon. With baby Naruto baking in Kishina's oven, things were coming to a head. Soon Naruto would be born, and things would kick off. I had a few different plans for different situations that may occur. But it wasn't enough. I wanted to be sure of my chances of survival and possibly the survival of Kishina. I'd need to spend a lot of time on Fuenjutsu this year, and prepare for the eventual attack on Konoha in whatever form it took. Preparation would be key, unless I decide to let everyone die. I frowned at the thought, not finding it too appealing. Not appealing, but it is the easiest solution. All I can do is try I wish I didn't get attached. My life would be much easier if I didn't care about Kishina, and by extension Minato. More so Kishina than Minato. But still, I wanted Kishina alive at the least. I was the protagonist in my story. But everyone else also has a story where they are the protagonist. Aomi looked at me with a raised eyebrow and a frown. I smiled at her and winked, non-verbally telling her not to mind my mental rambling. Gross inadequacy of opportunities is the norm in life and biology. Aomi blinked and I rolled my eyes. Some people are born smart, charming, and strong. I teasingly gestured to myself, while most aren't. I picked up a folder containing the before and after reports of the few kids that had been genetically modified and handed it to Aomi. I've chosen those who were smart and given them the ability to be charming and strong. I was making life fair for a select group of children. They would have everything equal opportunities. It would depend on them how far they went through. They will be Kanova's next generation. They will have everything they need to be great. Aomi's eyes met mine. But it will ultimately depend on them and their own will to succeed. Giving every promising child the potential to reach low cage level might bite me in the ass. You can't eliminate poverty by giving people money. And giving people the optimal genetics would probably be the same in principle. Do you understand what I'm trying to do or I have I just rambled? I turned to Amy with tired eyes. No matter what I did it would never be enough. It wasn't just how I felt, it was also objectively true. It doesn't matter how smart you are, if you're born weak and ugly, the odds are stacked against you. 
I nodded approvingly already seeing where this was heading. You're trying to elevate the smart and move them upwards in the hierarchy. I nodded but I kept my face neutral. It wasn't exactly what I was after. It was more of a happy side effect. I want to elevate the talented, smart and stable above all. Hopefully, those traits would carry on into the future. But I doubted it. It was far more likely that I was creating my undoing. Fuck. I rubbed my forehead, and Aomi raised an eyebrow at me. Anyway, I'm trying to make a better Kanoha. Whether it works or not is up to chance. I covered my eyes with my hand, and enjoyed the brief darkness and absence of light. There's a reason I'm trying to explain this to you. I uncovered my eyes and met Aomi's. I want you to continue what I'm doing should I die, or be ousted from Kanoha. I said mentally to myself. Aomi's eyes widened and she nodded seriously. Anyways, let's go get some Raymond. I needed to get out of the basement and out of my own head. I was thinking myself into a depression. Let's go. Aomi nodded and placed a folder on the table. We both made our way up the stairs and out of the house. After becoming able to read the thoughts of everyone around me, I couldn't help but take a peek now and then. Thus I lost the will to go outside. I was turning into a recluse because I lost what little faith I had in my fellow human beings. It was a sad state of affairs. I was falling into a minor depression despite my best efforts to stay busy and happy. Power was easy to acquire, but happiness was hard to maintain. What do I need to cross off my mental list? I turned to my clone, one of my few companions as of late. My clone rolled his eyes at me. Ian a mutation and few injutsu are the most pressing. The clone gestured to his head. Though all you have to do is have a dive into Kishina's or Minato's mind to finish up with Fuenjutsu. I nodded absently at the clone's words. I should probably continue developing my understanding of Fuenjutsu before I go and try to use someone else's. My clone shrugged and turned away from me. I stared at it for a moment while trying to think of something to do. Isami and Guy were out with Rin, and Mom was busy training with Asano. My lightsaber was done, if not particularly pleasant to look at. My body was whole and healthy, most of my work on the bloodlines I possessed was done, bearing the Achiha and Yuzumaki whose bloodlines were all kinds of mysterious. Do I mess around with ninjutsu or do I take a mission? I threw the question out and into the room, but received no response from the clone. Or maybe I can go bother the Hyuga. Baby Niji was supposed to burst out of his mother sometime soon. I could bother the Hyuga for a while. Why don't you go bother Kakashi? He just joined the Ambu last I heard. I raised an eyebrow at the unexpected information. Kakashi wasn't completely friendless and alone, so why did he join the Ambu? That doesn't sound interesting. Kakashi would just ignore me. Nothing sounds interesting. I trailed off and stared at the ceiling. I was probably going to need to fend off another wave of boredom within the next little while. I guess I'll take a mission. I scratched my nose. A mission by myself. I rose from my seat and headed towards the stairs in search of a mission to keep the boredom at bay. Hopefully, I'd have something to do by the time I returned. I made a consorted effort to evade everyone as I made my way through the Hokage Tower. I was a well-known face in Kanoha now, and people wanted to spend time with me and suck the joy out of my life. I could be nice and chat with them, but that usually went nowhere and drained me of what little will to live that I could muster on any particular day. The much safer and mentally healthy option was to avoid everyone and talk to no one. Being a recluse was a surefire way to become feared or despised, but I honestly couldn't bring myself to care. With a bit of a flourish, I made my way into Minato's office, ignoring the three genin that were waiting by the door. What brings you here? Minato had a warm smile on his face. I ignored the urge to smack it off him and got to the point. I'm bored. Do you have an interesting mission? Short and straight to the point, just how I like things. Minato tilted his head and drifted into thought while the genin shifted uneasily in the hallway. How far do you feel like traveling? I shrugged, not feeling particularly picky. Minato nodded and drifted into thought again. I ignored the whispers of the genin occupying the hallway and focused on Minato who looked pretty stumped. I'm afraid that there's nothing you would enjoy at the moment. He half smiled at me. The Fuenjutsu in the shelters does need to be maintained. Hum. I hummed. It sounded like a Kishina job, not a job for someone who wanted to stab things with his spine. Which ones? And where? Minato smiled widely and grabbed a blank paper from his drawer. Here, I'll write it down. He motioned me to come closer. Memorize it and burn it. I nodded seriously and watched as he quickly noted down the locations of the shelters, and what needed to be done with them. Do I have to be sneaky about Theses ones? I tacked two shelters that were located particularly close to the clans, and one that was close to the school. Minato nodded. Those protect the future of Kanoha. I ignored Minato and quickly memorized the paper, before scrunching it into a ball and pocketing it, so I could burn it later. The shelters by the clans and the school, were the most secret ones as they held Kanoha's future. So, I had to keep shenanigans to a minimum, and make sure no one knew about them. I'll get it done. Though I wasn't sure I was even getting paid for this. It didn't matter too much, but money was always nice. Good. Minato nodded and waved me out. I bowed and headed straight for the door, eyeing a somewhat familiar genin as I passed. We met eyes, and I lightly skimmed his thoughts before turning away and making my way out of the tower. Ibiki Marinohem, 
I hummed to myself as I left, feeling weird about seeing canon characters. Each sighting was a reminder that my time was limited and always decreasing. Time always felt both slow and fast, it was agonizing. I shook my head dispelling my thoughts as I left the tower completely. I had stuff to do today the genes that most of the enhanced kids got, wouldn't get them past low cage level. The abnormally dense chakra and slight healing factor made up for their limited chakra. Improved senses and the actual ability to sense chakra would also put them above the rest. Most of their looks would stay, the only change being the blue eyes they all sported. The kids were giving a huge head start in ninja hood, and most of them would probably die because of it. It was a sad truth, sometimes no matter how talented one was death was inescapable. Even I wouldn't be able to escape death I shook my head trying to shake the thought from my mind. Negative thinking never got me anywhere anyways. Can we just take everything down? One of my shadow clones spoke, pulling me from my thoughts. I scratched my nose with the back of my thumb, giving myself time to think. That's not what Minato wants. But it might be better if we just tear everything down. I stared at the many clones wandering throughout the shelter. This mess should probably just be redone. The Fuinjutsu in the shelters were patched many times by many different people, each with a different understanding and proficiency in Fuinjutsu. It made the entire structure a patchwork of different Fuinjutsu systems and barriers. Many overlapped making them useless and inefficient. Some even cancelled each other out, weakening the entire structure. Many people added to the patchwork monstrosity over the years, and not all additions were good. It made the whole thing header change using to look at, let alone figure out. Strip everything down and redo the seals. The clone nodded. Make sure everything is organized and easy to understand. The clone rolled its eyes and nodded going off to do its tasks. Hopefully, it would be easier for future Fuinjutsu users to fix these. Getting rid of the mess that it was would hopefully help our righty. I nearly sighed but stopped myself. There wasn't anything to sigh about, just work to do. I nodded to myself and activated my Byakugan, looking for something to start on. What's got you so angry? I pushed some broken glass away with my foot while making my way over to the desk where Rochimaru was leaning over. A trash lab was pretty unusual for a Rochimaru. The last time this happened was when Minato became the Hokage over him. One of my acquaintances fled the village, becoming a missing nin. His words were neutral, dull and his face expressionless. But I could tell he cared from the slight tightening of his jaw. Though it would be more accurate to say that he was forced to flee the village. Haruko. I tossed the name out there as it was the only other person I'd seen Orochimaru with bearing Jiraiya. Orochimaru scowled, proving my guess right. Indeed. His scowl was still prominent. He was pushed out of the village due to Hiruzen's fear of the clan's response, should they discover what he was working on. I raised an eyebrow. Bloodline theft then. I said, guessing what the creepy guy was after. Orochimaru nodded immediately. He was looking for ways to incorporate multiple bloodlines into himself without using transplants. I nodded. Ah. He was getting into DNA stuff. The Hokage couldn't allow someone to blatantly research bloodline theft in a village of bloodline users. I understood why he was giving him the boot, but also worried. It was likely I would receive the boot should the clans pressure the third. Why does the third have the power to give missions still? If that was even what happened, the Hokage should be retired and minding his own business. This should be Minato's problem. The third shouldn't be involved. He doesn't. The mission wasn't official. I blinked. Hum. I hummed. The third stepped in and forced one of Orochimaru's friends to flee the village. Or that's what I was getting from the conversation. Orochimaru seemed upset. But it could also be an act of some kind. I wasn't sure what the purpose of that would be though. I'll have to be careful then. I rubbed one of my eyes. Minato and I are getting into some stuff of a similar nature. The third might take offense to what we are doing. Though I might just be paranoid. The third didn't have a problem with my modified crops and he might see the benefit of genetically enhancing our next generation. Thanks for letting me know. I nodded gratefully. I'd tread carefully from now on. I didn't need to be kicked out of the village after spending so much time trying to improve it. Hum. Orochimaru nodded and made a hand sign. Four clones appeared around him and quickly went about cleaning the lab. I shrugged and made some clones of my own to help out. Thanks. Orochimaru inclined his head. I shrugged and joined the clones in cleaning. The lab soon descended into silence as we quietly went about cleaning. Found you I grinned as Chumza's big stupid head entered my line of sight. With what was probably a slightly insane grin. I made my way over to the dumb loaf ready to plunder his memories. We locked eyes from across the market, though I wasn't quite close enough to read his mind. I continued, slowly getting closer to him. Shimza looked mildly concerned by my presence. But that was likely due to the chakra I was unintentionally leaking. Hey friend, how's it going? I gave him my best cheery smile and sent my chakra through my eyes and into his. His memories came to me slowly, his lack of spiritual energy helping him delay my snooping. Hello. Shimza looked completely confused, but nonetheless stuck his hand out for a handshake. I took said hand and continued digging, looking for the information about his clan's hidance. How have you been? Staying healthy. I released his hand and stepped to the side to maintain eye contact. When he tried to look away, he looked uncomfortable but smiled politely at me. Yes, I've been enjoying the peace and spending time with my wife. He tried to look away again, but I stepped into his field of view and maintained eye contact. Ah, that's good. I've just been relaxing. There's not much for me to do nowadays, Chumzar nodded, but took a step back breaking the mental connection I had with him. It's been good to see you. 
but I have errands to run. My wife will kill me if I don't bring back some beef tongue. I smiled and nodded as I had everything I needed. Well, say hello to Chiharu. I smiled and began to take my leave. I saw Chumzar's eyes widen as I left probably because he realized he hadn't told me his wife's name. I sent Chumzar one last two grin before I disappeared in a shunshin. When it comes down to it, life was a combination of genetics and luck. Atachi had the genetics, but his luck was shit. Ah little Atachi, what brings you to my humble lab this early in the morning? Young Atachi was adorable, especially in contrast to the killer he would become. Hi, Shiro-san. Atachi curiously looked around the room, his eyes lingering on my gold-bordered rule board for a moment longer than the rest of the room. Ah, I see your mother dropped by. I felt Makoto's chakra along with Moms and Asano. They seemed relaxed, so I figured I would just hide in the basement and avoid human interaction. Atachi nodded and wandered around the room, earning a raised eyebrow from me. Is there anything you want to learn about? Atachi just shrugged, causing me to quirk my lips into a small smile. How about medical ninjutsu? I waved my hand, using chakra strings to grab some books from around the room, causing them to fly over and neatly stack themselves beside an amazed Atachi. I'll show you some exercises, and then we'll get into theory. Practice while you learn and you will be a master in no time. From there we will get into the mystical palm. Atachi didn't look overly enthused, but nodded his head and pushed a chair over to the desk. He took a seat and stared expectantly at me. Alright, let's do this the fun way I went through a few hand signs placing Atachi under a Jinjutsu. Teaching was easy when I could impart my own experiences directly onto someone's brain. Atachi would hopefully see the value in learning medical ninjutsu, and would continue to learn it without me. I could hope at least Minato seemed satisfied with the genetic modifications made to the children. They were already showing tremendous improvement in terms of chakra and physical fitness. They only seemed to lack motivation, though that was normal for children. After all, who wanted to train when you could be playing with your friends? So, can I get onto making super babies? The changes would take better in the babies. This is where Kanoha's true powerhouses would come from. Minato shook his head. The children are doing fine. Why don't we just focus on making already developing children better? I stared at him with what was probably more hostility then one should have one staring at a cage. A child born with the best genes will be much stronger than a child given good genes at a later date. I was beyond annoyed that we were even talking about this. Minato seemed to be hesitant to commit even after the hours of talking about what we were doing. I think we should continue strengthening talented children instead of creating new ones. I stared into his eyes, briefly scanning his thoughts. Minato had some moral hang-ups. He didn't want to bring children into the world just for military strength. Making children for the express purpose of war was pointlessly cruel in his opinion. I disagree. I continued meeting his eyes, skimming his thoughts. Minato shook his head. It's not a suggestion. His eyes turned serious, and his chakra spilled out of him. I met his eyes and released my chakra, causing a white glow to surround my body. Minato and I stared at each other, our posture relaxed and deceptively calm. Our chakra visibly raged around us, Minato's blue and mine white. We continued our pointless posturing for a moment longer before we reeled our chakra in near simultaneously. The door opened breaking the tense atmosphere. An Anbu peeked through the door and looked at Minato who dismissed him with a wave. I smirked at the scene feeling a little better, if not any less annoyed. It's clear you don't feel that what we are doing is right. I rolled my shoulders trying to rid myself of my tenseness. Let's just call the whole thing off, Kinoha can become stronger in other ways. Minato nodded with a thankful smile, likely pleased that I was on the same page as him. Yes. That was what I wanted to do in the first place. I nodded amicably. No worries, I'll think of other ways to make Kanoa better. Minato smiled and waved me off. I bowed and made my way out of the room feeling slightly bitter. Minato was worried I was going too far and was close to putting me under surveillance. He didn't trust me not to go too far, and was already slightly unwilling to modify his own soldiers. I honestly just wanted to make Kanoha better, but it seems to have backfired. Now, I had to keep an eye on Minato and make sure he wasn't going to oust me from the village, due to his weird morals. I'd seen the man gut tens of children, but making some super babies was too much for him fuck. With Minato putting the kibosh on my plan to make super orphans, I was cursing around Kanoha looking for something to do to keep myself from falling into boredom-induced despair. How's it going? I smirked when Rin turned towards me kunai in hand. She shook her head pocketing the kunai. Hi Shiro, hello. I returned her greeting with a small wave. What kind of training are you doing today? The craters covering the clearing made what she was doing clear. But it was nice to make polite conversations now and then. I'm trying to develop a tojutsu using my chakra enhanced strength. I gestured to the holes around various parts of the clearing. Chakra enhanced strength shouldn't be the main part of your arsenal. More of a surprise move. Rin blinked. If people knew how hard I can hit, they wouldn't let me hit them. Rin came to an understanding of her own. I nodded approvingly. That's Tsunade's greatest fault in her own style. All you had to do to beat her was dance around her hits. If you focus on speed and quick strikes, it might work out better for you. Especially because she lacked Tsunade's monstrous natural strength. Do whatever you feel is right, it is just a suggestion. Rin nodded, though she didn't look particularly convinced. I a w an asterisk I yawned and made my way over to a tree, so I could perch myself on it and watch my favorite kohai for a while. Life was boring, 
but not for long. There would be more stuff to do soon. The Horatian was pretty interesting as far as teleportation went. The user would make a network restricted to their chakra frequency and bounce around the network using seals that mark their landing location. There was a limit to how many seals the network had, but not to how far away the seals were from each other. To use the Horatian effectively in combat, you need to specialize in a specific fighting style, have a specific kind of knowledge on seals, a good amount of chakra and control, and amazing agility and reflexes, along with a good sensing range. I had most of those and could probably use it but not as effectively as Minato did. Minato trained for a good part of his life to be able to use it as he did, and I wasn't willing to put in the time to do the same. I only wanted to get to the moon, so my use of the technique could be unrefined and slower. Though it did make me wonder why the third in Jiraiya or even Orochimaru didn't make use of the technique. They theoretically had what it took to use the technique, but didn't learn it. The third was the biggest disappointment as he was considered legendary due to his skill and knowledge but couldn't use the Horatian. It makes me wonder if there was a lot of propaganda about the third, and if his skills were greatly exaugurated. If even one person learned how to do it at a fraction of the proficiency that Minato did, it would be priceless. Both in war and during peacetimes. Save that guy for pure transportation purposes, and move squads across the continent instantly, and in a nearly untraceable manner. I turned to my clone who seemed equally as disappointed by the Horatian's lack of use. Maybe Hiruzen just didn't want to adapt it to his style that I'm sure he's perfected at this point. My clone shrugged. Maybe he wasn't as knowledgeable about Fuenjutsu, just ninjutsu, and Jinjutsu. Kishimoto was vague with his backstory. You could interpret it any way you wanted depending on what you need. Maybe there's nobody who has the right qualities to use it in combat like Minato or even Toborama. I added including myself in the nobody category. Still, having someone capable of using it at all would be invaluable. If they took a jonin and said listen up, the rest of your life is learning this and being a pack mule. It would be worth it. And even if he took years to accomplish one teleportation every five minutes, that would be more valuable than whatever else he would be doing. Minato isn't even the inventor of the technique, which is weird. I had been under the impression that Minato made the technique. The fact that Minato just learned it, but didn't invent it made him less badass in my opinion. I rubbed my forehead, feeling more tired than usual. The Horatian is both interesting and disappointing. My clone nodded in agreement, tossing a scroll at me. I caught it and unfolded it finding the clone's notes on the technique. So, I just need to adjust it to my size and chakra. I are the part that warned about accounting for growth. If I got tall and teleported with an old seal, I could behead myself. I turned my eyes to the clone, wondering how it figured that out. The clone looked away, seemingly embarrassed. Fuck. Both because of the penitential beheading, and because the Horatian was severely underused. For most of the story, the Flying Thunder God is Minato's signature technique, catapulting him to fame as a one-man war machine, and eventually fourth Hokage. It begs the question of why the village didn't go out of its way to make sure more people knew it, might as well chalk it up to Hiruzen being an idiot. I turned eyes towards the wall, breaking the mental connection the clone made. Do you think Naruto would be able to use the Horatian? I ran the idea through my mind and found myself liking it. Naruto would have similar chakra to that of his father, he might be able to use the seal without any changes. Probably. The clone nodded, likely reaching the same conclusion. We can give it to him and see what happens. I smiled, liking the chaotic idea. We'll see. My clone nodded and went back to staring at Minato's kunai. I threw my hands behind my head and leaned back into my chair. The clone would do the hard work and adjust the Horatian to our current body type. I would bumble through life like I usually did. E-H-U-D asterisk I need you to go by another apartment building. With a puff of smoke a stack of papers was unsealed and dropped onto the table with a satisfying thud. Mom stared at me. Asano stared at me. And Asami who was for some reason having breakfast with my mother also stared at me. Why can't you do it? Mom pushed the papers closer to me looking slightly annoyed. I didn't want to have all my wealth under my name in case I got kicked out of the village. I didn't want them to take everything if I was forced to flee. Having everything under my name is bad for tax purposes. I nodded sagely. Mom blew out a frustrated breath and dragged the papers closer to herself. That's not in a good part of Kanoa. She flipped through the stack of papers, while Asami and Asano silently watched out exchange from the side. The threat of death can make that a good part of Kanoha. I smiled toothily, causing Asami and Asano to flinch and Mom to roll her eyes. The filth there have connections to Ninja. They won't take too kindly if you mess up the fragile piece that the gangs have. It was my turn to roll my eyes. Weeding out some gangs would be good for Kanoha. I'll find somewhere better then. I wasn't too interested in cleaning up the gangs though. It wasn't my job to keep Kanoha gang free. It was likely that they were monitored and controlled. Interfering would earn unwanted attention, which I didn't need due to my already shady activities. What brings you to my humble abode? I directed my focus to Asami, who had been watching silently. Not that I don't enjoy your company or anything. Asami blinked at me and looked away. Someone put in a mission request for Guy. She turned back to me, meeting my eyes. Guy sent me to collect you, so we can have a youthful adventure. 
The word you for just wasn't the same when people other than Guy and Dai used it. Sure, where are we going and when do we meet up? Isami gestured towards the south. We're transferring highly classified documents. We meet tomorrow at 8. She continued gesturing to the south gate. Pack lightly. Classified documents that didn't sound fun. I'll see you tomorrow then. Isami nodded. I shrugged and headed towards the basement. I had to power up the clone and make another flesh clone. I needed to get started on mutating the Byakugan and other assorted Hyuga genes. I might as well optimize my bloodline as best as I could. I had free time now that I wasn't creating super children anyways guy did his nice guy pose. A thumbs up, wink and a winning smile. I joined him in a pose of my own, blinding Asami with the sun that reflected off my teeth. The gate guard stared at us, unsure of what to make of the situation. Alright, now that we're sufficiently youthful it's time to set off. I rolled my shoulders and passed through the gate. Isami and Guy joined me a moment later, and the three of us walked side by side. So where are we headed? I knew we were lugging some classified documents south. But that was the extent of what I knew about the mission. We are heading to Kaishi to deliver some documents to the daemon. Isami shrugged as she spoke. That didn't sound all that fun. Neat. I held back the yawn that threatened to spill from my mouth. Guy might be attracting attention, the daemon might be interested in meeting one of Kenova's upcoming ninja. Or so I'd like to think. In reality, the daemon was a waste of a human and not very smart according to rumors. It might just be a simple whim to request Guy for the mission. Is there anything we need to look out for? Guy quickly shook his head. We must be sure to maintain our youthfulness during our travels. I nodded seriously. Indeed. Isami shook her head and sped up, breaking into a run. Apparently, the talking part of the mission was over. Now it was time to get down to business. Guy and I started running as well, easily keeping pace with Asami. Hopefully, the mission wouldn't be too bad. I'd get to see the capital of nothing else. After an aimless mission to Kaishi nothing much happened. It was nearing mid-August, and I was never more aware of how close the Nine Tails attack was. Abito still hadn't turned up, even though Rin was very much alive, and I was starting to worry more than usual. Oh, Shrio. Kishina was very pregnant, and it showed when she could barely hug me. I gave her an awkward one-armed hug and got straight to the point, not wanting to delay this conversation. Minato is trying to make me deliver your baby. There was no way I was doing that. Tell him to stop bothering me. Kishina looked embarrassed and angry in equal measures. What is that idiot thinking? Kishina muttered under her breath. I nodded in agreement. Who asks a 12-year-old to participate in a birth? Minato was mad if he thought that was a good idea. Tsunade is not around, so he wants me to do it. I shook my head trying to shake the messy image of birth out of my mind. I've only delivered one baby before. I'm not exactly experienced. He wanted me there for my medical knowledge, probably to keep Kishina safe. But I was in no way interested in participating. So, unless you want to make eye contact with me while you push a human out of you. Kishina grimaced at the mental picture. Don't let Minato order me to birth your kid. Kishina nodded. I'll knock some sense into him. She shook her fist angrily. I'll smack those silly ideas right out of his head. I smirked at the chaos that would have ensued had Kishina not been housebound. Well, it's been fun, but I'm supposed to be somewhere. I gave Kishina a slightly apologetic nod and sunshine away to avoid the customary goodbye. My house was full of clones, and our expenses were slightly up due to having to feed four extra flesh clones. The clones were more than making up for the increased expenses, with many new mutations and overrides that had been done to them. I now had a lot of options to choose from. Most of the improvements had been done to the Hyuga bloodline and the Kagaya bloodline. There were some minor improvements to the genes I got from the now rakage, but they weren't worth thinking about. A minor increase in height and muscle mass wasn't too big of a deal. Bloodlines were more interesting, especially as there was lots of room for improvement in said bloodlines. But the most important improvement was the newly increased range that the clones could use their chakra at. Now the clones could make a forest of bones if that tickled their fancy. Though it was more likely that I would stick to what works, and keep stabbing people with various pointy bones. The 20 overwritten children were doing well but not as well as I expected. Only one of them had truly excelled, and she only excelled in ninjutsu. The rest of them had remained average only having a noteworthy boost in chakra. It wasn't too much of a problem. They still had years to reach their full potential, but it was disappointing. I had expected more from them. Minato says a wheat crops are being swarmed with pests. My demi jinjiriki clone tossed me a scroll. I unfurled it, briefly skimming the contents. That's not good, is what I eventually settled for. We were probably going to experience famine or at the very least an increase in food prices. Beetles were taking over our wheat fields, and the usual pesticides and insecticides didn't seem to work. Send three of the clones out, have them try to solve the problem. Though I didn't have much faith in that happening. I wasn't knowledgeable about farming practices. Contact the Aburum and see if they can do something about the beetles. The Aburum should have been the first ones contacted. They do a lot of pest control and different farming services as far as I knew. Is the overwrite ready? I opted to change the topic. I was going to implement some of the changes that the clones experienced. Passive sensing, increased by Akugan range, and increased range for chakra usage, were the things I was the most excited to have. Though being more attractive was also cool, if not as useful. No, my clone dashed my rising hopes. I need two more weeks, 
Our first overwrite contained too many changes. I shrugged, while mentally debating whether or not I wanted to hear whatever story that involved. Did you kill one of the clones? I took a shot in the dark. The clone nodded proving my thoughts correct. Almost. The clone made a so-so gesture. His eyes did experience an epic genetic breakdown. I took a moment to ponder what an epic genetic breakdown was, but realized I was going to get the clone's memory soon, and would figure it out then. Alright, is there anything else? I rubbed my eyes. My clone just shook his head. I waved him off, not needing anything else. My clones were becoming my link to the outside world. I barely went outside anymore. I wasn't sure if it was because of my antisocialness or preteen angst, but I was becoming more of a hermit with every passing day. I shook my head and tried to put it out of my mind. I had other things to do with my time. The clone's magnet release wasn't something he or I cared about. It was useful as the clone used it to supplement its sensing but also chakra heavy to use. It might be because the bloodline was not native to the body, or because the bloodline didn't integrate properly, but it was chakra heavy and not useful unless one had massive reserves, which my clone didn't have as he had to ration his spiritual energy and ensure he survived the week. I, on the other hand, had pretty big reserves. Said reserves could be expanded to tell beast level. Still, the worry of attracting too much attention and being hunted down stopped me from acquiring too many bloodlines. I had things and people I liked now, so I had to be a little cautious or at least appear to not overstep any boundaries. Should I expand my reserves or should I wait until after the override? I flagged the oldest clone down, eager for a second opinion. Even though we were the same person and would probably have the same opinion. After, the clone said, sounding pretty annoyed. Ask someone else next time. The clone spun on his heel and left, leaving me staring at him dumbly. Grumpy clone. I shook my head and looked out over the lab, which had descended into a sort of chaos, with five people all trying to use the equipment meant for one person. I might need to upgrade to a better lab or kill off some of the clones whatever. I shook my head and went about gathering what I needed for an override. Time to get started. One of the clones broke off from its tasks, and started to help me gather the required materials. I gave him a thankful nod and got back to work. The Horatian wasn't usable, but it was close. I just needed to adjust it to my height and ever-changing chakra, and then it'd be good to go. After that, I'd need a way to launch something with a Horatian seal up to the moon, and the Tensigan would be mine. Or at least, I'd be closer to getting the Tensigan. So, this is all I need to do to reverse summon myself. I eyed the summoning seal uneasily. It was eerily similar to the Horatian, and that for some reason made me nervous. Nearly nervous enough to not go through with my half-ass plan to summon myself. Yay, it's not that hard. Children sometimes reverse summon themselves when they're eager to prove themselves. What was left unsaid was that most of those same children died. Hopefully, I wouldn't share the same fate. Well, hopefully, this goes well. I saluted Minato and sliced my finger with a bone knife, before running through four hand signs, and slamming my hand on the ground. Black markings spread out from my palm, and my vision was promptly clouded by smoke as I was whisked away to meet my future friends. After a summoning induced bout of nausea, I stood and stared out at my new surroundings. I was surrounded by lakes interspersed with small islands in the middle of them. I spun around, scanning my surroundings. I didn't feel anything, but that didn't mean anything. Summons could hide pretty well, so I had to be cautious. Cho and K asterisk I turned and met eyes with the animal I had an affinity for. Its beady soulless eyes met mine, and we had a brief stare off before the thing let out another honk. Cho and K asterisk summoner. The thing screeched brought its wings up. Summoner. We stared at each other for a moment, before a staring was interrupted by the sound of wing beats and honks. H-O-N-K asterisk 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 A swarm of geese descended. I stood still as a six-foot pure white goose landed and approached me. Thankfully its beady eyes weren't as soulless as the smaller goose I had first met. A summoner after so long. It shook its feathers, hissing at a smaller goose who had gotten too close. Finally the mighty goose will be free to terrorize the elemental nations one again. I pursed my lips, feeling faintly regretful that I hadn't taken Minato's offer. Do you want me to pass a trial of some kind? I waved the big white goose down. It was strutting and doing what seemed like a dance. No summoner. It shook its beak. You just need to be taught the goose ways. Then we shall terrorize your allies and enemies alike. I nodded trying to count the different types of geese that surrounded me. I had gotten to 15 before the big white goose spoke distracting me. This way summoner. The goose waddled away apparently mindful of my lack of flight. I shook my head and followed after the thing. This was getting weird. The geese were evil given bird form. I was slightly ashamed that I had an affinity for the birds. They were undoubtedly the evilest thing I had ever laid my eyes on. Most of their techniques consisted of pecking weak points with their chakra enhanced beaks and beating things with their chakra enhanced wings. Watching two young geese beat each other half to death was especially brutal. You could tell they reveled in suffering. So, do the
the geese have some jutsu. After the white goose and I were somewhat comfortable, I decided to be blunt and ask about my main purpose in coming here. Yes, we use it to make a feather's hard like metal. It's nice to charge straight at an enemy and devour his eyes while they ineffectively hit you. The goose opened its mouth and wiggled its tongue. I shivered in disgust. That tongue was awful to look at. Will you teach me? The goose nodded but shook his head soon after. I raised an eyebrow, and thankfully the goose understood the motion and spoke. I'm not good enough to teach, so you would have to learn under one of the elders. He waved a wing, pointing at a small island in the middle of one of the lakes. They're old and frail, but no senjutsu like no other goose. The goose shivered when he said frail like it was a terrible thing. How long does it take to learn senjutsu? It took Naruto a week or so if I remembered correctly, but I doubted it would be as easy for me. It takes an average goose about six months to learn senjutsu, but it takes much longer to master it. The goose handed me a bowl full of roots and grass with its wing. A slow goose might take three years to learn it. It depends on who their parents were usually. I nodded and placed some roots and grass in my mouth chewing slowly. I'll sign the contract and come back later to learn from the elders. If Senjutsu had some basis in genetics, then that was good for me. If not, then I might be out of luck. I do have to return soon though, so I'd like to sign the contract soon. The goose nodded. The great goose is sleeping. We must wait until he wakes. He flapped his wings in agitation, meaning disturbing the great goose was a bad idea. Eat. After we will start you on goose to jutsu, we will work on it until the great goose wakes. I threw a few more roots and bits of grass into my mouth, enjoying the temporary silence. I knew it wouldn't last as the white goose was loud and annoying when he wasn't eating. Goose style to jutsu was definitely not meant for human use. But if it made the geese happy, I wouldn't refuse to learn it. Most of the style was enhancing yourself with chakra and attacking the eyes, genitals, and various other weak points. It overlapped with the gentle fist, and that made learning pretty painless. Past experience combined with liberal memory enhancement made learning it fast. I impressed the white goose with my fast learning, and he was quite proud to be my sensei, and was happily bragging to his fellow large geese friends. When is the great goose going to wake? I felt stupid even thinking of the name, but if that's what made the geese happy, I would endure. Anytime now, he never sleeps longer than a week. I blinked at the goose, who met my stare with his own beady eyes. That meant he had started his little nap the day I arrived, which was extremely annoying, but not awful. I could handle the wait. All right. I shrugged, instead opting to ask about something I had been wondering about. Why are the young geese so violent? Part of my training had me watching and interacting with the young geese. They were the evilest and most vile creatures I had ever seen. A complete lack of empathy and extremely sadistic torture of their weaker fellows was the norm in goose culture. Though the old geese didn't seem to do the same. Ah, they're young and don't know any better. The goose shrugged for lack of a better term. They don't think very much when they are that young. I motioned the goose to continue and he did. Geese don't start thinking until they are older. The best we can do for the young ones is to minimize fighting and make sure they don't attack something stronger than themselves. He said with another goose shrug. Hum. I just hummed in slight understanding, though I wasn't sure I truly understood. Young geese seemed like mini dinosaurs, they just wanted to eat and kill. It was probably the norm for animals, but it bothered me for some reason. Alright. I shook my head and put it out of my mind. I'm going to get some rest, I'll see you tomorrow. The goose nodded and waved a wing at me. Good night Shiro. I nodded and waved back. Good night. I turned and started towards the shelter I had built. The great goose was huge, but not as big as I remembered the more impressive summons being. The great goose was grey and frail looking. It was nearing the end of its life, the fact it could barely keep its eyes open said as much. The chamber where it sat was quiet, save for the sound of its labored breaths. The white goose had left us alone, despite any potential risk I might pose to the great goose. So young, yet so strong. The goose gazed languidly at me. I am Gatch, known as the Great Goose. What do they call you? Shiro, Hayuga. I bowed deeply, earning an approving hum from the goose. I've been called the Butcher last I heard. Gatch nodded slowly. A fine name, simple and to the point. He shifted, leaning his neck against the wall behind him. I've been told you're a fitting summoner, and who am I to argue? He opened his beak, and a summoning scroll was wrapped within his tongue. It flicked the scroll at me with its tongue, and I caught the slimy thing. Write your name as those before you had. I nodded, seeing the bloody name and fingerprints on the scroll. Use the hand you wish to summon us with, and be careful about leaving your blood around, as it can be used to summon us without you. I nodded and went about writing my name with a bloody finger. What do you expect me to do for you in exchange? I covered the fingers on my right hand in blood and placed them under my name. Protect us when we need it and we shall do the same. Gatchm held out a wing, and I placed the scroll on it. Treat my clan as your own, and we shall do the same. Gatchm placed the scroll in his mouth and swallowed it. Consider our enemies your enemies and we shall do the same. Now, go chose one of the older geese as your personal summon and leave. I nodded and bowed in thanks. Spread your name, and us too shall spread. Gatchm reclined and closed his eyes, seemingly sleeping before I had even left. I shook my head and started towards the exit. I already knew who was going to be my summon, 
I just had to hunt him down. So, why don't you have a name? I asked the white goose, who was now my personal summon. He just shrugged, cracking his neck as he did so. Names are granted by the elders once one becomes particularly skilled or well-known. I blinked and motioned for him to continue. Any goose who slays many foes or completes a worthy feat receives a name. I pursed my lips, feeling particularly amused. The idea of warrior geese tickled me, as that wasn't the impression I had gotten from them. Well, let's slay many foes and get you a name. Though most of those foes would be gen and level, we should also work on making some unique moves for you. Because pecking and goose foo weren't going to cut it. A good idea summoner. Imagine how jealous the others will be when I reveal I can spit fire, or call upon the wind. He tapped both his feet excitement at the thought. I chuckled under my breath, enjoying his enthusiasm. Cool moves probably wouldn't be enough to make him strong, but it was enough. I might have to start looking into the goose summon's genetics, and start on making a super goose. I couldn't have my summon remaining small and weak after all, slaying enemies, creating new moves and making a super goose. I would have more stuff to do in the foreseeable future. Chinza's memories had been instrumental in the improvement of my Kagaya bloodline, and his memories held a few different strategies or techniques. The Akamichi he used to strengthen or train their ability to quickly and effectively use their techniques. Some of them overlap with how I used my bloodline, allowing me to be a little quicker or precise in its use. But beyond that, I didn't get much from Chimza. It was disappointing, as I had been thinking about it for a long time. But not everything I acquired would be useful. The variety of techniques I knew but didn't use was ever expanding. Ah, I'm so bored. My goose pal nodded in agreement. We made eye contact for a moment, each waiting for the other to make a suggestion. We can go fishing. I silently chuckled at the suggestion, but shook my head in the negative. There was no way I was going swimming in a murky pond with a six-foot goose. How about I take you to meet my friends? You can beat them up a little, and show them that you mean business. The goose shook excitedly, clearly happy to be causing chaos. Yes, that sounds excellent. He stood and ran to the door. We shall show them the might of the goose. I chuckled silently. Just wait a bit, it's too early. The goose wilted and returned to the couch sullenly. No one will apricate getting attacked this early in the morning. The goose remained silent and was likely pouting, though I had no idea how a goose pouted. He shook his head at me and settled back onto the couch, picking at his feathers and grooming himself silently. I shrugged and went back to staring blankly at the wall, waiting for everyone to wake so I could wander around the house freely without annoying them. Goose DNA was going to take some time to index. Arachimaru hadn't done much research into bird DNA, and I would have to make headway myself, which meant lots of gruesome bird experiments if I wanted to get it done fast, which I did. Luckily Aemi was getting slightly proficient in DNA editing, so I might be able to push the project off to her. Aemi could design my super goose, and use that experience in future projects. Chakra and chakra density are the most important, everything else will follow with sufficient chakra. There were exceptions and your physique did matter, just not as much as your chakra did. Just get everything roughly indexed, and I'll show you through the experiment process for the harder stuff. Aomi nodded with pursed lips. That shouldn't take too long. I smirked at her, causing her to blink in askance. She probably didn't realize how annoying it was to index stuff without gruesome experiments. I'd let her do it the hard way. Then I'd show her how Orochimaru did it, and let her choose between them. Maybe she wouldn't take the easy route, ah. Uh. Since we are already talking, let's get this out of the way. I took a deep breath. Don't use your body to mess around with animal DNA. Aomi stared with a questioning look. If you mix non-human DNA with your own, you will become unable to have children without extensive measures. Arachimaru was a prime example, or at least that was the impression I had. After mixing animal DNA with human DNA, said human would become a hybrid. Hybrids in most cases will not be able to have children. So, I shouldn't be using anything other than human DNA on myself. Aomi asked, stating the obvious. I just nodded. Yes. I rubbed the bridge of my nose. Unless you don't care for children, if that's the case then go for it. There was still a small chance of bearing children even with animal DNA. But it was so small that it was near non-existent. Don't worry about it too much, most animal traits you might want to incorporate have jutsu equivalents. I threw my arms up and leaned to the side, stretching my back. Even if you can't find said jutsu, there are other ways to acquire whatever trait you're interested in. Enough about that, I'll leave you to it. I rolled my neck, stretching it as I walked towards the door. Sire, bye. Aomi waved me off, though she seemed unsure or confused. I ignored it with a shrug and disappeared in a shunshin. Mom had gotten another apartment building, though this one was much more expensive and in a better part of town. Now with two apartment buildings, we could hopefully keep using the income to reinvest in the buildings and eventually pay them off. From there it would be smooth sailing. All money that didn't go towards the utilities would go directly into our pockets. The Horatian is done. I raised an eyebrow and accepted the bone-throwing knife that a clone handed me. You of course need training to use it. Your body has to adapt to the method of travel. I flipped the thin bone knife over, admiring the script all around it. It didn't look as cool as Minato's kunai did, but that was fine. I didn't intend on making it my signature technique. So, I just have to train with it then. The clone nodded immediately. I shrugged to myself, activating the Fuenjutsu and trying to sense the network of seals connected to it. 
I had some minor success with my passive sensing, but still had to focus on sensing to pick a specific one out of the bunch. Yes, just get good enough to not vomit after a few jumps anything more than that we can work on later. I just nodded. Now comes the hard part. I rubbed my face holding back a yawn. We need a way to get a Horatian seal on the moon. There were a lot of ways to go about it. Though the easiest was to launch something with a seal on it to the moon. Seals are probably the way to go. The clone hummed tapping his chin with a finger. I just nodded as it was exactly what I was thinking. I could go for the more interesting approach of trying to fly to the moon. But that was far too time consuming for my taste. Not to mention useless as I probably wouldn't be needing to use it again afterward. Well, at least things are coming along nicely. I said probably jinxing myself. With the birth of Naruto fast approaching. I was rushing to finish up some of my projects. Most of them wouldn't be overly helpful but every little bit counted. We need to get some Fujutsu done in the apartments as well. I exhaled heavily at the sudden thought. The Nine Tails wrecking the apartments was pretty likely, so I had to do some damage prevention of some kind. Whatever, I shook my head and turned to the clone who was patiently waiting. Thanks, now are we all connected to the same network of seals? Yes, the clone nodded plainly. Though we can make multiple networks, we can't just jump between seal networks without a seal from that network. It took me a moment to get what the clone meant, but I got the gist of it. I had to have one seal from each network on my person, or I wouldn't be able to access the network and jump between seals. Well done me. I put my fist out and received a hesitant fist bump from the confused clone. He stared at me visibly disturbed, but eventually shook his head and wandered off deciding not to bother. I shrugged to myself deciding to see what mom was up to on this fine day. She hadn't been hovering like she used to so I didn't get to talk with her as often. Might as well see how she was doing. In a flash of feathery wings, Asami was beaten back. She probably hadn't expected the feathery appendages to carry such force, and was paying for it. She appeared behind the goose with a shunchen, and nearly took a wink to the side for her trouble. She punched the goose in the chest, earning an unimpressed look from it. She opted to change her style and jump toward the goose kunai in hand. The kunai proved ineffective and glanced off a wing. Two more slashes to the chest and neck did little better than the first, only seeming to offend the goose. With a wind chakra enhanced peck, the kunai was thrown from Asami's hand, leaving her weaponless. Asami shifted, dodging a chakra enhanced wing to the forehead, and narrowly avoiding a second wing. She kicked out towards its head, causing the white goose to hop back and retreat slightly to get its barring. Suddenly, with a flap of its wings, the goose was propelled forward, beak first towards Asami. Asami dodged but found herself pursued by the goose. Now that he had taken to the air, the scene quickly turned comical. Asami was fleeing weaving in and out of trees, and the goose was getting visibly irritated. With an angry hiss, the goose spun like a drill and pierced the tree Asami had tried to hide behind. Asami dodged, causing the attack to do little more than cut down the tree. I was starting to worry slightly. The goose seemed to take Asami's continued survival personally. I watched the duo dart in and out of the trees for a moment longer, before deciding to call the whole thing off. Alright, that's good enough. The goose didn't seem to think so and leaped at Asami's throat. Enough. I barked. Asami backhanded the goose's head shifting its aim, and causing its beak to pass her by. I grumbled under my breath and sunshined in front of Asami, stopping the fight from continuing. The goose and I locked eyes, having a brief stare off. He grunted and hissed at Asami before walking away angrily. I watched him waddle back to the clearing, shifting between amused and angry. Seeing a six-foot goose waddling angrily was comical, though the circumstances that led to it weren't. You alright? I turned to Asami, catching a nod in response. I nodded back, hoping this wasn't going to be an issue in the future. I didn't need my friend fighting with my animal minion. Your goose doesn't seem to know how to fight Shinobi Asami waved at the goose, who had turned to stick its tongue out at her. He was too straightforward and predictable. I nodded as I had already had similar thoughts before the fight got serious. An animal-on-animal -animal fight was probably straightforward, and relied less on trickery and planning. He's only fought other geese and coyotes as far as I know, though he claims to have fought a bear once. The last one sounded like a tall tale. I wasn't sure I wanted to fight a giant bear, and couldn't imagine my goose buddy doing so. Though it did open my mind to the possibility of one day fighting a house-sized bear. Not something I had ever even considered before. You said you wanted us to spar with each other, but I'm not sure I want to. Isami nudged me with her elbow, and I nudged her back. I don't want to know how it feels to have my eyes pecked out. It's probably for the best that I find someone else then. We both are the goose who was staring Asami down with its black beady eyes. I'll endeavor to make sure you keep your eyes. The goose gave Asami one final stare before waddling towards the creek. I watched him go mutely and wondered why it disliked Asami, when it had been pleasant to everyone else. Though angry goose aside I'd say things went pretty well. I just needed to let Guy meet the goose, and I'd be pretty much done showing my summon off. After a quick search through the mind of the third who was a little too close for comfort, I found a surprising little nugget of information. Hiruzen and Orochimaru had been fighting as of late, which I had known and wasn't too surprising, 
but I hadn't known about what they were fighting over. Haruko, the friend of Orochimaru who had been chased from the village, was chased out by Orochimaru and Jiraiya under the orders of a third. Orochimaru was mad that Haruko's research was sealed away, as it contained lots of information about bloodline assimilation, and that was what Orochimaru was after. Hence the apparent anger at being denied access to said research. Ah, what do I call you now that you're no longer a cage? I spoke trying to break the awkward atmosphere that had fallen over us. Standing and staring at someone blankly while plundering their mind was awkward. Saratobi will do. I shrugged trying not to read too deep into it. Though telling someone to address you by your last name implied a lack of friendliness. Enjoying your free time. Or are you still trying to keep busy? I kept digging through his memories of Haruko's research finding it lacking. Hiruzen's memories were more of a reconstruction of what happened and less of an actual recording. It made most of the memories of him reading the research useless. I try to keep busy. Having so much free time is nice. But I find myself bored and wishing for something to do. He trailed off, rubbing his chin as he drifted off into thought. Though being bored is fine, at least now I have lots of time to spend with my family. I nodded, sympathetic to his boredom. You always have too much time or too little time. There never seems to be a happy medium I trailed off. I'm sure if I was interested in continuing this conversation without the incentive of juicy bloodline research. Indeed. He nodded and started walking away breaking the connection I had with his mind. Though I don't know if I'd be any happier even if I found that happy medium. I watched him go sending him a little wave as he wandered out of the cage tower. He sent one back over his shoulder, not looking back, but still somehow seeing my wave. I shrugged to myself and made my way up the stairs, sending silent nods to those I passed. After a moment I arrived at the Hokage's office and peeked inside. Seeing no one but Minato I shrugged and made my way in, unbothered by the stairs of the Anbu. Yo! I waggled my fingers at Minato, eyeing the vase on his desk, and making mental plans to steal it. I've got more magic seeds that need to be tested and planted. I pulled a scroll from my sleeve and tossed it onto his desk. It landed on the paper he was writing on, earning me an unamused look from Minato. But seeds weren't the only thing I came for on this fine day. I continued ignoring Minato's unimpressed look as he set the scroll containing the seeds to the side. I came to ask if I could get my hands on whatever research Haruko left laying around when he went missing then. Yes, you can look it over. I smiled brightly. But you can't be conducting the same experiments he was. My smile faded slightly but I was still overjoyed at the unexpected success. Don't worry about that. What need would I have for bloodlines anyway? Minato nodded and returned to his work causing me to smile. I'm very busy right now. I'll grant you access to the research later tonight. He shooed me away with his hand, and I nodded mentally making plans to visit tomorrow while nonchalantly swiping Minato's vase. All right, thanks. Minato nodded, and I made my way out not bothering to hide the vase nor my smile. If you don't ask, you don't get I hum to myself, wondering if Minato would ask for the vase back. He hadn't cared about the bowl, so maybe nothing would come of my stealing the vase. At least I had something to decorate my lab I guess. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.